Coming to you from the Troy Lee Design Saloon in Corona, California, it's the Whiskey Throttle Show, bringing you the legends and leaders of our sport with your host, David Pingree. This week's guest is brought to you by Yamaha, the leaders in the power sports industry. Motocross bikes, street bikes, adventure bikes, generators, side-by-sides, quads, boats. Yamaha sets the standard. Yamaha revs your heart. Today's guest is presented by Therabody, the world leader in human performance, wellness, and recovery. The pioneers of percussive therapy, Therabody changed the game with the Theragun device. Their arsenal has grown to include recovery compression systems, power dot electric muscle stimulators, adjustable vibrating foam rollers, and a complete line of organic wellness solutions with their TheraOne lineup. Whether you are a world-class athlete or you are just looking to improve your overall health, TheraBody has the tools to help. Today's show brought to you in part by Method Race Wheels, the strongest, lightest, fastest wheels in off-road. Method dominates the off-road market and they have the wheels for your truck, sprinter, SUV, Jeep, or van. SKDA Graphics. SKDA has turned the motorcycle graphic design world on its head by bringing a fast, fresh look into the sport. From outside the box designs to retro looks to a complete line of whiskey throttle show graphics, SKDA is operating on a completely different plane than the rest. With free global shipping on orders of over $100 and unrivaled customer service, right now is the time to freshen up the look of your ride. Troy Lee Designs. Built for the world's fastest racers, Troy Lee Designs blends elite level protection with a history of industry leading style and performance. From motocross gear to custom paint to bicycle protection, Troy Lee Designs is waiting for you on the next level. Hey folks, welcome. I'm your host, David Pingree, and today we are at Star Racing Studios here in Cairo, Georgia. The old Ricky Carmichael goat farm now belongs to Star Racing. And this man, our guest today, one of several, Mr. Bobby Regan, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah. We, we were so excited. We were waiting for this. Really an opportunity uh, for us to show you what we do. And uh, you saw our riders riding out there. So, Well, I've been seeing your riders for years, and I've been seeing you guys win everything for the past decade. And so I was really interested to come back and find out what makes the Star Racing Yamaha company tick? What, why are you guys so successful? So that's some of the questions we're trying to kind of get at, as well as get a little bit of your background and Brad Hoffman's and <clears> some <throat> of the guys that keep the show running here. Um, so I'm very excited for that. So thank you for coming on. We're going to have uh, the 450 team manager, Jeremy Coker on, Brad Hoffman, uh, who is team, part team owner. He's, he's got several <clears throat> titles, but um, definitely a big part of this, of this deal here. So let's, but let's start with you, and, and we like to start with what we call the Method Race Wheels Front End Chatter. Um, they bring you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels in off-road racing. So if you're interested in looking at new wheels for your truck, van, sprinter, or SUV, check them out. 20% off using our code Whiskey Throttle. Um, take me through, if you can, a little bit, just to start a little bit of the structure here. Um, in terms of, you and, you're the owner of the team, have been, but Brad's recently come on and he's involved more. Uh, kind of take me through the who are the managers and kind of the, the business structure of it here. Well, <clears throat> that's a good question because those things evolve uh, quite rapidly. But Brad has been with me for a long time. He didn't just come on. He's uh, he uh, when he graduated from school, he started working for for us uh, with uh, the Johnson clan. Mm -hmm. He was that okay. he he was working for the for the Johnsons. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> great mechanic. Uh, the first time I ever met him, we were in, we were in Holland. You remember when Supercross went to Holland? Yep. Yep. So Arnhem. So Brad was uh, there with us in Holland. First time I ever saw him. And uh, he's been with us ever since. His whole career, he's been with us. So uh, very integral part of what we do. Mm. Brad is. Uh, very, very, very knowledgeable person, very technical person, uh, is a uh, very intelligent guy. Mm. So uh, he's been a big part of what we do. And then you've got now, as, as your team continues to grow and expand, Jeremy Coker is your 450 team manager. <clears throat> Jeremy correct? Coker is a 450 manager. Uh, Brad is, uh, <clears throat> and 
unfortunately, I have to run. You know, we, we, we lost one of our key employees, Will Hahn. Mm -hmm. Will was uh, running the 250 program, and so I've been having to do that. <clears throat> but uh, Jeremy does a great job with the 450 team. And Brad, he skates around to both mm -hmm. those and helps us both. Yeah, he kind of oversees everything, kind of yeah. manages it all. I got that. Uh, and then you guys have, obviously, a, a 250 team manager and suspension guy and engine guys. And, you know, that staff has grown to be pretty significant. Yeah, it's real significant. <clears throat> we, uh, it seems like you never have enough people. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got a suspension guy. And <clears throat> so we've got amateurs going somewhere to, to race. And we've got to have a suspension guy with them. So... We've, uh, yeah, we, our staff has grown <clears throat> immensely, a, a lot, a lot, just like a, a factory team should. Sure, right. So uh, we have evolved to being a real factory team, and uh, we're, <clears throat> we're trying as hard as we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be working. Uh, well, let's jump into your story. I want to tell folks, uh, get over to Whiskey Throttle Media. It's been revised if you haven't been there yet. We've got a ton of new content over there, site lap, riders meeting, uh, factory rider, and much more, including some, some special content here from the Star Racing Yamaha facility, so check that out. Um, let's, let's, let's get started with you. Give me a little bit of your, your background in both racing motorcycles, how'd you get involved into that and, and in, involved in the motorcycle industry, but then also <clears throat> your professional and personal background, because you've run some very successful businesses outside of this industry as well. Yeah, uh, I have. I've, I've been involved in a lot of things. And uh, <clears throat> the, to starting off, uh, I mean, I, I went to college. I was, uh, I got an MBA. I uh, taught under fellowship at a, a major university. Okay. Uh, that was while I was going to graduate school. <clears throat> so then after that, and, and, and all my life, competition has been my life. Okay. Winning. It's, it's just been what I, I've, I've, I've done all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Army, uh, I was in the Army, uh, and I worked in the Pentagon, and I won there. Wow. So, it's, uh, it's, you know, these things, they don't just, it's just like I, I was a football player. I got hurt, and uh, <clears throat> I couldn't do it. So school became my competition. Uh, competition has just been, been my life, and... Uh, the one of the things that I dreamed about all my life. I mean, I did ride. I ride, I rode off road stuff. Uh, uh, my dream was to have a motocross team. Is that right? From way back. Absolutely. Huh? Yeah. And then uh, when, as I got older and I had an opportunity to do it, uh, we started it in as as a grassroots team. Uh, amateur grassroots motocross team and uh, we evolved to uh, Keith Johnson the Johnson family yeah. they helped us so much and uh, we won the privateer year uh, privateer of the year uh, I don't know what year it was but we won it and Keith was a recipient of that so uh, <clears throat> it was uh, it's been uh, the evolution of this team is unbelievable and it's gone places that I never even dreamed it would go I, and I want to ask you about that as we get on because the success you guys have had is overwhelming. I, I don't even think um, it's ever been duplicated before you, where you have a team winning in both classes, indoors and out, at the same time. Uh, you know, even the juggernaut of factory Honda in the 80s couldn't really say that. They didn't field 125 Supercross guys. So um, it's very unique what you guys have done and what you've accomplished in a, I don't know if it's a short amount of time, but consistently you guys have continued to build and grow to where you're now the premier sport in the team or the premier team in the sport. <clears throat> well, we, we've, uh, you know, the it, people, th I, I don't have any innate ability to hire somebody. You know, people think that I, I don't. But what I do, <clears throat> what we do is we develop them. Okay. These, these 250 riders are not like a 450 rider. They don't come prepared. They, they're not trained. So we work with them every day, everything from cranking the motorcycle to how, how you go, go through the finish line and win a race. So I think we've been successful 
by, by covering all the bases and also paying attention to what they do because some of these guys do some things really good. So it's been a learning process for me to watch one of these uh, outstanding young riders that can do something really good and we learn how to do that and we teach it to our other riders. Mm. That's something different. Yeah, well, it is different. Um, you, you had mentioned earlier we were chatting and you said that there were points along the way you, you, you thought you should have quit or you considered mm. folding it up. And you know, we, we see this so often in our sport where a guy who just loves racing and has the money, mm. the, the means to do it, will build a team and go racing for a while, but then eventually that, that newness wears off and he's just spending a lot of money and they, and they always go away. I mean, you can look at some very credible organizations, even like Joe Gibbs Racing. They really wanted to make that work and it just, <clears throat> they couldn't get it to work. So tell me about some of those points along the way where you thought you might call it quits <clears throat> and then, man, what the heck was different about you guys that's allowed you to get to this level? Well, like I said, my, my dream was to, was to do what I'm doing. And uh, <clears throat> so many times uh, I had a sponsor call me and say, right at the last minute and say, well, I, I'm not going to be able to pay you. It happened over and over again. But since I really wanted to do this so badly, I was willing to spend my money to do it. And uh, along with my wife, my wife has been a huge part of what we do. And uh, she supports us in every way she can. She loves the sport. Does and she? Well, we don't have that's, any. That's important because no. if she's over there complaining, no. that makes it really tough on you. She, the, these kids that we have on this team, have all of them have been our kids. Mm. Uh, we don't have any children. So uh, it's been an unbelievable experience for us, my wife and myself. Uh, we, uh, we love the sport. We love what we're doing. We love Yamaha. We, lo we love uh, winning. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was, the, if you could nail it down to one specific time, was there one time where you were the closest to calling it quits? <clears throat> Yeah, I was uh, going into, I remember exactly where I was. I was going into AutoZone uh, to buy some parts for a car and my telephone rang. I answered it as I was going in the store and my key sponsor said, look, uh, I'm not gonna be able to pay you. And uh, <laughs> at that moment, I didn't really know what to do. But uh, when I got back, when I got back in my truck, I called my, all the riders and I called all the mechanics and said, uh, we're gonna pay you what we can. That's all we can do. We just had a, the, the people that are gonna pay us the most, they backed out. So we're, all, if you wanna go somewhere else, go somewhere else, but we're gonna pay you what, as, as much as we can. And nobody left, mm. nobody left. That was a really, really uh, trying time yeah. for both my wife and myself. Does that type of thing happen in other sports? You know, you said you were, you've been in football and you've been in business. You own auto dealerships, right? Uh, you've done some different things. Does that kind of thing happen in other business where they just go, ah, we're not paying you? Or... Absolutely. Is that right? Yeah, it happens. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I've been involved in running other businesses and uh, it happens. And if you're going to quit, if you're a quitter, you quit. Mm. I've never been a quitter. That's cool. Um, what do you, what do you, what do you make of what you guys have accomplished? I mean, from the very humble beginnings when it was a grassroots team and, and then a little bit of support and then more support from Yamaha. And then now all of a sudden you're winning 250 titles. Now you are the current two, you know, you have a 450 outdoor title and now a 450 supercross title to your credit. That is crazy. <clears throat> do you ever kind of sit back and go, wow, we, I can't believe we've done this. Or is, was it expected? Did you expect it? No, nobody would expect something like that. <clears throat> we, uh, you know, when we start, first started with Yamaha, <clears throat> and it was around 2000, uh, we were running an, an, an outdated bike. Mm -hmm. We were a, what you call a five valve head bike that was running a carburetor. Everybody else had uh, fuel injected 
uh, systems. I mean, we were way behind. So every year, we thought we were going to get a new bike. Every year. And we finally did in 14. And we went from 2000 to 2014 with a, with a bike that, that we, we did win races, but not many. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but the, the, the day we got the new motorcycle, our, our world changed. Things changed. Absolutely yeah. changed. And from then on, we, we, we won a lot. I remember when you guys signed Jeremy Martin and I watched him at Glen Helen just motor away from everybody. And I was like, what? I, I knew of Jeremy, but I just, I had never seen him go that fast. <laughs> and I, that was to me the beginning of your run where you guys have just been on fire. Um, that had to be pretty cool for you to watch and see that progression. Well, I'll- after the after that race, we we were we were in uh, we went to a, a restaurant and we had a, a dinner for the whole team. And uh, I remember talk, I, I never thought that we would ever get on the podium outdoors, much less win a, a race. That was. You know how hard outdoors is. Yes, I do. I mean, to to win in outdoors is just uh, the hardest thing. So we won a race, and I was like, I told the team, I said, I am just, I don't know what to say. This is unbelievable to me, and something that <clears throat> I just can't believe that we did it. Yeah, it was, it was. I mean, I remember the moment really good. Yeah, th- those are the kind of moments that just they're etched in. It, and and Jeremy Martin. Uh, he was the he was the key to that to that win, uh, and I'm going to say that Jeremy Martin taught me so many things about turning hmm. and maintaining momentum. And I mean, <clears throat> Jeremy Martin was uh, a real asset to us, and uh, we he was a great great rider for for Yamaha and for us. Absolutely. Um, is there, are there specific accomplishments you'd be most proud of with what this team has done? Or is it hard to, <clears throat> well, you hard know, to down? I, I, I would think that, <clears throat> I think that the, the kids that have been on this team, m- most of them have won championships and, but it's not only that they won championships, but they became a better person. Hmm. Uh, we're, we're really real family oriented. And uh, we just do, we, we, it, the, uh, the team is a, just is an unbelievable family that gets along so well. We've had people leave, but most of the time when a mechanic leaves us, he's going to something uh, with, that's a better deal. But uh, same thing for the riders. All the riders, that, most of the riders that we've had uh, Come over to the truck every week and see mm-hmm. us. So mm-hmm. it's. Uh, I've heard someone mention that. Maybe it was Will. Maybe it was somebody else. But they just said you, you do treat all the riders like they're your kids. You you kind of the two fifty guys. You know, um, that's your contribution to a to a children's college fund, so so to speak. Right, is to help these kids <clears throat> be successful coming out of your truck. I think that's cool. I like that perspective on that. Well, one thing uh, that's that's. Nobody knows. Uh, it's it's really interesting. <clears throat> All these kids, uh, they we ha- they they have a a button that we can push. We've got to find it. Mm-hmm. We have to find the button that that per, per makes them a champion. And uh, I'm going to tell a story if it's okay. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. <clears throat> so, Swanapool and I we're the ones that hunt the button. We try all kind of things. So with uh, Aaron Plessinger, we were having trouble. So uh, I told Swanee, I said, uh, we're gonna try something different this, this weekend. We're gonna, we're gonna, an hour before the race, you, not, not Swanapoo, but a, Another guy and me and Aaron Plessinger would go into the off. We went into the office, shut the door. Nobody can come in. Do not let anybody in the truck. We're, we're going to be working up here. 
So the other guy that was with me, he knew what we were going to do. So we played, we turned on some music and we had a karaoke session for <laughs> 45 minutes. Is that right? It's the truth. Okay. Aaron Plessinger w didn't even know he was at a race. He was just so relaxed. He was singing and having a good time. So that was over. He, he, he put his clothes on, went and jumped on the bike, totally relaxed, went down and won that, won that race first time. Is that right? Yeah. It's true. That was his first win? Yeah. You know, this is something that I think a lot of teams, I, I love that you found that out. And everybody is different, right? Some people it, like Ryan Hughes used to like to be yelled at. <clears throat> when Mitch would scream at him, that that motivated him to, to ride better. Right. But other people operate on the completely other end of the spectrum. Like Aaron, he wants there's enough pressure in the job you're doing. You put enough pressure on yourself that he wants his environment to be fun and relaxed. And you gave that to him. That's cool. Yeah, and uh, I mean, obviously, he's just like my son uh, <clears throat> when. Uh, when he moved on to the 450 team, uh, we gave him a Martin guitar. Okay. Because he loves music, and we pushed the button. Yeah. Uh, we did it. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's I'm real proud of. Do that. you do you uh, is that fun for you? Absolutely. Trying to figure that oh, out. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Cooper Webb. I'm not going to go into all that, but uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Cooper Webb and I were really close and still are close, but uh, he has some buttons also. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, tell me how the, the deal came together with Eli. Oh, you know, I, I'm going to uh, tell the truth. I didn't have a lot to do with it. Okay. <clears throat> the, Jeremy Coker. Jeremy Coker was the the engineer behind that he uh started it and kept us informed of what was going on and and he and eli got along well along with john so uh uh jeremy was the one that really put that together okay not me pretty neat to see a, your your team win a supercross title absolutely huh? absolutely that was unbelievable uh, but but uh, Dylan won the outdoor the series the, the last year and uh, we were so happy you know and and Dylan the, that's an interesting story about Dylan uh, I watched the uh, GP races in Europe mm -hmm. on on television on Sunday so I was uh, I got real. Uh, focused on Dylan Ferrandis. Before he came over? Yeah. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> so I called my wife in one day and I said, I want you to watch this kid ride. I said, I really, really, uh, I really think he'd make a good rider for us. And uh, she watched him and said, well, he falls down. I said, well, watch him get up. <laughs> but he was, he was racing hurlings uh -huh. and he would, he would run close to hurlings a lot. So I was interested, and then uh, out of the blue, his agent called me. Maybe the day or two after I was so involved watching him on TV, and uh, he said, Do you, you ever think about this guy? I said, yeah, I'll take him. He said, What What are you talking about? I said, I want him. I'll sign. Where do I sign? Oh, yeah, that quick, huh? Yep. Okay. So, so Dylan came over and uh, he's he's had a great career with us so uh, again with him uh, even though he's French so uh, we everybody everything meshed uh, he he likes the team and uh, we, we love him yeah so he's done great for you guys you know absolutely. he's been phenomenal um, is there anybody you know throughout this whole team's history that you've maybe had the most fun working with riders <laughs> I really had a the, the a good time with every one of them. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not just kind of close to them. I'm real close. And uh, the as a psychological coach, the <clears throat> you ha I've been close to every one of them. I've had a good time with them. But but Cooper and I were really close. Is that right? Yeah. Is it tough to to see those guys leave, 
Or do you just want the best for him at that point? Uh, yeah, sure, it's tough that we don't have them, but they, the, in our case, they have to move out. Right. They're, they're pointed out, they have to go, to the, and uh, we, we like for them to go to, to a team where they're going to be successful, and sure. uh, that w I will talk to them about that. Um, is there anybody, kind of like Dylan, that you really wanted to get, that you were really interested in, that you didn't get? Sure. The 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 one that pops out in my in my mind is uh <clears throat> Fortner. Mm. I wanted him so bad. Uh and uh <clears throat> it just didn't work out, but it happens. It, it's yeah. it's not just him, it's but but he was uh it, I thought he was the best rider to come out in the last ten years. And uh off had an awful lot of talent. Uh him, Austin Fortner. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And and what's, in your opinion, if you if you could, I know it's probably a lot of little things, but what's made the difference for you guys for Star to be so successful? <clears throat> That's a really easy easy one to answer. Uh, you know, I, I'm a an educated manager. And uh, so I do what I do, but I could not accomplish anything that I've done without Brad Hoffman. Mm. He's a uh, key to the organization. He's, uh, <clears throat> he's, he's had his hand in every development that we've, that we've done for Yamaha, and we've done a lot of development for Yamaha, and it's Brad. Brad is uh, absolutely a, a great guy. He's kind of this, this uh, I don't want to say undiscovered jewel, but he's really been a powerhouse for you guys. But he doesn't, he's very low key. You know what I mean? He doesn't, uh, he's not the flashy guy doing all the interviews and stuff. He's, he's way under the radar, but, <clears throat> but very, very potent. Well, you know, go back to where, when we started and we started with that five valve head carbureted bike. We made that bike win. Mm -hmm. We were not winning every race but we were competitive and he was the only person that ever made that bike do that mm. so yeah huh. he, he's a unbelievable guy and we the all we've we've done a lot of development work for yamaha on the on this bike he has uh, uh he he works with uh with teams all over the world mm. so well, I think one thing you guys have done from the outside looking in, like Brad, exactly to your point, is you've put the right people in charge of their respective categories and let them do what they do best. Uh, just walking through from the suspension guys to the other engine guys to all your managers, you have really good guys in place. And that's the key to any successful yeah, business, right? That's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, what, what do you think the, the future looks like here at Star? Um, you know, like I said, I'm always concerned that we're going to lose teams. Just, just that's the way the sport is. If you aren't a factory, I've seen them come and go a dime a dozen. And uh, looking at this facility here, seems like you guys are planning on sticking around for a bit. The success is you're obviously just running with that wave right now. But if you had to, you know, put a plan out 10 years in place, what do you, where do you see this going? Well, we're, this team is going to... Uh... This team is gonna go beyond me. Uh, it's already I've already worked it out. Uh, Brad is gonna be the owner of this team and already is owns half of it. So uh, it wasn't just my dream to, to have a team, but I wanted this thing to perpetuate itself, mm -hmm. and it, it is going to. I, I, whether you've just willed it to happen or, or, or whatever it is, you've definitely gotten there. Uh, the success is crazy, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for you guys. Well, let, let me say this, though. Yeah. You know, uh, I work with, with several people at Yamaha that, that managed me. I mean, Keith McCarty was uh, uh, great for us. He, he helped us uh, just day after day do things that we didn't know how to do mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the current 
regime at Yamaha is uh, really unbelievable in, in what they do for us. Uh, really, uh, you know, you, you hear teams talk about maybe being unhappy with the manufacturer. Well, <laughs> we're not. Mm. We're so happy with Yamaha and how they tried to help us that we, we just couldn't ask for more. Yeah. Well, and I think that Yamaha has been very open-minded because you can look back at their history in the last more than 10 years and see that they've tried to get a bunch of these satellite teams to be successful. And not everyone's the right fit. You know, as I talked about, some people are not as competitive as you, and when the going gets tough, they quit. They need to find more people like you, all these other manufacturers, right, who are just, they're competitors. It doesn't matter what they're doing. You're there to win, and, and you're, damn it, you're going to see that through. Um, do you see other manufacturers maybe going this route or looking at this, seeing the success you guys are having and going, man, where's my body rig? <laughs> oh, I think so. You know, uh, I think that, that as, uh, as we go forward that, uh, I mean, there are teams out there now that are great teams. The, they're, that are cap fully capable of doing what we do. And we relish the opportunity to race those guys. Mm. There's, uh, we, 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 we really love good racing and sometimes we get beaten, you know? I mean, uh, but, but that, that, what that means is we're gonna try so hard the next, next race. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be so hard. One last question here before I let you go. Um, you know, this walking around this facility, seeing Ricky's cabin and the water truck that's so infamous, and Jeannie's, Jeannie Carmichael's walking around here today. Uh, she's here quite a bit helping Swanapool. Is that, uh, you know, this is hallowed ground, there's no question. Does that, um, do you think that adds to the legacy of what you're building here? Oh, n no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> no, it's, uh, Dylan Ferrandis, I think, so would uh, w if he were sitting here talking to us, would s he was overwhelmed coming here. Mm -hmm. He could not believe that he was riding on an outdoor track that Ricky Carmichael had not only ridden on but had designed. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, yeah, yeah. We are so fortunate that that we came to this facility and that that uh, Carmichael's sold us his place. Yeah. It's, uh, and yeah, we are, we're so thankful that, it, uh, that everything's worked out like it has. Well, we chatted, uh, Brad and I were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, are you guys going to rename the place? What are you going to, you going to call it something different? He goes, yeah, we thought about it, but really it, this is the goat farm. No, this is the goat farm. Yeah. And it kind of, there's a, there's an expectation set already when you come here. This is, this is a place for champions and that's cool. It is. It is, uh, and, and we have to elevate ourselves to get to get that good. Yeah. You know, we, you come to the goat farm. Uh, we expect to for people that are training here to to win races, and that's uh, yeah. We we uh, we want to uh, fulfill that that commitment. You yeah. know, just like Ricky did. Yeah. Well, you're you're doing a great job so far. I'll tell you that. Uh, listen, I don't want to take too much more of your time. We're going to get to some of the other guys on the team. Stay tuned. We'll be back with them. But I want to really thank you for taking the time well, to chat. Well, thank you, David. It really means yeah. a lot. And I'm, I'm just so thrilled to see you guys doing what you're doing. Thank you so Congrats. much. Congrats. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. We are back here in the Star Racing Yamaha studios with the 450 team manager, Jeremy Coker. Jeremy, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so I want to have you on. You, you've been a really integral part of this team. And... Um, for a lot of reasons, which we'll get to, but I want you to give folks a little bit of your background. So, um, one, I don't know that many people know you and Christian are related. So talk a little bit about that and then tell me just sort of your involvement in the sport to get you to this point. Yeah, obviously, uh, like you said, most people probably don't know Christian's my brother. Um, so that's kind of how I'm involved in the sport. The families, this sport is our family's thing, you know, and, uh, Early on, luckily, I had somebody in the corner said, hey, you don't have it on the riding part, so we're going to give it to Christian, and I was fine with that. I didn't have it. So I enjoyed the sport enough to want to stay in it somehow, and, you know, I tinkered around with being Christian's mechanic throughout the uh, amateur days and just kind of stuck in it. And then, um, yeah, I think uh, we were going to ride the day 
that Christian broke his back, I was going to the track and I'm pretty sure I called you and said, uh, hey, if there's anything I can ever do at Troy Lee, please let me know if it's sweeping the floors or whatever, I'd like to be involved. And uh, unfortunately that happened that day, but then I got a call to come to Troy Lee to work for Tar Geiger. And uh, that was my first foot in the door of on a professional team and I enjoyed the heck out of that and just stuck it out. And when uh, Christian came back, I got to work for him for a season. And uh, yeah, so that's how I started in motocross mechanic wise. So from Christian at TLD, where did you go? Kind of tell me your career path to get here. Yeah, so I worked for Christian at Troy Lee and then uh, after the 2011 season, um, I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to do it anymore, so I took a step back and I went to work for my dad's construction company and did that for a year and realized, okay, uh, this is not what I want to do. Real work is not that fun. <laughs> so you and Christian <laughs> both went that route. Yeah. You did yeah. some construction, went, wow, this sucks. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I, I did real construction, Christian didn't. Oh, but, okay. Uh, right. So uh, yeah, I realized, you know what, uh, real life work's not, not that cool. So um, had an opportunity to go manage 5150 Honda team. Um, with Jake Canada, and we actually had a really successful year. I, mean, I think we were privateer team of the year. Okay. Um, so that was like, I, at that point, I was like, wow, this is really cool. Uh, this management thing, I feel like I'm pretty good at it, and uh, I like to do that, and like maybe I can stick that out. And then uh, at the 2000, end of 2014 Supercross, I got a phone call from Brad Hoffman, asked me if I would like to come be a mechanic. Um, and I was like, wow, yeah, that'd be really cool to get back in and be on a good factory team. Um, so in 2014 motocross series, I worked for Anthony Rodriguez um, and uh, did the whole summer series. It was a great time. I uh, learned a lot being on a factory team of the different level of uh, support the team gets and parts and stuff like that. So it was really eye-opening to me, like what it takes. Um, and at that time, you know, they had Jeremy Martin uh, winning. So really got to see what it took to win. And, yeah. and that was really cool. Um, and then at the end that of the, was their first championship year. 2014 was our the Star Racing's first, uh, well, their first championship was with Jessica Patterson, right. but their first uh, 250 Lights title was with Jeremy Martin in yeah, 2014. So at the end of this season, um, at that time, Brad Hoffman was doing the, assembling the engines um, and developing them. And at the end of the season, he's like, man, I could do so much better if I had somebody assembling the engines. And he reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to do it. And that was a kind of a big one for me, like, wow, this is gonna be a lot of responsibility. I'm not sure, and then I took it, and I was the engine uh, technician on Star Racing from 2014 all the way through 2019, mm. um, and had a lot of success. You know, we won a lot of championships, so that was really cool for me to be able to have my hand on on all the success that Star Racing had, not just being a mechanic with one rider, but when you're doing the engines for every rider, yeah. you get to claim the success that's, for that's every That's kind of cool, right? Yeah, you know, you're. They're all your riders yeah. right at that point, but there's some pressure that comes with that. It's a it's a tremendous amount of pressure. Did you ever have a DNF or something that kind of stuck with you? Um, I had one DNF, and yeah, it was really hard for me to take. But it's crazy to think that in all the races we did in that amount of time, I only had one race yeah. DNF. Um, obviously, lots of things go wrong in practice, but sometimes it's out of your control. Yeah. So you do your absolute best to make sure your race engines are as good as it can be and yeah the, the one failure i can't remember exactly where it was i kind of sat in the back of the semi and just head between my hands like wow like, that's was that's, it a part or what broke it ended up being a, a part failure but yeah. still you don't at the time you don't know yeah. and you just you can't it's hard it, it's really hard for you so yeah that was that and then uh that was fun and then well, um, you've also seen uh you know with christian he had a valve break on our test bike and he and i chatted about this earlier that crash was, that was one of the worst days of my life. Yeah, and I know. And Matty felt really bad about that, but he's like, man, that engine was good. I don't know what happened. Sometimes shit just happens. And that's the thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a motorcycle. It's a million moving parts in these engines, and uh, you're trusting a lot of other people that built those parts and machines. Yeah. That, that, so, <laughs> you know, I, as a person, as, a, as an engine technician, you can only do so much on your end to hope that it lasts. Yeah. And, and obviously, it's a lot up to the rider, too. Are they revenue? Are they not revenue? Are they dragging their brakes? There's so many things that go along with it. And yeah. once again, it's, it's a machine. It's gonna, they're going to break. But it's, it, as a, I've always thought as an engine builder, there's like this, this extra pressure because especially in Supercross, man, if it breaks in the wrong place, it can be really bad. It can yeah. be like what happened to Christian. And Absolutely. I, I imagine you spent some 
nervous days up in the stands watching. Oh yeah, that's it's hard. It gets it's uh, sometimes I I really thought about man, I wish I could just go back and be a mechanic and just <laughs> just have to put this engine in the bike, you yeah, know. Right. Um, so yeah, anyways, with uh, at the so end from nineteen of, then the end of two thousand nineteen, you know, through two thousand nineteen, there was lots of talks like, hey, we might be taking over the four fifty team, and um, at one time. Uh, I was just gonna maybe transfer into being the 450 engine builder, and then it came to we Brad and Bobby sat me down and said, "Hey, would you like to manage the 450 team?" And I kind of was like, "Whoa!" Uh, I thought it was. I took it two different ways. One was like, "Wow, that's really awesome that they're they're offering this to me. Like they must see something in me or trust me." And um, and they said, "You know, like obviously we've you've done a phenomenal job." And we trust you with with a lot. And 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 throughout the two from 2015 to 2019, uh, I did help out. Like it was kind of me, Brad, and then uh, it was Will for most of the time. Like we kind of all managed the team together. So it wasn't just one manager. So I did get a little bit of managerial experience through those periods. So when they asked me, um, I was up for the task. You know, especially yeah. being that like what. The 450 team had been doing and then what the expectations for us were going to be um it was kind of something like brad and myself said like let's let's do this let's take it on and and we were really confident that we could have success um but not knowing for sure if it was going to happen and you know the crazy thing is we kind of have a had a three-year window like you have to win a championship in these three we you know yamaha that was your expectation or that was I think it was, you know, Yamaha and Monster kind of gave us an expectation, like, we're going to, you have a three-year window to, to, to turn this team around, you know, and, uh, and then we'll talk about it after that. Um, and Brad and myself looked at each other and said, we can do this in one year. And I know a lot of people probably would have looked at us if we would have said that and said, yeah, we'll put a million dollars on it. You're not going to do it. Just being from what had happened. And so the, the, the opportunity that was given to us and the challenge I think Brad and myself have the same mentality when it comes to that of the challenge was accepted and, and we were going to do everything it took to prove that we could do it. So that was really cool. So that's how I got into the manager experience. How are you so confident, you guys, knowing that that bike, from a professional racing standpoint, had looked, the 450, had looked so bad underneath Barsha, underneath Plessinger, underneath all these great riders. A lot of them come from here, um, but it just never looked great. Well, and that's that's one thing right there. What you said, a lot of the riders came from here, and uh, I'm sure you know, and so a lot of people know. But if we take this 250 engine out of this bike, you can drop a 450 engine in this bike. And so, what would be the reasoning to not operate it as a 250 motorcycle? And um, we thought that we had a good enough platform from the 250 that we could literally take a 250 chassis setup, put it on a 450, and have a good enough bike right away. Mm. Um, that was our mentality. The, the, the extra it. weight and the torque and horsepower difference you don't That's, think was enough to... I think uh, we found that out when we did it, but we were still really close just with our 250 setting. And, you know, actually when uh, in 2019, uh, I might be wrong on the date, but Dylan France went and worked, raced Bercy on a 450. Mm. Um, and he took his 250 suspension with him. And pre him going there, we were testing on a stock 450 with literally 250 suspension and a pipe on it. And he was blowing everybody's doors off at Milestone and everything. And he literally had rode up to us and says, this bike's incredible. I don't know how it doesn't win. Wow. And so that kind of made us go, we can do it. Mm. Like if he's saying that, then, then we can do it. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of things I think people see and don't see of, of a, from a 250 team way to a factory 450 team way, um, there's a lot of doors and a lot of uh, block walls you have to go through on a factory team. Mm -hmm. Where on a 250 team, we don't. Um, I think the time and the hours that a 250 team are willing to work and, and the amount of work that a 250 style team that doesn't have uh, our constraints and stuff like that. I think that's a lot of the difference mm. is that uh, the people on a 250 team just have a little bit different mentality than when you get to a factory 450 level where it's like, you know, hey, we're a factory team. Uh, we know what we're doing. Um, we're going to work from nine to five. And, and I think that's a little bit of it too is like this just, I think 
in my eyes, a lot of 250 teams could could do this on a 450 style team. So it's just a little bit of different mentalities, I think. Of like I said, there's a lot of block walls and a lot of doors on a factory style team that have to be gone through or jumped over, and sometimes mm -hmm. they're not willing to take that risk. One thing that Keith McCarty said in a, in his interview with us was. These, these big corporations, these big manufacturers, it's like a snake. And so if the head makes a move one direction, it takes a long time for the end of that snake to get there. Where, uh, and I don't know the snake necessarily, he's not comparing that to a snake, but just the analogy of mm -hmm. it takes some time to turn that ship around or make those changes. Yeah. Where here, you guys are pretty nimble. You know, you can say, hey, we want to try that. Let's try that. Yeah, you I think that's the, the biggest difference. The biggest difference is there there is a lot of people on the factory side that... You know, on the factory side, they have to answer to Japan. They have to answer a lot of people. So if they make a change and it doesn't work, well, Japan's going to be like, well, why didn't you ask us? Or, or so on and so forth, where we're willing just to take the lashing if it doesn't work and, and it kind of stops there. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a little bit of the difference of how we, that's why we thought it was going to work and, uh, and we took the gamble. Yeah. That's, um, well, I mean, you guys have done an incredible job. And I thought, I wonder if that was a fluke with Ferrandis. Like, did he just jive with that bike he, and he came up with a setting that he loved? Like, could they back it up? And then when I saw Eli starting to catch fire in Supercross this year, I'm like, oh yeah, they, they have it dialed. You know, there was no question. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you learned coming here uh, from like a TLD team or that 5150 to a team that's winning championships. What did you see that was kind of the difference? Well, I think when I, you know, from uh, those teams to this team, I think a lot of sometimes on those other teams, it's it's a little bit about fun mm -hmm. um, and about the spotlight. And when I came here, it it's still fun. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have fun. But the mentality of winning is incredible over here. Um, between Bobby and Brad, uh, when I came here, I realized there's no... Nothing else that they care about besides winning. Um, mm. When I got here, we had a shop that was uh, like, tiny. Um, we had an old semi, and I kind of looked at it like, wow, I'm surprised this team's doing as good as they did. But you know, the analogy, the thing they always used to tell me is, well, we don't race semis, we race <laughs> dirt bikes. And and I, uh, you know what, well, you're 100 percent correct. So once I started thinking about that, I started switching my mindset to, um, that's right. I mean, everything that matters is in this machine and the person that's sitting on top of it, not not and the personnel the, supporting them. Yeah, and the personnel supporting it. So that's that's more important than the glitz and the glam. And I think a lot of times you see that a little bit on on other teams that the glitz and the glam and the and and look of their shop and uh, that's so that's more important. And I think that we proved that that's not. And yeah, we may have it now. But it took a long time for us to get to this level, and it took a lot of winning for us to get to this level. Mm -hmm. But I think the winning mentality is is what it is over here, and it's just Bobby does, and people say this all the time, and it is the truth. Bobby is a has a football coach mentality, but clearly it works. Mm -hmm. Some people may not like it, to, uh, but I think after they're here for a while, they realize, you know what, it works. Mm -hmm. And if I really do want to make it in the sport, I need to want to win, and nothing else besides it. That's super interesting. Um, what about the transition from mechanic to team manager? Um, you said you sort of got to dabble in that a little bit with when Will was here, but then taking over that role, what's been the kind of the things that are better and the things you don't like as much? Uh, yeah, obviously as a mechanic, you have to worry about your one thing, your, your motorcycle. You have to worry that your bolts don't fall out and that you're doing your best job on that one, your, your piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So you have you're kind of a your singular focus. Yeah, this is this is my job. I show up and my motorcycle has to be 100% at all times, and that's a very important job. And uh, when I became a manager, it's now I have to worry about uh, the semis making it. That everybody has a hotel room. That the machines are in 100% order. That the mechanics are happy. That the riders are happy. Uh, so to change my focus from one thing to an umbrella of things uh, was was a challenge, but it was something that I really, I think, uh, I almost feel like it's kind of what I was made for was to be in this role. Like, um, I try to do my best and I think that people, my, my crew respects me because I was one of them 
um, and I'm not I, I'm not scared to jump in. You know, in a race, if we have to do an engine swap, I'm the first one to jump in and help. I'm the first one to fill in for a mechanic if they're sick. So that I think is very important on the manager side to not just be the guy that sits behind the computer, but the guy that's yeah. out there doing all that stuff as well. I, I even remember from the TLD days, you were jump first one to jump in to offer to help. You know, what do we whatever needs to be done, you're jumping in, and I. I I remember that about you specifically, and uh, that work ethic pays off no matter what you do. Yeah, it's, it's important. Um, what about the worst part of it? Is there something you don't like about it? Uh, I think the worst part about it is uh, is dealing with upset riders and upset mechanics when something goes wrong and trying to keep their morale as high as possible. Um, so a lot of it, the worst part about it, I think, is becoming a mental coach. And by that I mean is to try to keep their focus in the correct direction. We're in the perfect situation right now for what I'm talking about. Dylan Francis had the number one plate coming into this year, gets hurt Tuesday before the race, can't defend his title. The hardest that's probably been the hardest thing for me is to keep him, his mechanic, and really the whole crew's morale high that our defending champions not coming in to defend the title. Mm-hmm. Um, Dylan still has more years on this team, and it's important for me to keep him focused on trying to do this again when he does come back. So I think that's the hardest thing of the job is that side of things. When somebody gets hurt um, or somebody's having a bad day or a bad race or or a mechanic yelled at a, a rider yelled at a mechanic, and i got to yeah. keep the mechanic's morale up to not want to quit. So the managing of the people is is probably the hardest part of the job. Yeah, you're in control of the vibes, right? Like the atmosphere and the, and how everybody's mood is, right? The leader Absolutely. leader dictates that, Absolutely. you know. So, um, it's it's an interesting position for sure. I, I look back at the time when I managed Troy's team, and I think, gosh, I should have done this different, that better. But you learn. Yeah, but clearly, it's, clearly, you're, you're doing you something learn right. Learn as you so go. Keep it up. For sure. Um, speaking of, you know, struggles, uh, someone maybe it was you that told me earlier. You guys have three plates that you haven't been able to defend this year. Uh, Dylan won't be able to run his number one. Uh, Cooper couldn't run his number one because he was hurt, and then Colt as well. Uh, I don't know if that that's ever happened before, but you've you've you got some serious morale boosting to do in your camp. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think it. I think it has happened in many different situations. Like uh, somebody won a West Coast title, and now they're put on the East Coast, so they didn't get through on their one. So I think it has happened, but in the situation that but we three, had... Three right in a row in the same year. The situation that we had, uh, yeah, that's that was tough. Yeah, That was really tough. Um, but that was a group effort between all of us to keep those three guys, morale and mechanics, and, and really just the team. Like, hey, guys, this is, this is racing. Yeah. This is what motorsport racing is all about. And and that shows you how fast something can be ripped away from you and that also teaches you how to respect and to to care about what you guys did um so i think that's it's a double-edged sword it's a little bit of a less life lesson like hey learn to respect what you had because that's how fast it can be ripped away from you yeah um and don't Mm -hmm. take anything for granted so yeah i think that's it's important takes them from the top to the bottom real quick doesn't it absolutely um what was that feeling like last year I mean, let's, let's even talk about Dylan's first 450 outdoor win and then going on to win that title. You're the new 450 team manager. Probably that first year, I got to believe the expectation wasn't to win that title, was it? No, absolutely not. I think uh, especially with the struggles that we had in Supercross, um, like I said, when we took the team over, we had the, my Brad and myself said, you know what, we could do this. We had the struggles in Supercross and we kind of looked at each other like, Okay, this is a little bit harder than we thought, mm-hmm. and um, and the whole team really went to work leading into motocross because our Supercross season wasn't, you know, we weren't going to win the championship, and we still were focusing race to race on how to get better, and we proved that we got better each week, and and that's no, no nothing to take away there, but um, you know, Ricky, our suspension guy, Brad, engine development, Brian, our engine technician, we all said, you know what, let's put our heads together and let's do the best we can in this motocross series. And everybody was very confident that in that group that we could, that we could win races. Okay. And, uh, we started testing and we had Dylan in a really good spot. Um, we didn't really know where we were until we showed up to the Tuesday press day before the season and everybody was there. And 
we kind of looked at each other and said, holy crap, uh, I think we can do this. Like Dylan's blowing everybody's lap times out of the water. Once again, it's a stopwatch nationals, but I think we can do this. I think we're in a really good spot. Um, and to go do what we did just at the first race, uh, I think every one of us was, were crying, really. Between, <laughs> between Brad, myself, Ricky, um, even on the last lap, I, I've never heard Brad get emotional. And on the last lap, he gets on the headset and literally just starts thanking each and every one of us at the phenomenal job we've done to show up at the first national and win it. Uh, I think we all literally came in tears like, holy crap, we just won the first race. And, and uh, that was just the first race. There was many more races to go, but it was almost like we won a championship. Well, that's a huge step. You know, winning in the 250 class is one thing, and that's not easy. Winning championships is another step. But then going to that premier class, man, that's a huge step. Yeah. And to come out and win the opener, it, that's a huge deal. And then to go on and win the title, I mean, were you... It was incredible. Just throughout the whole season to just do what Dylan was doing and the team effort that what everybody was putting in was... We literally couldn't have gelled together better as a team than mm. we did between all the mechanics all the riders christian and dylan and, and aaron i mean they were like everybody was laughing in the truck just having a good time and it was like wow this it really became a fun thing like mm. it was just showing up to the races was I, I had a smile on my face everybody the whole team like when we walked through the pits everybody smiled yeah. and, that, and i think that's what the most important thing is a lot of time you see teams walk through the pits their head down and, and that's how you know when you show up in the morning that with a smile on your face, you know it's going to be a good day. So yeah. to do what we did at the end of the year and to win the championship with a race to go, uh, it's something I'll never forget. I think it's something everybody on the team will never forget. And uh, it was incredible. Yeah, it's a special one. Um, they always say it's harder to, to keep a title than it is to win the first one, which, okay, I think it's very hard to win the first one. But... Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, you guys, obviously, like I said, you didn't get to run any of these number one plates, but is that something you've experienced here since you've been here? I think the, the weight of the number one on your bike, no doubt, is heavy. Mm -hmm. No doubt. And it's not just heavy on the rider, it's heavy on the crew. It's, it's, there's expectations in, when, when you have the number one plate, and it's, uh, like I said, as the rider, you want to defend it, but not just the rider, as the crew, as the engine builder, as the suspension guy, they want to show everybody that it wasn't a fluke and uh it's heavy and and to not be able to do it i think shows how heavy it really is mm. um tell me about the eli deal because i know you were integral in making that happen uh i think it surprised a lot of people that he came here but it turned out to be brilliant yeah i think uh there was it was a good group of guys involved in getting eli between myself brad and ricky our suspension guy um Obviously, Ricky is, was his best man at his wedding and is really close with him. And uh, I was approached one day like, hey, I think, I think uh, Eli would like to ride for you guys. And I kind of smiled and said, yeah, that sounds great. And didn't really think twice of it. Like, he's at Kawasaki. He's won a million championships there. Why would he want to come ride for us? And, and this was during Supercross when we were struggling. And I kind of didn't really understand it. And um, so I just jokingly went and told Brad, like, hey, I think we can sign Eli Tomac next year. And he kind of laughed at my face and walked away. And I was like, yeah, it's kind of my thought too. It's kind of a joke. Um, and then I got approached again, like, hey, I really think you guys can get Eli next year. So I said, you know what, screw it. I'm going to call him. So I called him and uh, he was interested. And we, Brad, myself, Yamaha, uh, the higher ups, really just went to work on, on the fine details of it and uh, had a few meetings with him and John Tomac and yeah we made it work uh, you know even for me calling sponsors like Monster and, and people and saying hey can you guys help do you guys really think this is possible and they're like man if, if you make that happen that's like earth shattering like there's no way that's going to happen and I said I really think it can happen um, everybody just kind of told me good luck and yeah so for us to make it happen uh, it's pretty crazy and obviously, I think it may, you know, the Dylan having a successful outdoor season and beating Eli helped us mm -hmm. in making the deal happen. Um, and it's to have those two guys on the same team is pretty incredible. Yeah, I was really looking forward to this summer, uh, the two of them 
competing. Obviously, we're not going to see that. But what was Eli looking for when he came here and came to you guys? I think I've said it a lot of times, and, and I'm going to keep saying it because it's the truth. But, you know, I think at Eli's age, um, this was turning into a job. And that's one thing that I've said from day one, that the day I wake up and feel like this is a job is the day I'm going to find something new to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he started having was he was waking up just going, man, do I really want to do this? It's not that fun anymore. It's not what it used to be. Uh, and I felt like I could make it fun again. And, and our team could make it fun again. Just like I said, when our team would show up to the race, we were smiling, we were laughing. And, and I truly believed that Eli Tomac has three more years in him. Mm. And the only way to get three more years, four more years, however many more years out of him was to, to make him smile, to make him wake up and want to ride his dirt bike. And he was not in a good spot. He did not want to wake up and ride his dirt bike. And that was my selling point to him. My selling point was, hey, Eli, let's, let's turn this back into what you got into it for. Let's have John Tomac involved. I want your family 100% involved in this. I mean, John Tomac has a headset. We're yeah. communicating with him at the races. He raised Eli. He made Eli who he was. And to try to pull him away from Eli, I think, is what caused Eli to not enjoy it anymore, to, to really feel like, hey, this is, not, this is not what I'm in it for. I want this to be a family thing. I want to have fun. I want my kids to be here. I want everything to be around. And, and that's what I thought we could do as a team here at Star Racing was to bring Eli in, bring John Tomac in, bring... Bring the things that make Eli happy, his suspension guy, the freedom to do what he wants and change. Um, and that's what we did. And that, that was my selling point for him. And you guys also, uh, this is something that Jimmy Button had said in, in, when we were talking about Dylan Ferrandez. He said, the thing that Star will do is if, if, if we're at a factory team and Dylan wants to try a different brand of fork, man, like you said, it's roadblocks, it's walls, it's all of these reasons why they can't. Here, it's, all right, I'll go get a set. Let's yeah. try it. I mean, you guys are willing to do whatever the riders are kind of searching for within reason. Um, and I think, you know, that's it. You make the rider happy. Happy riders are fast riders, right? Um, and you guys said you, you, you even bought multiple types of suspension, you know, the air fork, uh, uh, hybrid, and then spring, and, and just said, screw it. We'll buy them all and let the guys figure yeah, out what Yeah, I they think want. that's important. I think to some people believe that, like, hey, this is what... We won our last five championships on this works. That's not true. Every rider is different. So in order to to make somebody comfortable and go out and win, you have to have this cabinet full of goodies. Yeah. And I think that was another thing I, that we were able to offer to Eli was say, hey, you want to run this fork, you can run that fork. You want to run this, you can do that. You run Within reason, obviously. You know, we, Yes, we have to stick within KYB, but there's so many options within KYB that can be used. And and that's one thing that, yeah, it's important. I mean, one day we were at the test track and he wanted a certain lever that we didn't have. I drove to Orange to Orange to ARC and picked the lever up and drove straight back to the test track. So that's the kind of things that are important that I think some people aren't willing to do, that we are willing to do, is, is if you wanted a linkage, I'll have a new linkage here tomorrow. Right. Um, nothing... Nothing is welded to our motorcycle. I have a saying and I tell a lot of people, it's like, I'll never tell you no, but I'll tell you I told you so. There is some things I don't believe in, but I'm not going to tell the rider no. We're going to let him try it. And if he doesn't like it, I'm going to tell him I told you so. So uh, I'll, as a team, that's kind of what, how we do it. You know what? We know it's probably not going to work, but try it. Yeah. So and Don't and, take that wonder out of their brain. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, I think, very important. And that actually happened. Eli changed forks from round one to round two this year. Yeah. You know, he, he did a lot of testing in the off season. He was happy on one fork. Um, about a week before the race, he thought he was happy with another fork, showed up to Paula, realized that wasn't the fork, put the other fork back on for Hangtown, and voila. So yeah, voila. Uh, lots more racing to go. So a lot of things <laughs> you wouldn't have been able to do that. That's, that's that type of flexibility that you guys have that's, mm -hmm. I think it's effective. What about the move to Florida? This was tough, I think, for a lot of the guys who were on the team. I think part of the reason Will, you know, decided to leave and do something different. He just didn't want to move out here. How's that been for you? And, and as far as the team goes, kind of what's the general vibe? Uh, for me, it's great. Um, obviously, I was born and raised in San Diego, so I am a California guy. Um, but I hated it. Uh, I hate traffic. <laughs> I hate getting angry at people on the road. 
and driving like maniac and that's what I did because that's what I was around so in order to get the opportunity to leave California I jumped up and down I threw my hands up I said let's go um, you know it was a little not a little challenging but um, with the rest of the crew you know we had probably half the crew that was like let's go but a lot of our crews not from California mm. so for a lot of them it was kind of easy but there was people certain people that were from California like oh, I'm not willing to go live in the sticks well we don't, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't really live in the sticks, but to some people it is. Yeah. So um, I enjoy it. Everybody that's here enjoys it. Um, so that's the only good part, I think, was the people that did come came because they do enjoy it. Um, it's a little hard for some people with families. Luckily, my wife, uh, she's actually from Laguna, but I thought it was going to be tough. When she got here, she loves it. All um, right. So most people that are here really enjoy it and and I think we're all pretty happy. Well, I text Carmichael and said, hey, we're gonna be at your uh, your old place the next few days. And he says, hey, whatever you do, don't tell anybody Florida's cool. Tell them they're not, we're full. No no more people to Florida. So from Carmichael to you guys, don't show up out here, I guess. Um, so tell me, tell me this. What is, if you had to kind of nail it down to a thing or a couple of things, what's the formula for success here at Star? What has made you guys so successful over the past decade? I think it comes back to what we started out with was the winning mentality. Um, <clears throat> I think the people that we have in place here, <coughs> excuse me, the people we have in place here all have the same mentality. And that's the most important thing is when you put a group of people together, uh, if you have one person that doesn't think that way, it's gonna cause a lot of things to go wrong. So. Um, the people that are around the rider, the circle of the of people that they trust is, I think, the formula to success. And Bobby Reagan and Brad and myself believe in nothing more but winning. Yeah. As a team manager, have you had any um, girlfriends or parents that were issues and had to deal with any of that? Or have you been pretty lucky? Uh, luckily, on the 450 team, they're all pretty much past that. Yeah. They're if I was the manager of the yeah. 250 team, I might tell you yes. <laughs> He's got different stories. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, listen, man, I, I'm just so excited for you guys. Uh, are you, you're kind of two. What are you? How many championships have you won versus lost since you've been the manager? Two for uh, three? We're two for three. Yeah. I mean, that's a not a bad record, bud. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty damn good. It takes more than just me, though. No, I know. But, <laughs> but as the manager, yeah, you get good. to claim some responsibility. Yep, so, absolutely. So take it. Congratulations. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, we'll be watching. You know, I'm anxious to see how Eli wraps this season up. And hopefully, Ferrandis can get back and be healthy and yep. jump back in and pick up where he left off. Yep. Be good. All right. Well, thank you. Guys, stay tuned. We'll be back. Dunlop. There is a reason every AMA championship in the past decade was won on Dunlop tires. They are the best. Choose the best performing tire and a brand that has never wavered in their support of our sport. Choose Dunlop. Pro Circuit. Pro Circuit products are designed with one goal in mind, winning. Through passion and hard work, Pro Circuit has operated the most successful 250 team in the history of the sport. They use that same formula when developing exhaust, engine, and suspension parts for every brand. When only the highest level of performance is acceptable, trust Pro Circuit. Since 2009, Seat Concepts has been dedicated to making the best aftermarket seats. More comfort, more grip, more riding. For 10 years, we've continued to raise the bar. Innovation and American craftsmanship make Seat Concepts the world-leading manufacturer of power sports seats. Something from nothing. That's what Nihilo Concepts is about. It starts with a spark, an idea, a concept, which leads to a design and finishes with engineered excellence with the highest quality products created with durability in mind. 
All our products are made in the USA at our state-of-the-art facility in Stewart, Florida. Whether you are a weekend warrior, ride for fun, or at the highest level of competition, Nihilo Concepts offers innovative titanium, aluminum, and carbon fiber parts for your dirt bike. We offer a wide variety of products that you can customize to your liking. Browse our site for foot pegs, brake tips, engine components, specialty tools, frame grip tape, lever grips, carbon fiber components, motor stands, our secondary on switch, plus much more. Head to NihiloConcepts.com and see for yourself why factory teams like Red Bull KTM, Rockstar Husqvarna, Troy Lee Designs Gas Gas, Orange Brigade, Club MX, KLM Gas Gas, and some of the fastest riders in the world choose Nihilo Concepts. Since 1987, Coach Rob has been dedicated to creating durable motocross, supercross, GNCC, and road racers through his complete racing solutions program, integrating performance, nutrition, functional strength, flexibility, and mental development. His proven system has world-class results, producing four AMA number one pro plates and over 270 national championships. The complete racing solutions program focuses on the fundamentals of human physiology and how riders interact with the physics of a motorcycle. Its proven process and system helps riders understand the why associated with riding techniques and how getting faster on a motorcycle directly correlates with strength, endurance, nutrition, and flexibility off the bike. There is a difference between a fast racer and a Complete Racing Solutions racer. Visit CompleteRacingSolutions.com and get on the path to becoming the champion you want to be. Specialized Bicycles Specialized leads the way in the world of bicycling. Whether it's cross-country racing, downhill, e-bikes, enduro, road, gravel, dual slalom, dirt jumping, or all mountain bikes that do it all, Specialized has the perfect ride for you. The brand is synonymous with engineering excellence and innovation that steers the industry. Visit your local Specialized dealer for a test ride and see just how good Specialized products are. I try to keep on, keep it on. OGO Power Sports. OGO has perfected the carrying case. Motocross gear bags, helmet bags, boot bags, hydration packs, backpacks, and travel bags, to name a few, have all been meticulously engineered to maximize space and surpass durability standards that would make NASA proud. Simply the best, OGO Power Sports. Connected. intercom on. Cool to be able to hear what they talk about and how fast they should go. Throttle control, braking, really cool. Extend your leg out. There you go. Good job. Good throttle control, Lonnie. That's a great training tool. It was a lot of fun to be on the track with them. Hey, Lono. What? Can you pull off? Pull off over here when you get to me and your brother. Okay. With a rich history in motocross, ProX has been dedicated to supplying quality components since 1975. Whether you're rebuilding an engine or just need a new chain, ProX Racing Parts aims to bridge the gap between OE quality and affordability. ProX has over 9,000 part numbers and over 60 different product types that are manufactured by highly reputable or even OEM suppliers and are offered at affordable prices to help keep riders on the bike instead of in the garage. Visit ProX.com to search parts for your bike or check them out at your favorite online or local dealer. The guys are just breaking in their race bikes, which will leave on the semi this Saturday to go to the first Supercross for our coast in Orlando. Uh, so the guys are just be goofing off a little bit, do some cool photos, do some cool videos. When you go racing, you want to do well, but a big key is keeping the bikes on the track. That's why we chose to work with Motul. Expectations coming in as a rookie is just to try and get my feet wet and uh, honestly just send it, see where I end up and uh, do my best out there, but just ride aggressive and ride like myself in practice and uh, I should have a good time. Challenges of this sport I believe is just simply staying healthy. Uh, with how fast we're going um, and what we're doing, your margin for mm -hmm. mistake is really, really small. Stay sick. If you have little rippers, then you have had to have seen Stay Sick Bikes by now. We have created bike and experiences that allow kids to develop sooner and empower them to find their own ride. 
From learning to ride to sharpening skills, the Stasic promise is accelerated growth. Whatever path your family chooses, it's going to be the ride of your life. Stasic Stability Cycles. You ever heard the phrase that the harder you work, the luckier you are? Well, at Luck Apparel, they believe in an acronym that kind of sums it up a little more simply than that, laboring under complete knowledge. So it isn't just some random chance that determines what your outcome or results are going to be. It's being educated and working your butt off to get it done. And I think that that goes hand in hand with the motocross industry. You don't get lucky into a win. You work your ass off and you make it happen. So check out Luck Apparel. They've got t-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, all kinds of cool stuff. And we're stoked to have them on board here at the Whiskey Throttle Show in 2022. If you're in the market for a toy hauler trailer, car trailer, cargo trailer, look no further than Custom Outfitters, one of our new partners for this year. Uh, these guys do an awesome job, even so far as to dial in the inside of Sprinter vans, which have become the new standard moto transportation for moto. Uh, these guys can handle it all. Uh, they use ATC world-class trailers, uh, top shelf service, and performance in their products. Uh, Custom Outfitters out of South Dakota doing an awesome job. We're stoked to have these guys on board this year. So whether you're looking to just do some camping with the family, uh, looking for a trailer that can fit all your toys to go out to the desert or wherever, uh, look no further than Custom Outfitters. Today's show is brought to you in part by ZDMS, the next generation dealer management system for the power sports industry. Designed for large and multi-rooftop dealership operations, ZDMS business intelligence harnesses the power of your data for better line of sight into dealership decision making. Pinpoint performance areas of concern where profit is being maximized and opportunities remain. Real-time data visualization combined with drill down reporting means you can track up to the minute dealership performance across all departments. Unlock stories you never knew existed and meaningful insights into your business. With ZDMS's intuitive, easy to use dealer management system, you'll streamline your opportunities and improve communication across your entire dealership with efficient workflows while spending less time behind the counter and more time with your customers. ZDMS understands technology is only as good as the team representing it. With ZDMS's unmatched top tier support, rest assured your customer experience is part of the package. Every team member in your dealership will have access to a support team ready to assist in any way possible. Change is good. Say goodbye to your legacy DMS software and modernize your operations, minimize costs, improve efficiencies, and make data-driven decisions to increase profitability with ZDMS. Demo at ziidms.com today. Hey, 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 I'm on vacation every single day because I love my occupation. Hey, 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 I'm on vacation. If you don't like your life, then you should go and change it. Hey, 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 I'm on vacation. Welcome back, folks. I am here with the team's co-owner, Brad Hoffman. And Brad... Thanks for coming on, first of all. Yeah, appreciate stoked, having stoked me. Stoked to have you. Mm -hmm. um, you're an interesting person to me because I, I have heard very little about you. I know you work <laughs> behind the scenes really hard and you have, uh, from everyone in this team, has said you're a key component to the success here, but yeah. you like to keep it quiet. Yeah, that's kind of my MO is just <laughs> to lay low a little bit. On the DL. Yeah. I appreciate that. I respect that. Um, but since I got you here, yep. tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, what's your background and how'd you get into dirt bikes and all of this? Yeah, I mean, I, like a lot of people in the industry, I grew up riding, you know, I think at six, I got my first bike and it was a CR60. Uh, probably not a great bike to learn on. I kind of remember going to like some gravel pit kind of sand riding areas and that's a pretty bad bike to learn on because of the no power valve, two stroke thing. So. You know, it was obviously a race bike, and I kind of, I'm not 100% sure I remember this right because I was only six, but I remember going to a motocross track kind of maybe on the way home from riding and actually in Arizona. And uh, I'm pretty sure my mom was like, okay, this is not what my son's doing. You know, like I'm fine with him riding, but maybe he's not going to race. We're not going to do the race deal? Yeah. So from there, you know, we just trail rode a lot. Um, Kind of even from that point on, my dad kind of transitioned me to more like the XR Honda line type thing. And we just trail rode, but a lot, you know, like every yeah. weekend type of thing. And about the time I got in high school, um, you know, you're starting to kind of make some some of your own decisions. And I, I think probably even from when I was six, I w we would go riding with some of my dad's buddies and maybe some of their kids raced. And I'd be like, man, they're talking about racing. You know, it sounds fun. 
I'd like to kind of do that. And my dad would say, well, you know, those kids that they get hurt a lot, you know, they break their leg and they break, it's real competitive, you know, are you sure you want to do that? And I'd kind of stop bugging them. And when I, when I got into high school, I kind of, I raced BMX and some guys that I kind of met in BMX raced and I kept bugging my dad, hey, I want to trade this, you know, XR in on a CR125, you know, type of thing. We, My dad had kind of always run Hondas and yeah. that's what we had. And uh, so I finally convinced him to get a CR125 and I kind of started going to tracks probably 14, 15 years old with some buddies and stuff like that. I, my dad, I think, went to my first race type of thing, but he was pretty busy with work and stuff like that. And I would just, a lot of times I ended up going to the races a fair bit with just some buddies I met in BMX and stuff like that. And I started racing a little bit, but obviously if you only start when you're 15, 16 years old, you know, by the time you're 18 and it's time to do something, like you're really not that good, yeah, you right. know, two or three years later. So I got where I could, win local b races and stuff and i went to i think i went to uh world mini and realized okay this is a whole nother ball game than the local races you know i could could maybe be top three guy at the local races in arizona but uh were you in the phoenix area yeah I, so my background's a little bit um uh, i lived in arizona the most but i was born in michigan my dad's side of the family was all farmers in michigan and i would I'm not sure exactly what age, but I would go when I was, I think around the time when I was five or six, we moved to Arizona and, but I'd always, most of my, all of my parents' families from Michigan. So every summer I'd go back to Michigan and my dad's side of the family was all farmers and I liked being on the farm. So literally since probably, I'm not sure exactly the age, maybe six, eight years old or something, I'd go back to the farm in Michigan every summer. Okay. So, and even when I turned 15 and started riding and everything, from that point on, I would go back to Michigan with my CR125 and I would go to races. I look back at it now and it's pretty crazy. Like from the time I was 16, 17, I would go ra go work on the farm in the summer and I would go race races Baja by Acres myself. Baja Acres or like what yeah, was that? Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly that track. And uh, I would race races totally by myself. Just 16 years old. 83 Ford F-150 and a Wait. CR125 and I would just show up and race. Uh, I'm sure people were worried about it in my family, but I didn't think anything of it. You know, I would just huh. go there and I would travel like seven hours away in Michigan on the weekends. Nobody there, you know, just race. Jeez. And so I kind of did a lot of racing, like somewhat on my own. My dad was, like I said, from one time I was six to, to that time, he would take me riding. Maybe, I don't know if we rode once a month, every other weekend, something like that. Trail okay. riding mostly, yeah. and mostly in Arizona. But okay. um, so that was my background. I didn't know you grew up there. That's my old yep. stomping grounds as well. Yep, so. yep, for sure. What? I hear you guys talk about like the Casa Grand kind of Supercross track, yeah. and I remember seeing that Supercross track that was kind of like in the corner. No yeah. one, I don't know if we even really knew exactly what it was, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. But we would ride those same tracks, you know. Yeah, Jimmy Button and I pushed that thing together with a beat up old dozer and a loader. Yep. yep pretty interesting um so all right so take me past that after after you're 18 and out of high school then what yep so i think i graduated high school when i was 17 and same thing just like a normal kind of summer i drove to michigan with my dirt bike did the whole thing raced a little bit and at the end of the summer like you know i was working on the farm and my dad's like well i mean you know it's time to do something like yeah. i've you know you like the farm you like dirt bikes um you know you could i've looked up some motorcycle mechanic schools because i'd always work on my own stuff everything like that and uh he's like i found this school in canada it's really cheap and it's uh really far north in canada but you know i'll, I'll get you enrolled there if you want or you can work with your grandfather on the farm and like mad me maybe you'll turn into a farmer you know and i was i was happy with either one of those things like okay. that sounded cool and uh would they just, farm by just out of curiosity uh a little bit of everything okay. soybeans uh alfalfa like hay gotcha. uh, wheat you know that kind of thing and like i said i really liked it everything like that but i decided to go to canada to this school which the school is i think to this day there's there never was another american that went there and there still hasn't been one is that right so it's a pretty unique place because it's um you're probably familiar with like where Edmonton, Alberta is. Yep. I think it's six or seven hours north of Edmonton. 
So we're talking about like oh, re wow. really cold, Way you know, like a north. average temperature every day in the winter was like negative 25. And we, there were some days like negative 55 Celsius. So yeah. it's like just extreme cold, but it's in Canada, it's a licensed trade to be a mechanic. Like you have to be, you know, a, a licensed mechanic to work on motorcycles even at a dealership. Okay. So the idea wasn't at this point to be a race team mechanic. I, I don't think maybe, maybe even a little bit, but long story short is it's crazy because MMI was in Phoenix. But <laughs> <laughs> and you went north of Edmonton yeah. by And there's else. only, you know, I think an MMI maybe in Florida and Phoenix. And I lived in Phoenix, but my dad sent me to north of Edmonton, Alberta. So, but I mean, it was just, MMI was maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to go there. This was like less than five. And it was more like a trade school. Like I'm, when I say less than five, I think it was less than five for dorm room, the whole deal, the school, everything, you know? So it was a really good deal. And I think it being that it's a licensed trade in Canada, it was a pretty good school. Okay. And uh, it was a, it was tough, like going there as a, just barely 18 and being like, ex, you know, I think it was 2,400 miles from Phoenix where my family's from. And it's like really cold and yeah, yeah just different, you know? Wow. Yeah. Interesting. What was the place called? Do you remember? Fairview College. Okay. I actually had a mechanic come last year at Millville and he's Canadian and he knew a few people I knew in Canada and was like, man, do you really think I should go there? And I said, man, it's not going to be fun, but I think you'll learn a lot. And like, if, yeah. if you're really dedicated to this thing, I think it's a good place to go. You to know? your school? Nope. It's, uh, I think about nine months. Okay. Yep. Try to plan that during the summer if you can. <laughs> yeah, they don't do that. It starts in like maybe September and goes for Jeez. nine months. Yeah, brutal. All right, so go, move on from there. So you go to this school. What was your first job coming out of that? Um, my first job coming out of that was Town and Country Motorsports in in Arizona. Yeah, like in I like think it's Chandler probably. Yeah. And uh, so came back there. You know, applied at some dealerships just to be a mechanic, and I started working there. Worked there for. I'm not sure exactly how long, maybe six months, maybe a year. And one of the guys that I went to school with in Canada calls me and he says, Hey, um, I'm working for this dealership called Riverside Yamaha. Um, they have a race team. It's like the factory supported Yamaha race team in Canada and it's called Riverside Yamaha. And he's like, they're going to hire Greg Schnell, you know, who I was familiar with him because he was a racer, you know, in California. And, uh, you know, you should come up here. And I said, okay, you know, what does it pay? Well, it doesn't pay anything, but they'll cover all your expenses. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. You know, that, <laughs> that sounds, sounds like a good that deal. That sounds great. I know. <laughs> yeah. And I remember telling my mom, like, I'm going to move to Canada, work on this race team, and they're not going to pay us, but, you know, they're going to cover the expenses. And she was just like, what? Like, you know, are you, are you sure? Like, that doesn't yeah, sound yeah. like a good idea. And I, it, to me at the time, I was just like, this is awesome. You know, I get to go to the motocross races and be around a pro team. Yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's like an internship. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's the way they work sometimes. Yep. Okay. For sure. So went there and did that. And I actually was a mechanic for a rider named Bart Stevenson. And it was, I mean, it was kind of cool at the time. They did, the, it was the 125 and the 250, um, 250F, you know, kind of class and Yamaha, it would have been 2000, I guess 2003. And, uh, so we went there and I worked for this guy and it was an East and West series, kind of like Supercross. Okay. And we led almost the whole championship, which was cool. And at the time we were double classing. So like as a mechanic, I'm, this is my first time on a race team and we're double classing. <laughs> like, classes. so literally the team manager would like wash your 250 F and you'd grab the 450 and run to the line and come back. And maybe you'd have time to change a tire. Cause there wasn't, yeah. you didn't bring your tires there was no tire truck in right, Canada right, at the right, time, right. you know? So, so yeah, my first job was double classing. We'd race both classes. And then after the second round, we were in the lead in the championship. So they're like, Hey, maybe you guys should focus on the 250F. And we did that. And last round still in the points lead. And, uh, it was a track that crossed your start straight away, crossed a lane. And then you turned down the second lane. And the last moto of the series, my rider turned down oh. the first lane and that's not where the track went. So he had to like, he's way behind dead last at this point. And we lost the championship by like two points or oh, something. No. Evan Lawford's won it. I've been and, there. But that was a cool way to start in the mechanic career anyway. 
So, uh, uh, probably great experience. Yeah. A little rushed, it sounds like, in those first couple rounds. But yeah. um, so, how did what did you parlay that into? Um, and were you breaking? Were you doing engines like? building motors and all that stuff at that point or and some stuff i mean things were way simpler at that time people didn't know four strokes that good right. so the the four strokes that we were racing were actually stock and they had like a pro circuit pipe and race gas and we work on jetting all day it was like the big yeah. trick is just make sure your jetting yeah. was right which was a chore back then and uh but yeah any engine stuff that had to be done and even then i would help uh you know rebuild greg schnell's 252 stroke or something like that mm -hmm. and whatever we had to do because we me and one other mechanic lived on the road and then some guys would fly in and and whatnot but it's uh yeah all so right. we drove all the way across the country as well in a in a, like a 42 so you, foot fifth you wheel. also went to the east coast rounds even though you're yep. riding west okay. yep yep so then what so after that um the series was over and obviously it wasn't even a paying job so it's not going to pay you in the off season right. so I came home to Phoenix and was like, man, I need to figure out how to do this full time, you know? And this is, so I guess this is the 2003 season would have ended, I don't know, August or something like that. And I just think I went home and just started going, how, how do you do this? You know, and a few people I met in Canada, I actually remember one guy, I think his name was Wayne Madsen. He ran the Blackfoot team or maybe Blair Morgan Yamaha team is what it was and he was kind of like a team manager agent type guy and I knew him a little bit and I think they raced in the U.S. a little bit so I'd ask him like man what do I need to do to try to get a hold of one of these American teams to go work for him and I think he tried a little bit and I don't remember exactly who it was but somehow I emailed somebody at Racer X okay and I should remember this because it was important but and I <laughs> I emailed them and just said, man, I'm a mechanic. I worked on this Canadian race team. Like, how do you get a hold of like team managers and stuff to get a job, you know? And next thing I know, I get an email response that's like, check Racer X's website. And I'm like, okay. And I look on it and it's like me mechanic uh, job wanted or something to those lines. Yeah. And I started getting emails from all kinds of teams. And I'm like, wow, this is, that guy really hooked me up, you know? And um, so there was a few teams at the time. Like, I think I had like three different things. I think one of them might've even been like to work on an off-road team for Ty Davis. And another one was, uh, you remember that Samsung Radio Shack Yamaha, like a kind of a, yeah, they had a reality TV show. And yeah. Lucky Nichols was a guy from Texas that ran it. And they had like Matthew Lolos, um, was Villeman, did Villeman ride for them at a point? They switched yeah, to Hondas? Yeah, later on yeah, Hondas, okay. but at first it was a Yamaha team and Michael Blos was on it and yeah. a few other people and like they were really interested. And then Keith Johnson, who was part of Star Racing, called me and he was a, the rider and he Keith kind of got together with Bobby, I think in 2000, at the end of 2002, Keith was like a privateer, I'm pretty sure. And Bobby had like maybe Chase Reed and Johnny Marley or something he was helping. And Keith was like, man, these guys, this guy's taking them all the way around the country and they're not really doing that good. Like, and he went and talked to Bobby, I think at Washougal or something was like, hey, it, if you could give me a ride to the races, my grandfather owns this Yamaha dealership. And like, I could put your bike in the, in the main event probably, you know, where I don't know about these guys you got. And it's something along those lines. I'm not sure I got it exactly right. But, uh, yeah, so, um, he, he put, where, where was I going with that? Um, well, he, he connected with Bobby for the start yeah. to, you know, to get on that star early yeah, so star Keith program. Johnson called me and wanted to hire me as a mechanic okay. and, and Keith Johnson had to actually just won the top privateer in 2003. I didn't work for him at that point. I was doing the Canada thing and, uh, but his mechanic wanted to do something else after there and Keith was kind of hiring his own mechanic because Keith was Keith was kind of like kind of the originator of the team a little bit with Bobby okay. like Bobby I think the agreement was Keith would kind of act like team manager and gather sponsors and Bobby would provide him away to the races and fund you know the rig getting to the races and type of thing so Keith actually hired me and my first job was and I'm probably at this point I must have been 19, 20, 19 going 20 yeah. something like that and 
Keith's like, by the way, so so my, kinda, my, there's no money. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was a little better than that. Okay, but um, actually, just when we moved here, I found my original contract from Bobby, and it was like five hundred dollars a race, a race. If there's no race, there's no pay. You know, type of thing. Okay, and I think I got fifteen hundred dollars uh, travel money for the year. That's what the deal was. Oh, good but deal. I thought that was awesome yeah. because I was used to not getting paid, you know. But if so, he gets hurt, then you're in trouble. Oh, yeah. 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 But um, so I haven't met Bobby Reagan at this point. And Keith, Keith had kind of said, hey, I'm going to be in California testing. Um, you know, come out and you can kind of try out for the job or whatever. So I still remember. I don't know if you remember a uh, super cross track Tommy Harrison had in kind of Redlands area. Yeah. So I met Keith Johnson there for the first time. Okay. And I get there and... You know, they were testing with Enzo actually at the time. And, you know, I worked on his bike for the day, took suspension on and off type of yeah. thing. And he's like, yeah, you know, I think you can do the job. By the way, the first race is in Spain. Do you have a passport? And I'm <laughs> like, um, no passport, you know, I'll have to look into that. So I expedited the passport. I think, you know, maybe a week or two later we were in Spain. And at that race, I don't know if you remember, was like- Was that Seville? Yeah. And it was like the worst mud race yeah. in the world, you know? So Early. That, yeah. Daryl Hurley won. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And kind of a cool memory of that race was, so Keith, the first heat race, it's, you know, the riders were trying to boycott that race, the yeah. 250 guys, and it was like chaos. Like people were telling Davey Coombs, like, there's no way we can race. And he was kind of making fun of them and stuff. And it was kind of, it was kind of weird for your first race. Well, Keith Johnson in the heat race, they had like a whoop pad that they never built it and it was super soft mud. And he just buried the bike to like the top of the seat. Like couldn't, he had to leave it there. So he leaves the bike in the heat race. And then I'm pretty sure this is like televised or whatnot. And my, so my bike I'm working on stuck on the track. And I mean, it's stuck. Like, so I go out there and there's like four Spanish guys that I can't speak right. language, you know, and we're, they're trying to help me, but they're like pulling the wrong way on the bike. And the heat race is on the line and we're like going, man, we're on the track, like, and there's bikes warming their bike up on the heat race. So I get the bike started. It's still stuck, but maybe we've loosened it up a little bit. And I'm like, I might as well try riding this thing off the track. Oh, like, no. that's all I know, you know? Okay. And so I get it unstuck and I start going and I realize like, this is a muddy super cross track with <laughs> ruts everywhere. And I'm like, I have no choice but to like pin it, yeah. you know? And I got no helmet on or anything, obviously. And I end up going down like, two lanes of the track and backwards down the start straightaway to get off the track. And the, all these Spanish fans are going nuts. And like, I remember meeting Davy Coombs later in the, in the hotel and he goes, dude, I'm going to try to get that on opening ceremony. That was the coolest thing ever. Like this mechanics <laughs> is pinning it and all the riders are like, sure, I'm going to crash and all this stuff. So this is all in my first race, you know? Yeah. And I don't think Davey ended up televising it. Trial by fire, though. Or that's, whatever, it was wild, a wild first race, for sure. That's hilarious. Yeah. All right, so you end up meeting... Did you ever meet Bobby? Yeah, so I met okay. him at the at you know in Spain. Okay. And uh, I actually think, like, there was... Maybe at the second round, we didn't get along very good. So it was, like... Um, I think, basically... I'd never traveled overseas, you know, I'm still 19, whatever. And I think like, I had no clue what to do. So I probably did something wrong and couldn't sleep at the night before the race, like at all, you know? So I've been up for like 40 hours or something. Yeah. And I think I was supposed to be at the track, like to work on my bike the next morning early. And I probably woke up late and I was a little behind on bike work. And then we got to Holland, which is the next round and everyone's bikes trashed. And the promoter, which I can't remember who it was, Clear Channel or something, just, gathered as many OEM parts as they could and just like dumped them in the pits. And like mechanics were literally like jumping into a pile of parts and like grabbing clutches and, and brake pads and all this oh stuff. It gosh. was chaos. Like it was literally like people almost tackling each other for the parts. And so like it was- Like Black Friday sale. Yeah. And this was like <laughs> maybe the day of practice, you know, like, and so it was like a struggle to get bike work done after a mud race that like on time and, and this and that. And I remember Bobby like kind of like, rushing me to get stuff done and I was like man I'm doing the best I can like you know and we, I think we kind of got into it a little bit and uh, and I was 19 so like it's I was probably kind of wild you know like yeah man, like not not probably that. not super tactful yeah. And, yeah yeah so I remember I remember getting into him a little bit and thinking man I don't think that he's probably gonna fire me after this but when I mean, it was all right 
it seems like it's worked out. Yep. So did you do that whole season then with Keith? Yeah, so that in the end of 2003, it was those races. I think that was it because those were the World Supercross rounds that year. And then 04, I started as a mechanic for Keith um, the, that whole season. At Star Yamaha. Yep. That was really the early on days of yep. Okay. Yep. And that time we weren't, I think Yamaha gave us some bikes, but it was mostly Bobby Jay's Bobby Yamaha Jay's. was yeah. Keith's grandfather. And like that year, it was Kevin Johnson, uh, Brian Johnson, who's actually local here in Cairo now, which oh, is yeah? kind of funny looking back at it. And he wasn't related to the New Mexico Johnsons, but it was Keith and Kevin who were brothers, and then Jeff Gibson and Brian Johnson. And Isaiah was retired by then, maybe? Nope. Isaiah was a privateer that year, and he actually rode for us in 2005, the okay. next year. Um, so, yeah, the next year... I'm sure the arguments about this was probably pretty good because Keith is out in this time is still kind of the team manager that gathers the sponsors. But yeah, he didn't rehire his brother the next year and he rehired his cousin. So, but we were kind of like riding 252 strokes and a couple 250F guys maybe. Yeah. It, Yamaha didn't care what we did. They gave us just a little bit of stuff and yeah. and we did our thing. But um, So how did you and Bobby get to where you got along okay after the first impression yeah i think there was some times where you know i think just because i was young and bobby's like got certain things that are really important to him and i didn't really know that at the time i mean i think there was i think i've been fired before maybe in the first three or four years um i remember one instance in 2005 like we were out in the middle of nowhere new mexico test track like going testing engine parts and stuff like yeah. that and like i didn't answer my phone because i didn't have service and that's one thing that Bobby gets a little upset about is if you don't answer your phone, like he's not happy, you know, he wants to be able to talk to you. And he got mad at me about not answering my phone, but I couldn't help it, you know, so I got mad at him. And I think he fired me, but Keith called him and was like, look, man, like we're out there testing all day. Like he didn't do anything wrong. And, you know, I got my job back, I think, that day. But <sighs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. Okay, so how many years then did you work with Keith? Um, so I worked for him as full-time mechanic, 2004, 2005, and then into that 2003 season. But in, I think the next transition kind of happened, um, you know, in 2005, I can remember this pretty well. In 2004, I was just kind of going with the flow of what they had going. Yeah. But there was a lot of problems. Some of the other mechanics weren't, like I was a qualified mechanic. A lot of mechanics in the industry at that time weren't really like, and there's a lot of things like that were going wrong with other people's bikes. And that would be like, Hey, I don't think you should do that. You know, and mm. they wouldn't really listen. And maybe they would have more bike problems than I would type of thing. And, and this was er in the early stages of the four stroke. So there was probably a lot of yeah. guys who didn't understand those engines yep. as well as they should yep. have. For sure. So in 2005, I just, I was still Keith Johnson's mechanic, but me and the, one of the mechanics I worked with in Canada, we literally built I think we had five riders and we built all the race bikes in my mom's garage. And in 2004, we had like a concept hauler type rig. Yeah. And in 05, Bobby bought a semi truck. So it was like kind of like a step up. And literally we built all the bikes in my mom's garage. Me and I think it was five riders and it was just me and one other mechanic and we built them all in my mom's garage. The semi came there straight from Mississippi and we loaded up the bikes and went to California, maybe rode them, broke, you know, kind of run them through their paces for a week. There wasn't really a testing program. It was yeah. like, and you didn't have a track to ride. Was Yamaha letting you ride their track? Um, I think back then they would let us ride like once a week after two o'clock. And it was, I mean, <laughs> so when it's ham burned out and dry yeah, and like, everybody's gone. Yeah. Like, and whoops were bigger back then. And like, our two VDF riders, there was no shot they could even go through the whoops, you know? Is like, that right? Yeah, so it was definitely a way different time, you know? Well, in that 05 season, you guys got some support from Factory Yamaha. Not quite then. 05 was actually, um, Keith had got together where Bobby Jays was doing some of the support. Actually, 05, I think we didn't have any Yamaha support. They almost backed us down. Mm. And so Keith was like, okay, Man, it's gonna be hard to do just out of the dealership. So I think previously Yamaha had given him a little bit of support. And then we got North County Yamaha involved as well. So Bobby J's and North County Yamaha were helping out and NCOI was a big like supporter of the team. And I think Fly Racing came on, so that maybe helped the funding a little bit. And yeah, there was no factory support at that time. 
And I kind of remember at some point, Ross Maeda from Enzo told Bobby, he was like, hey, you need to hire Brad as like the crew chief because like he's trying to help all these guys. A lot of the guys on the team aren't quite as knowledgeable. He could really help you guys if like he oversaw everything that went on. And I was like, you know, I mean, I, I was surprised Ross noticed that much about what I was doing because it's not like I was advertising it, you know? Yeah. And he just he was just observing at the races and noticed that I was helping a lot of guys. And like I said, me and one other guy built all the bikes. I think that year in 05, I pretty much lived on the truck. And like I read, some of the mechanics flew in and out and it was like their part-time job. And I would do their whole bike during the week. So I was building like two or three bikes. And they show up and you'd already built their motors and everything. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of where it came from. But Ross is really, I don't think you could have convinced Bobby that if Ross hadn't like told him that. Mm. But Ross, uh, Bobby respected Ross as most people in the industry do. And was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So kind of the timing of that came together where Bobby, I remember he had to go in like a lot of meetings with Keith McCarty in 05 and just say, man, like we really want the shot at being like a factory satellite team with factory support. And I remember back then it was crazy. Like you had to prove all kinds of crazy financials that you could handle it and lots of meetings with Keith and, and he kind of, that all worked out. So 06 was the first year that, that they gave us year, factory okay. support. And it was also the year that they gave Motor World, they were a Suzuki team and they gave them factory support. And both those teams were, they hired an in-house engine guy at Yamaha and he kind of worked on the engines and he would give us cranks and cams and pistons and say, here's heads and this is what I developed. You guys have to put them together. You know, you put all your race bikes together, come back to Yamaha and dyno them. And that, so us and Motor World was basically on the same equipment. Okay. And maybe, maybe you could have snuck something in there on your own if you wanted to, but they're relatively the same equipment. So that was eight riders that were on those kind of bikes on Yamaha. And then Yamaha Troy kind of did their own thing. They didn't want help from that factory guy that came in there. Frenchie was doing the motors and their bikes were, they were veterans of the, of the sport at yeah. that time. And they're, they were the highest team, but it was, it's pretty crazy to look now. There's really, we're the only factory supported 250 team. And back then there was three, you know, mm -hmm. just in the 250 class. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so did that factory help really kind of boost you guys? Was that a good? I think at the time for sure it was good because in 05 and 04, like the motor program was like, I think a jam racing did the two strokes and uh, big gun exhaust. Mike Young would like help with a four stroke uh, motor and it, one would be maybe Brian Johnson's bike would be built by this guy and Jeff Gibson's oh, was okay. built by this guy and who knows, no dyno, yeah. who knows what they were, you know, and, and uh, a little loose. Yeah. So th at least this was a structured program. And for 06, we were pumped, you know, and as well as that, they would, that was kind of, my label was kind of the crew chief, but I would assemble engines and do the suspension and they brought me in house with uh, the yamaha suspension guy at the time was Corey hutter and he taught me like hey this is what you should do here's a spec sheet here's what you got to modify on the suspension do this and i'm just like yeah I mean, you guys are factory like i'm gonna do whatever you say you yeah. know so well that's what our suspension was at the time i i built it you know with the help of Corey Gosh. hutter from yamaha you're really doing it all yeah <laughs> yeah and that's what i think has helped me over the years is i've done everything on the team so i understand it all yeah just to a pretty high level not i'm not maybe the best suspension guy in the world i'm maybe not the best engine guy in the world i'm maybe not the best team manager in the world but i've done all the jobs and i think that's something that not everyone's done yeah. so it's really beneficial yeah, so, yeah. absolutely you've got a, all of those skills uh, built into your toolbox there um tell me about the years kind of from from 06 you guys get yep. support to 2014 where Jeremy Martin wins the first championship for you guys, right? Was it yep. 14 or 15? 14. 14, right? yep. So in that window, and when, we had, when Bobby was on, he mentioned there was multiple times he, he thought he was just yeah. gonna close it up, like, you yeah. know. Well, and to his credit, yep. either too damn stubborn or too competitive, but no yep. way he was gonna keep going. Yeah, so I think 06, you know, we had Sean Collier, Brian Johnson, Matt Gerke, Martin Davalos. We were a fresh factory supported team, so 
we're on top of the world, you yeah. know, like we're, it's awesome. Like, okay. and you know, our results maybe weren't great, but I remember multiple guys leading heat races and stuff. But what seemed to happen back then is I can remember Gerke and Martin both doing this. They would whole shot a heat and they're leading the thing and first or second time in the whoops, just full front flip, you know? So like we would, that's just what would happen, you know? Like, yeah. um, so I don't know. We had glimpses of brilliance, but that kind of stuff would happen a lot. And, and Martin Davalos to, to go touch on him for a minute. I remember Colleen going, Hey, you know, we really want Brian Johnson again. And I remember her kind of going, well, or no, we said, Somehow, Martin lived here in Cairo, which is funny yeah. that we're here now. Yeah. And so did Brian Johnson. And, and somehow Colleen worked a deal where we had both of them. And I remember Bobby was, Bobby, Bobby's always liked the amateur scene. Like he would rather bring up a young kid through the ranks and, and watch them grow than just have like hire somebody else's yeah. champion, you know? Like he'd much rather do that. And it goes way back, like Bobby's been going to Loretta's before I probably knew what Loretta's was, you know, and he's just enjoyed watching it and everything like that. And Martin is somebody he watched and what Bobby would watch a lot is not who necessarily won all the time, especially because we probably couldn't assign those guys, but he would watch like who went down the first turn and showed a lot of heart and just went through the pack. And Martin was that guy. And we heard Martin and I remember that year, like the first time we were allowed at the Omaha track was one of these afternoons and Martin just, Endo in a whoops, and we get back up and come to try to get endo again. And I'm talking like highlight real Big crashes. Endos, yeah. And he would do it maybe six times, and I would be like, Martin, we gotta we gotta pack it up, man. Like this, <laughs> your season's gonna be done. Like we gotta think about this tonight, and maybe live another day, and come back tomorrow. And and he he kind of kept doing that to the point where actually I almost forgot about this, but Martin's second race which is, this is our first year being a factory supported team. He was leading or running second the whole race and he was doubling the whoops pretty much. He was that fast that he managed to stay up front doubling the whoops. And the last lap he looked back and it was Davey Millsaps who was one of his buddies from yeah. Cairo here as well. And he basically just doubled the whoops and let Davey blow by, but Martin got third in his second supercross. So mm. that was probably the first like really cool thing that happened for the team. I mean, a podium. First podium. Yeah, and uh, I almost forgot about that because it not many more came after that. It wasn't, you know. What year was that? 06. 06. And I think it was Martin, I think it was Atlanta Supercross and it was Martin's second race. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And the good, and why Martin had that opportunity is he was kind of a whole shot specialist back then and yeah. he would get starts and put himself there. But the whoop thing was a problem for Martin for quite a while. And he eventually got good at him, but when he was on our team, it, it was only a year because Factory KTM kind of swooped him up because yeah. they saw some potential there. But he, uh, yeah, that was that was probably the big moment for the year there and is okay. that podium for sure. Cause... And how are you and Bobby getting along at this point? Good, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically Bobby's, you know, just uh, in 06, I think we were big gun and we, Mike Young from Big Gun Exhaust, who was the owner at the time, he just let us have like a space at his shop and that was in Rancho Cucamonga. So I lived there in an apartment for a while and we worked out of there. And you know, Bobby was in Mississippi, would come to every race, but it was kind of up to me to run whatever yeah. thing we were running, you know? And it, there wasn't a box van, anything like that in the early days. It was like my pickup truck. And yeah, it was just, yeah. there wasn't a whole Make lot of happen. structure to it. But, you know, we kept evolving every year a little bit. And, you yeah. Know. Well, I, I just, so I'm interested in the story yeah. of your two, your relationship, because yeah. he obviously has a lot of trust in you. He, yeah. He's basically implied you're part owner now, but yeah. when he moves on, this will be your program. Yeah. And so he wouldn't do that to anybody. No. And you can tell this is his, this yeah. is his baby. Like, yeah. you know. And yeah. it's pretty so. awesome that, like, he's done that because, like, yeah. I've been here with them for almost 20 years and grew the company, but there's lots of companies that somebody's there growing with them and that doesn't happen. You Absolutely. Know? So I'm, I really obviously appreciate everything he's done. And um, yeah, but it's, 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 it's awesome that he thinks that, you yeah. know, and has given me that opportunity because I know it's not normal. There's probably no other team that that's ever happened with that I can think of. So um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I, and you know, 
yeah, I don't know. Like uh, Mitch, what, what will he do? You know, who knows, right? Like, yeah. yeah, that isn't something that you see a lot. So yeah, pretty cool. So yeah. so then keep going. Uh, yeah. That was 06, you got your first podium, and then it was a bit of a dry spell again, though, huh? Yeah, I, you know, I can't remember every race for sure, but the next year we had Collier, Brock Tickle, and he was another guy Bobby had been watching at Loretta's. Okay. Matt Lemoyne, another guy Bobby had been watching at Loretta's. And I think I might be missing a guy in there. I know Jake Moss came in at some point as a replacement guy from Australia. Yeah. Um, but kind of the same program. We had factory support on the engines. Nothing had really changed. Um, same stuff, you know, but factory Omaha was going here, you know, here's your parts and everything like that. And they also, I remember at the time, um, they were wanting to bring in a 50 millimeter fork. And so we had, we got like a upgrade that at the time we thought, man, this is a trick. Like We've we got, made it. We got yeah. a 50 millimeter fork is close to what Chad Reed's running, but maybe a 250 version of it. Like this is awesome, you know? Okay. And so we raced with that, but that season, I don't remember it being really a step forward. I mean, we lost Martin, which he'd proven he could be a podium guy, but KTM kind of stole him from us. So, yeah, it, I don't remember that being an extremely good year. You know, I don't think we had any podiums, but. That was where, you know, you guys went from being very entry level team yep. to then like through this window, it's like you were that middle level where if you had, if you found an amateur kid or yeah. found somebody and you, and, through your platform, they put in a couple good results. Yeah, somebody with more money or, or yeah. higher level team just stole them right away. So, yeah. so it's like <laughs> that's yeah. a tough spot to oh, be. It's yeah. kind of no man's land. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. And like, I mean, in this deal, you can do a lot of things right, but if you don't have every piece to the puzzle, like you're not going to see the success on paper. You know, there was times when we were probably doing the bike stuff right, but we weren't doing something else right, and it didn't show. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like I said, that year was, and the reason I brought up the 50 millimeter fork is it was kind of like, brings us to 08. I'd kind of gone like, man, I think we need to evolve. And like the 08 Yamaha's plan for us is like, here's the same engine stuff. By this time, we've kind of realized that riders are thinking like, we don't have enough bottom end. Our suspension's not very good. Mm -hmm. Will Hahn actually rode the outdoors the last three in 07 and we had our you know 50 millimeter fork and i remember will raced a race and he was like uh i don't want to complain because i'm happy i have the job but this suspension's terrible and he's like it's so stiff like this might be supercross suspension and i was like okay and i'm doing the suspension at the time and i'm like um okay and i maybe talked to ross a little bit and i think we started at like for 08 we scrambled, tried to do something. We didn't really figure it out for the end of 07, but I realized like, hey, we gotta be better in 08. So kind of my background growing up was my dad is a mechanical engineer. I probably went to the shop with my dad and did stuff to do with engines a lot when I was super mm. young. I mean, taking apart engines, all this stuff. So I have a pretty good idea what's going on. And he's a good source of information to talk about because he's been in engine design his whole life. So I was kind of like, dad, uh, Yamaha will give us these factory engines, but they don't seem to want to evolve much. And I, I even remember specifically bringing my dad into a meeting with Keith McCarty, and my dad was talking about maybe things we could do, and he didn't, Keith didn't really think we would probably get it right, you know? So he was trying to like maybe, well, you know, your stuff might not be the best, but this is probably better than you're gonna do. And my dad had worked with some engineers on an Infinity Indy program, and he's like, well, I know one of the best cam designers in the world, you know, we'll have schedule a meeting with him and this is in Arizona. And so I kind of went down to Arizona to my dad's office and in the off season before 08, and was like, you know, this is what we're doing, you know, and he recommended, hey, talk to this, I'm gonna set you up, I'm gonna do your cam stuff and your valve spring stuff and go talk to this guy that does cylinder heads, he's in the San Francisco area and do that and, and kind of guided us through it a little bit and we did our own thing. And we started really improving the performance of the bike um, through all this stuff because we just were working and dynoing and this guy Bob Worth in the in the Bay Area, like we went up there and put our engine on a car dyno and and he did some really good cylinder heads for us. And then this guy Hans Hermann's a German cam designer and he's done stuff, you know, in Germany for KTM, probably all kinds of stuff. He designed some camshafts for us, some valve springs and now we're doing our own engine program, you know? Okay, and, and significantly better than what Yamaha was giving you. Yeah, yeah, we knew we had like a low end power problem 
and we fixed that. And like, I remember Will being like, pr it was pretty happy with the bike because he started in 07 with us and you know, the stuff we were doing was a lot better. And same thing with suspension, I attacked that as well. Uh, we literally, the 50 millimeter fork was a huge investment for us in 2007 and we just scrapped it because it was Even it for wasn't Supercross? Good. Yeah. Just, oh, wow. we, we just didn't use it and we spent all kinds of money on it, but it, it really wasn't better. And uh, so we, I think Ross helped us a lot that year and outdoors we started a stock platform, which we still go back to that stuff today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started a stock platform with suspension, work from there. It's usually a good baseline, you know, yeah. especially for these amateurs come up, they ride pretty soft suspension all their life. Then I think these teams, you come off a of supercross, your stuff's really stiff. You go straight to outdoor testing, it feels really soft. The riders end up kind of making it probably too stiff a little bit sometimes. So we did that in 08. I don't know that the results really uh, spoke for that, but our riders were much happier. And we were, we probably had some decent results. I don't, Didn't I don't really tickle, know. Didn't Tickle, I want to say he won Seattle in like 08 or 09. It was 10. It was yeah. 10, okay. Yep. So but, was that your guys' first win? In 10, yep first win yeah yep. okay so oh nine now we're getting to this economy crash zone ah uh, that's right oh eight so oh nine i remember we got that this is the only time i remember bobby calling me at the end of oh eight and going brad i can't get a gear deal we always had a fly gear deal for those most of those years we were talking about they pay us some money we could afford to go racing and i remember in oh eight bobby called me probably in like November and was like, Brad, uh, I just called Coy Gibbs. I'm trying to get you a job there. Cause I'm pretty sure we're like, we're not gonna be able to go racing. You know? Oh wow. And at the time I'm still young enough that I'm like, well, that's cool. That sounds cool. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right on. I'm thinking like, man, they're like a factory Yamaha team. They sound like a NASCAR team. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. And then I swear that only lasted for like a day. And Bobby's like, no fears in we're good to go. And, but, We'd all heard the rumors. No fear was already known. Like to maybe we're gonna get paid, maybe we're not. But Bobby's like, "Ah, oh, we'll be all right," you know. So we go racing. It was Tickle again, Michael Hall, uh, Matt Lemoyne, and Darren Durham. And actually, another cool story that I kind of left out at the end of '08. Um, let me see if I get this right. Keith McCarty called us, and this is something that Will and Bobby kind of had it out for a little while over. Keith McCarty called us and said, hey, Jason Lawrence, Yamaha Troy, and I'm gonna merge you guys in Yamaha Troy. And we're like, okay. I mean, that kind of sounds cool again to us at the time because that's a team that's won some championships. Jason Lawrence is a, obviously a really fast rider and we're kind of like, cool. And so we start merging, which they were in Valencia. We had a shop in Elsinore and we're like, Elsinore makes a lot more sense. We're like, you know, five miles from the yeah. test track. So they kind of agreed. We started literally moving all the Yamaha Troy stuff to the star shop. But at the time, it kind of seemed weird. Like some people didn't seem on board on the Yamaha Troy side. They moved the stuff. But I kind of told Bobby, I was like, hey, there was nothing good in the YOT shop. Like no kit suspension, no race engines. Nothing worth anything was like, there. We're moving like standard 125 transmissions by the like hundreds and like weird stuff. And I was like, this is weird, you know? Mm. And so a few months later, Keith McCarty calls Bobby, or no, not a few months later, a few weeks later, and uh, calls Bobby and says, hey, there's a warrant out for Lawrence's arrest. Like, this is not gonna work. You can't have Jason Lawrence because he's got a warrant out for his arrest. And we're like, okay. And he's like, by the way, that leaves you guys without a title contender. The salary of the team is going to be reduced to this. And we're like, oh. And this is the bad economy stuff starting, you know. So we were like, wow, that, that leaves us. And with the merger, they told us you got to take your best two riders. So at the time, Matt Lemoyne and Brock Tickle were our best two riders. Ryan Morris and Lawrence were their best two riders. That was going to be the team. Well, Lawrence is out because he's got a warrant for his arrest. Morris is owed a lot of money from YOT for winning a championship and they didn't pay him. So he's like 
trying to find anything but this, you know? So he finds a ride at Pro Circuit. So both the YLT guys are gone. Meanwhile, we let Will Hahn, which was probably a prospect, you know, going forward. We had to let him go. We were forced to by Yamaha. Went to KTM, right? Uh, yep. Yep. He went to KTM. And uh, so it was kind of, that was kind of a step backwards because. So what time, this was really late in the season. This is November? Yeah, like probably right after the outdoors, this kind of stuff started. Okay. And it kind of went a little later. And I think that's the time where Bobby was like, man, we might have to just call this thing a day, you know? And um, Durham was somebody that YLT was kind of bringing up, and we ended up with Durham. I, I'm pretty sure we signed Michael Hall and Durham to fill that Morris and Lawrence spot the last minute. And then YLT ended up breaking back off because, they, because we weren't allowed to sign Lawrence. They were like, well, screw it. We'll leave Yamaha support, and we'll run our YLT team as a private team with J Law, he'll get out of jail and we'll be good. So they went and did that, and we were the now we're the only Yam. They were riding Yamahas, but they were white. They weren't branded because like AMPM. Yep. AMPM. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So that's kind of I guess how we got our start as the top Yamaha team. Like Wild T kind of just self destructed, I guess you could call it. And yeah. uh, now we're wow. left as you know. I think Motor World was out by this point, so we're kind of the only Yamaha 250 team now in 2009 and sure enough no fear didn't pay us and uh, so it's a big financial struggle and I remember Fox Shocks like offered Bobby a pretty good amount of money for us at the time and I was like into the suspension thing and Darren Durham's dad also pushed he owns PR2 and in, in Pennsylvania a suspension company and he was kind of pushing Fox Shock and it was a lot of money and we didn't have a gear deal that we could count on or anything. And so I, I was like really worried about it, you know, cause it had never been seen or ran yeah. or anything. It was no fork, right? It was just, just a, a shock. shock. Okay. Yeah. So I was in charge of the suspension still. I would do our KYB forks just like we'd always done, but we would, we would try to make this shock work. And we actually had a lot of support from engineers and Fox and there was a lot of really cool things to that shock, but, it for sure ruined our season. Like you, really? we got to the first race and the whoops, it was just absolutely horrible. And like, I wasn't, I was experienced enough to take like a baseline setting and make it a little bit better, but I wasn't experienced to take something that was a complete disaster and make it good at the time. And, and would Ross work with you on that at all? Or no, no, he didn't know anything about it. Probably. No. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they were probably slightly offended that we didn't have Enzo stickers or KYB stickers anymore but it was really just about money and we thought we could make it work because the thing to this day had like really trick features about it, but there was just something wrong with it because like couldn't it make it work. seemed like it would work for 10 minutes and you had to rebuild it to get it to work right again. And like, it took us a long time through the season to figure out like some things about it. And we got it a little better, but in Supercross we for sure like our guys were screwed. Like, mm. if the whoops were big, like there was no chance they could go through them. And outdoors, we ha we kind of learned a lot in Supercross and got it decent, but it probably still wasn't great. And that program, Fox actually sold. They were a private company at the time that Bob Fox owned, and they sold that next year. And they were like, "This is not a money maker. Like, we're done with this." So we kind of went back to KYB in 2010. But 09 was probably a pretty big pretty struggle, rough, I would rough say. Year. Yeah, because I mean, like I said, team almost shut down. No fear didn't pay us. Like, just God, those no fear yeah. guys stuck yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, it's crazy. And I actually asked Bobby, does that happen in other business ventures that you've been involved? He says, Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's not yeah. just our sport, but it it's shameful how much it happens. You know? Yeah, for sure. I remember the way they made up for it is they're like here. We'll give you 150 sets of gear that you can oh, sell yeah. at NCY. <laughs> and it was like two year old gear. And the NCY owner was like, I mean, I can sell this stuff for like 75 bucks a set. Like, you know, they're not going to buy it. They want the new stuff. And, and we, you know, 150 sets of gear for a dealer of one brand of gear, probably maybe too many at the time. I don't know. But it, it didn't help, you know? No. So, so that was that. Okay. Um, 2010 was a better year for sure. Yamaha redesigned the chassis somewhat, and I think that was a help for us. And this whole time, the engine program's probably steadily improving a little bit. Like the suspension went backwards in 09, 
One more thing about 09 that I think is kind of interesting, though, is and this is something like kind of a feather in Bobby's cap, is he realized that training should be more like a team training program. And he hired Rhino to be like the team trainer. And I think that's the first time that there was like a team trainer. I could be a little bit off because I just didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. But it felt like the first time that, hey, our guys are going to this guy every afternoon to work out with them do all this stuff and it's like really an involved thing that every guy on the team's on the same program. It felt like we were kind of the first ones to do that. There probably was some other thing that I didn't know about or something, but um, so I thought that was kind of cool. A little bit disappointing part though, and I'm sure they're probably disappointed with it looking back, is like the riders really didn't take advantage of it. Like, mm. and Lawrence was actually supposed to be on that program as well, but like Lemoyne and Durham, kind of were screwing around and they didn't appreciate like Rhino, like trying to like work them hard and stuff. Right. They just complain about being too sore to ride and all this stuff. And I think they probably screwed up and not embracing that. But it, it, even at that time that, maybe the top, top guys were training with Alden or whatever, but it was just a handful. And it didn't feel like at least teams that at our level were doing much about that. Yeah. And Bobby kind of pushed that. And ever since we've had some kind of involvement like that in the team. And uh, yeah, 2010 kept moving forward uh, with engine development. The same guy was still doing it, the Bay Area guy doing the- Parts of it. And then okay. halfway through the year we started, Osborne was in Europe racing Yamahas and the team was heavily involved with Cosworth. Mm -hmm. And I knew Cosworth to be like a racing engine thing. It's something I really would like to be involved with. And I started, I can't remember exactly how this worked, but I somehow got a hold of these Cosworth people and they had a US division in Torrance and was just like, man, they're helping this Yamaha team in Europe that Zach's riding for. Like, you guys are already making this stuff, you know, can, can we figure something out? And we kind of started working with them and uh, developed a relationship that really took us into a jump start the next year. I know a lot of people look at 14 as this year where we broke out, but this is really where it started happening. Okay. And in 2010, uh, Brock Tickle won Seattle. Yeah. So that was obviously huge. Like it was, I don't know if it was really a mud race, but maybe it rained the day before in Seattle. Yeah, it was, was obviously it was rutted. squishy and soft. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. And I mean, it was one of the squirreliest Seattle's I remember. I remember Brock won that race and he was going through the whoops with, sitting down with both feet off the pegs. Yeah. Like, Didn't Andrew Short win the 450 class that night? Could have been. I, I think that know. was the night he won. Yeah. Anyway. And Anstey earlier in the year led most of the San Diego Supercross race and Jeff Alessi was a lapper, ran him high in a berm as a lapper. Weimer got back by him and he kind of panicked and fell in a corner. He ended up getting fourth, but he he passed Weimer and was like checking out. Mm. So it was, we were starting to see some cool things happening. And I think we, in the next weekend, Max Insty was like battling with the top, top guys. I think it was Kennard and Weimer in a heat. And he actually had a crash and broke his pelvis or hip or something like that. And it was uh, actually Seeley and Han too. Or they were my yeah. guys at TLD. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And um, same year. Uh, can't remember exactly how we got into this. I'm sure it had to do with Eddie Ray giving us a sales pitch, but we helped Jessica Patterson and WMX, and that was our first championship. We won that championship, and a lot of people probably think, oh, it's women's MX, whatever. Hey, Factory Hunt was involved with it. They were spending yeah. lots of money trying to do it, and then we got that done that year, you know? Yeah, so. that's awesome. Ashley Filick was riding for Factory Honda, right? We had yep. Tara Geiger over yep. at TLD. It was sure. actually, you know, it was, I thought it was a cool addition. But. Yeah, and it was a good learning thing for the team because when you're in a championship, all of a sudden you realize, man, one hiccup at this point and we're out of the series. So I remember even in 2010, like the last race of the WMX, I was like, dude, we're running everything brand new in Jessica's engine and like, because we can't take any chances. Yeah. And, and that's still true this day. You got to like really fight for some of that stuff to make sure you don't drop the ball on it. And it's kind of something I'm pretty proud of to this day is we've never really like totally fumbled the championship yet. Mm -hmm. Like we've been involved in a lot of them and a lot of teams have like, oh, their motor blew up or something. And we've had some like close calls, but we like did enough to like make it happen, you know? Squeaked so, it out. So that's cool. And 
like I said, I remember even back in 2010 taking that like pretty serious, like because yeah. I don't know, it's just it's championship. Championships you know? the championship, yeah. man. Yeah. And I mean, we tried. We had a better bike the next year, like by far, and we had her again. We didn't win it, so it was obviously like a competitive championship. You know yeah. that that we it wasn't easy. You know, oh. type of thing. So, so I think 2010 was honestly the start of things looking up for star. You know, okay. and even though 14 is like when people really noticed. I think that's when it kind of started. Yeah, it doesn't happen overnight. No. Right? So that, no. I, I was curious about when, when yep. those kind of bumps happen. Yep. So and, it sounds like 2010 was a big yep. one. And lots of meetings at that off season with Cosworth, and we convinced them to, we probably couldn't have afforded the engine program that we had, but they, they kind of helped us out a little bit, and they were advertising a little bit. And so our engine program took a huge step up. And there were a few things that I figured out as well that really helped. And uh, the 2011 engine program is like, I mean, let's say in 2010, we had 43 horsepower. We had like 45 or 46 horsepower in 2011. Mm. And back then everyone would rumor, pro bikes are 45 horsepower, you know? And like forever that seemed impossible. You know, we were like, Man, we're good. You know, in six, seven, it was like if we made forty-one, that's pretty good. Yeah. You know, so and PC probably was making forty-five. You know, so we're like, I'm pretty sure our bikes are in the hunt now. You know, and so that year, we were pretty competitive. Like you might have good times in practice. Sipes won Indianapolis and the East West Shootout, mm. and he was legitimately in the title hunt with Barsha on the East for a good while and like second place within 25 points in the title hunt. Was that probably your first title chase? Yeah, yeah. and we didn't, I think there was time where Sipe screwed Pepsi. up and we weren't in it anymore, but we were at least in it for yeah. four or five rounds, you know? Yeah. So that was cool. Um, another big milestone that year was, that was the year where Pro Circuit was just winning everything, you know, like yeah. sweeping podiums. And Swanepoel won our first, motocross is like harder to do good because there's twice the competition and there's a long enough time that the cream rises to the top. Like you yeah. might get lucky in Supercross and there's a first turn crash and in outdoors, you ain't getting lucky in 35 <laughs> no, minutes. No, like, you're not. So Swanee won a moto at Southwick in 2011 and he was our first moto winner and he was also the only rider to beat a pro circuit bike in a moto win that entire year. Is that right? Yep. That's, and it stayed that way all the way to the end of the season. That's pretty cool that he's back on the team. I, yep. I didn't know he was your first moto win. Yep. I knew he was on the team, but. But, I, and like what I can tell you about Bobby Reagan, like part of the reason we're so successful, I remember this day, and Gareth probably doesn't like this, but he won the first moto. But Bobby told him, look, you ain't done shit yet. And this is our first moto win. Like, and he goes, the sec, this thing don't count like that. Like you have to do good again this next moto or you ain't done nothing. Like yeah. get ready for, quit celebrating that you won the moto and get ready for the second moto and go do it again. And I can't remember what Swanee's result was, but it wasn't a win or a podium. I think he got third overall. So it must've been decent, like okay. maybe fourth or fifth fourth or, or something yeah. like that. And we got third overall. I'm pumped. Swanee's pumped. Bobby's like, that that wasn't it. I told you you had to do good again in the second moto, like, you know, and how could you do that? But that just shows like how driven he is and how competitive he is. Mm. And that's kind of a trait he's got that I think is beneficial. It's rough on people at sometimes, but like, he's not worried about what you think of him, you know, he's worried about like, or people's feelings, you know, it may be hard on people at times, but what he said was true, you know, yeah. like you needed to go do that again. And he doesn't, and it was just looking back at that now, it's like, man, that's, I don't think I could have done that at the time because it's like, I'm happy we won <laughs> our so first damn, moto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't really care what Swanee gets the second <laughs> moto. That's where I was at in my mentality. Yeah. Now I, I understand some of that stuff. You At the time I thought, man, he's being yeah. pretty hard on these guys. I don't know if it's right, but it's, you, you gotta, gotta be careful. You gotta you know? walk before you yeah. run, Yeah. right? So that was a, that was a great step forward for him, but. Yeah, Bobby had an expectation. Yeah, so yeah, that's yep. interesting. But okay. I think that's what keeps us grounded, or whatever you want to call it, is like that he has that ability to not get. I mean, 
we've had years where we've won two or three championships in a year, and it's it's kind of an interesting trait Bobby's got is like if we do bad in a season, Bobby's probably not that hard on us because he knows we're all bummed out that we're not doing good. If we win a lot, he's probably like way gnarlier on us because he thinks we're gonna like quit or something. Mm-hmm. Not quit, but like ease up a little Soften bit. Soften up. So yeah, like the yeah. better we do, kind of the harder he is on us, like to keep going, you know, which is mm. kind of opposite of what a lot of people would think. But um, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting, but I think it's a lot to do with why we don't really settle and, and go backwards too far, you know, because it's just. I wonder if there's something to the dynamic where he's the team owner, right? But he's he's a little removed. He's not here day yeah. to day. Yeah. But that him coming in and having that um, attitude. Yeah. Sets sets a tone for everybody, right? Yeah. So you can be, you know, you can celebrate with them when they win a moto, yeah. but. They know that the expectation is you better win the second moto or, yeah. you know. No, and I think it's good to have somebody like Bobby that's not around day to day because you can you can kind of be too close to it to see some things. Yeah. So when you come in on the weekends, you're not, you're, he's maybe not expecting so-and-so to do this and I am, and he doesn't know that and he can act a different way it's probably a good viewpoint to have somebody that's a little bit removed at times you yeah. know so yeah i think that's good um so at this time in 2011 we've never really had a good title sponsor we had this dna shred sticks thing that was they also didn't pay us i think in 2011 <laughs> and it's stunning how common that yeah, is right so Bobby's talking to Chad Lanza of Valley. They kind of have a little bit of rock star money, but maybe their team hasn't done as much. Somehow, I'm, Bobby could have probably answered this better, but like somehow we end up merging. And it's all over this rock star title sponsor because there's a pretty good amount of money there. And so in 2012, we're gonna have this big team. Yamaha's gonna, they stopped racing. They're gonna let us use their factory semi. We're gonna have four or five 250 riders, two or three 450 riders. We're gonna merge, we're moving to Corona in this big 8,000 square foot shop. This is gonna be this giant team. And so it's a big change. Were you leery about this after the YOT debacle? I think so. And yeah, it was just a lot to take on, you know? It was kind of like, yeah, just a giant team all of a sudden merging two teams together. Um, I think I'm a little leery of it for sure. I don't remember too clearly. But we also started more of an amateur program. I think maybe the year before we did with Kyle Peters, we kind of brought up, we, 2010, 11, we, actually in 2010, we started helping Malcolm Stewart a little bit as an amateur. 2011, I think we hired Kyle Peters. So we were starting to do like a consistent amateur program where we'd help a guy through the year, okay. go to Loretta's and try to move him onto the team. Which, can, I, can we dive into that for yep. just one quick yep. second? What are your thoughts on that? Because to me, I feel like, man, we're these amateur kids are getting too much too yeah. soon. You've got kids getting paid a lot of money yeah. at an amateur level. And if one team does it, it forces it forces everyone else's hand because yeah. otherwise you're gonna go in and just pull all the good riders. They've yeah. all gotta now go in and fight. Yeah. Is there any way you guys all the teams could just kind of go, hey, let's here's a cap. No works, no race team parts, right? Like yeah. I don't know, something. Yeah. And maybe you help more guys, but but one guy doesn't get this yeah. huge and, effort. And people probably don't believe me when I say this, but we, so the first year, we like go, oh, you know, bring Brock Tickle's race engine to, to for Kyle Peters at Loretta's. And he like smoked Bogle. Mm-hmm. And that was probably not normal for him. And at that time, like we had some pretty good stuff, like I said, and we're, and then we're like, well, gotta sign him now you know he just and he hadn't done like great great but he smoked everybody and then we will go to the first national and bogle is way better than him like he gets like fifth and kyle peters is struggling you know and from that point on i was kind of like man maybe it's not the best idea to bring your best stuff to loretta's because if you possibly bring a better bike than anybody are you really judging this rider right you know maybe his bike's just that much better yeah so i kind of learned from that back then 
And even to this day, we try to hold the amateur bikes down a little bit because there's not the level of competition there is at the pro level. So why go bring this bike in there that's like, they don't even have to try to beat people. Yeah. Because then when they turn pro, they all of a sudden are going to realize, man, everyone's bike's good now. This is hard, yeah. you know? So we actually really try to hold the bikes down and amateurs, hey, we're not doing more than this power level. That should be enough. We're, we started out at a point where different plastic, different graphics, they don't even look the same. They used to have stock wheels and stock clamps and stock suspension coatings. Some of that stuff's had to change because of sponsors, but we try to do that. Like yeah. we, we don't spend like, there's no tie on our amateur bikes. We just, hey, revalve the suspension good. Here's a baseline package motor. That's what you got. But I mean, we get, even though we're star racing and Yamahas are really fast, we'll get dads that if they get beat by the PC ride, they're like, man, we're getting pulled everywhere. You know, and I don't even know, think that's probably true, but we mm. get shit from, from exactly. guys for that. And then maybe we'll have to go, well, maybe we can give you a little bump in power here and that makes them happy for the day. But no, I think that would be good. And we really try to do that. But okay. for sure, we see some bikes, like particularly at these Supercross Futures events where it's like, that's the factory bike. Like you can tell, like the Honda and the PC at the Supercross features. I mean, those are the race bikes, yeah. you know. And we so far have not done that, and I don't really believe in that. And I would like our guys to go beat those guys on those bikes with a lesser bike because it'll make later in their career harder. I'm sure, yeah. you know, Brian Deegan wouldn't like hearing that or something, but that's the truth, you know. Like you it know? is the truth. Yeah, yeah, you're you're almost doing them a disservice. Yeah, because that advantage that is making it easy to win yeah. goes away you know, significantly when everybody's on a race bike. Yep, for sure. So 2013, 2012, 2013, um, how about those years? So 2012, we got more into the amateur program. That's when we signed Cooper Webb and Jeremy Martin to do amateurs. Mm. Bobby had been talking to Cooper Webb, just admired him as a really good amateur rider. And he was kind of overshadowed by Censorillo a little bit. But Bobby just always, there was just always a lot of grit in Cooper as even a kid. And I think Bobby would even like got him a van like way before we signed him, you know. And we really wanted to sign Cooper. KTM in 11 at Monster Cup, they got him from us, you know. Like we tried to get him, they got him. But they really fumbled it like badly. Like they had Cooper mm. go pick up uh, some kid's Loretta's race bike. They went and picked the bike up, went to their local track, and the clutch was fried, and like it blew up, and then it blew up again, and then uh, they went to World Earth, and they just signed like a letter of intent or something at this point, and they're racing Censorillo, which they like to beat Censorillo, and Censorillo like to beat them. Well, Censorillo is on this Trek PC Super Mini, and he's beating up on Cooper, and from what I remember, they blew up every Super Mini they had, and Cooper's not really hard on bikes, and they had to race at 85 against Cincerell that night at the, mm -hmm. at the Monster Cup. Well, Bobby Webb's like, this is not what you guys told us you're going to do, you know? And he told Bobby, I screwed up. Like, I haven't signed the contract yet. Like, can I still get that contract? And Bobby's like, certainly, you know? But we're not going to ride super minis in the 80s. Like, we're going to ride 250Fs, you know? And he still kind of feels like that today. Like, when they're big enough, there's no point in jumping on this 125 that's continuing to learn two stroke habits when you can get on 250F. So, and Cooper had actually raced at Loretta's, the stock B class that year on a Honda 250F. Okay. And so he rode the Yamaha, said he was faster right away. And we went to Minio's with like almost no prep with Jeremy Martin and Cooper Webb. And that was kind of the, probably a significant, and the reason I'm talking about it is because it was a significant, that was at the end of 11 at Minio's and 14's when we really started doing it but this is like where it started, you know? So we had riders that were good. I think we got really lucky getting them, you know, like obviously Cooper almost Cooper went deal, to KTM. Yeah. And Jeremy was a Suzuki, like kind of factory amateur team guy. And I think he'd kind of rubbed them the wrong way and they let him go. Cause the riders they kept were, didn't turn out to be as good as him. Like, and they let him go. And I still can't quite figure out, they let Jeremy Martin go and they kept, Jace Owen and Daniel Baker, which 
That hmm. seemed weird to me at the time, and it still seems weird to me, but I think all I could figure is he maybe rubbed him the wrong way a little bit, and, yeah. and we took advantage of that. He he came out of nowhere for me. Yeah. Jeremy did. Yeah. I, 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 I didn't see much out of him until he won that title for you guys, and I was like, yeah. at Glen Hill on that day, when he just left everybody, Yeah. I'm like, who is this guy? Yeah, he's one of them guys that... Yeah, I, Kind of a lot of things got to be right for him to go fast, but when everything's right, he's just blazing fast. And I think at the time, any of the amateur nationals I didn't go to, I'd follow him. And I remember seeing some Texas results where he just like cleaned up at like Oak Hill or something on a 125. So when his name got brought up, like, hey, I think we could get Jeremy Martin. Like, this is Donnie Luce at Yamaha telling me this. I was like, he didn't do that good at Loretta's, but I've seen him clean house at Texas and the results and stuff. Like, That'd be good for us, you know. So he was our A rider, and Cooper was our B rider. And, uh, yeah, we started doing more of the amateur nationals, like, going there with support. And Chad Lanza Valley had, like, a concept hauler, and that was, like, our amateur rig that year. Mm -hmm. So we got, like, two full-time amateur guys. So that, got, that merger did work out okay then? Oh, there's parts of it that were good. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of chaotic because we had – this is just a list. i probably missing one, but we had – Cooper Webb, Jeremy Martin, Ryan Sipes, Nico Izzy, Austin Stroop, Weston Pike, Garrett Swanepoel, Kyle Peters, Bob Canary. And there, there's probably some of them I missed. Yeah. And some of those guys were 450 guys um, and 250 guys. We still won a race. Sipes won Seattle again. Uh, he continued to do good. Maybe not quite as good as the year before. But, I mean, it, it was kind of a crazy year with that many riders and 450s and, and all this stuff. Yeah. and. I don't know. I think the two owners couldn't really get along too good. Um, Doug Shapinsky was the team manager of Bridgestone. Doug. Oh, I remember. And that. I kind of remember that, like, between he being the go between guy between Bobby and Chad, and he was kind of a little, it was just not a good mix, and I don't think the owners were getting along yeah. good. I was more like the crew chief, building all the engines still. Uh, but we got a win for the second year in a row. That was still a pretty cool milestone at the yeah. time. And one thing I can remember about that, and that, that was the next year. So it didn't work out, and we went back to our own team in 2013. And this is still a pretty rough time in the industry. And I remember actually that Sipes winning Seattle. So Suzuki was also like the rock star team. Sipes won Seattle, and we had a blue bike and blue gear. And like the owner or the CEO of Rockstar was at Seattle and he was pissed. We won the race and he was pissed that the bike was blue. And he's like, why are we supporting this Yamaha team? Like we have this Rockstar Suzuki team that's all black and yellow. Like these guys are had blue gear on and a blue bike. Like, what are we doing? Like, yeah, they're and, very big on their black and yellow. Yeah. yeah. So we lost, that was part of the team splitting up too, is they lost the Rockstar deal. Like all of it, like mm. it was just gone. And it was a pretty good deal. And so anyway, Bobby and Chad decided to go separate ways. 2013, we're still scrambling for sponsors. We had uh, MyPlash. It was like a prepaid credit card type of thing. <laughs> and, the, and and actually, Deegan was, Brian was involved, like Metal Militia, MSR kind of gear collab thing. Okay. And that was kind of, that was better than some of the gear deals we'd had. So... We stuck with that, but it was a really small team. I think I have this right. I think we only had J-Mart Pro uh, in Supercross and Cunningham. So I think we only had, and it was because the budget was just not there still. Yeah. The economy hadn't really recovered yet yeah. for us. And then Webb turned, he won all the A-class stuff early that year. And outdoors we had Webb, J-Mart, and Cunningham. And um, right away, I think, second round was denver and webb had already got on the podium i think it was just a moto at denver but he like passed marvin musk went on on ktm and we were like okay you know and, and we're on this five valve thing that's kind of old yeah and that was kind of a struggle throughout these last few years is now we're the only carbureted bike at some point maybe even 11 12 something like that so now the new standard is fuel injection and we have a carburetor and I remember the style started changing. Guys started jumping into the face of the next rhythm to preload it, and like we could not do that, you know. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I would be that's terrifying. In these years, the I would be walking the track, going, "Oh man, they're gonna jump on this face," 
and I would just go in the stands and like go to that area and go like just dump bog, you know. I was just so worried. Where you jump about onto it. a tabletop and land hard and have to come off. Yeah, uh, so that was a rough time in Supercross mostly. Outdoors, I don't think it was yeah. a big deal, but in Supercross, I mean, most of the time the bikes ran good when we worked. We never stopped working on carburation until the very last day. I mean, it was just well, so. The hard part at Supercross too is your daytime temps to your main event temp yep. is a huge swing. Yeah. You're for sure got to, you got to change jetting. So. Yep. So that was, uh, that was a struggle more so in Supercross. Like I said, it, it definitely gave me some heart attacks, just worrying for the riders, you know, mm -hmm. I knew what our bike could and couldn't do. And if I saw it on the track, I was like, this is not good, yeah. you know? So, but a cool thing was we were getting some podiums in 2013 on this five valve, super old engine design. Yep. Um, and so, J Mart got an overall podium, I think, at Millville and Unadilla, if I remember right. So that overall was kind of a maybe only our second time. I think in 2011, Swanee did it, and Jeremy Martin did it a couple times. Cooper got a podium, and uh, I think in the, the last race in two, of the bike was 2013 Lake Elsinore National, and I think we got three moto podiums in our last race on that bike. Mm. So I thought it was cool because. Everybody loved to criticize us about that bike, and we were still able. To, we got three podiums, you know. Yeah, I, I guess there's good. six total podium spots, and we got three of them in that last race. You know, it was just cool that our last race on this bike that everyone criticized for so long, like we got on the podium. I was just proud of that because it wasn't the best platform, but like we definitely worked our ass off on that yeah. thing, and it was probably better than what some people realized it was. Mm. Like I remember Morris was the team manager that year. And I remember he rode it to do like some test riding and he he was last, 250 team was maybe Rockstar Suzuki. And he was like, this thing's a beast. He's like, I didn't expect that. Mm. Like he's like, this thing's like a mini 450. It's got lots of bottom and all stuff. So that bike was, those years, 11, 12, 13, once we started working with Cosworth and learning a lot more about four stroke technology, those were pretty good, pretty good years, you know? and we were probably a little low on riders and, and even some other aspects of training the riders and running the team. But it was a cool way to end that kind of era of the bike, you and know? When did you know the new model was coming? Like at what point in that year? Um, I remember like some Japanese engineers coming to some nationals, maybe even in 2012 and like they would apologize for like, we're so sorry that this is taking so long, like we're behind. And it wasn't that they didn't know how to make it better. It was that the economy was really bad. Yep. And it was just a bad time to be spending millions on development for the bike. So I think we knew something was coming for a few years, but they kept like apologizing, like, sorry, it didn't happen this year, you know, and type of stuff. And what for sure we started riding the 14, like the next day after the Lake Elsinore National, it felt like we took the suspension off our 13, put on the 14. I remember going to Milestone and Cooper and J-Mart riding the thing and going like, this bike is amazing. Like, right it's, away. we had the same suspension settings off a totally different chassis. And they were like, yeah, the engine's good, but keep in mind we're riding modified 13s versus probably the first day we rode it was probably stock. So they're like, this engine's really good, but dude, the chassis's way better. Like, way better. Like, that's the biggest improvement in mm. the bike so far. And it wasn't long after that that we'd been having meetings and me and Bob Oliver and Dino Dan had been working on the engine all summer. So I think we actually had a modified engine right away. But they, I still remember them going, dude, like, everyone's pumped on the engine. And it's really good, but, man, the chassis is insane. And an even crazier part I remember is the next year in 14 outdoor testing, Cooper was like, man, it rained. And I rode Paula on last year's suspension specs. And my bike was dialed. Like, I'm not testing. Like, that's it. Done. And we're like, okay, like you run the 13 settings in a 14 reverse cylinder head bike. Like it's pretty weird. But really? We'll go with it. And he raced that whole series in 14. And I think he was in second the whole time battling with Jeremy. And the last race, he kind of screwed up and bag it past him. for, And he got third in the yeah. series. But that was literally wow, never touched no stuff. testing. And did you know that Jeremy was going to be so fast right away? Like I, like I said, he, he blew me away. Yeah, so... I mean, Supercross that year, Cooper was, like, good. 
But some, it seemed like we get bad starts all the time, and he'd battle his way back to seventh or something, or maybe he had some better results. And I think 14, I want to say at Vegas, Cooper actually got second. He led most of the West main event in Vegas, and Dean passed him, and he got second. And then Jeremy won the East main event. So we had some success in 14 in Supercross, but it wasn't, like, overwhelming. I mean, Jeremy probably had a couple podiums and a win, and Cooper had a, a podium. And uh, let's see. I feel like I'm forgetting someone on my notes here, but I don't think we had many riders in 14. Like, too many riders. I got Webb, A-Rod, J-Mart. That's all I really had as a pro guy. And, <laughs> and A-Rod was also... In 13, we were bringing him up and Plessinger and amateurs. But we didn't, I don't think we had a lot of pro riders. I feel like I'm forgetting somebody in that year. But we did okay. Like it was going pretty good. But in outdoor testing, J Mart was like fast. Like I remember going to Glen Helen and anywhere we went, he would be like, you know, what's so and so's lap time? And we'd be like, uh, he's fast, you know. And I remember at Glen Helen, it was bagging on the Suzuki 450, I think. And he'd be like, what's Baggett's time? Because he's like the guy, you know, at Glen Helen. And we'd be like, oh, it's, he's like three seconds a lap faster. And he's a 2.13. And be like, okay, check this out. And he would go do like a 2.10. And we'd be like, his mechanic would be like, come on, dude. No way. And I'd be like, go do it again. You know, and I get the lap time. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, he's really that fast. And we go to other tracks. And that year, Keith McCarty was kind of like, Yamaha wants this bike to succeed, you know, and we've had some success, but they kind of start a team back up with Valley and they hire Christoph Purcell. And we took that as kind of like, man, like that's not too cool. Like a little slap in the face. Yeah. You're trying to compete yeah. against us with this veteran guy. We got these kids like Cooper Webb, not totally proven at this point. Jeremy Martin's not totally proven. So we took it as like, man, we could have took Christoph Purcell. We would have loved to have him. Like I said, I think we were a little low on riders that year. And we were kind of like, I think we were pretty pissed off about it, to be honest with you. We yeah. just took it as like, hey, you don't trust us to do this. You had a veteran rider that we probably could have helped out even more. Like, you should have just, we were fine taking them, but like, we don't really like you competing against us. And I remember there was some cheesy stuff that like Jim Perry did too, where he'd be like, you know, that one engine we gave you in the beginning, we're taking that back, you know? And like, there wasn't a lot of stuff at this point. So we're like, you're going to take like Cooper Webb's practice motor away from him? Like, like okay like this is kind of wild so we're not happy about this purcell thing and purcell's another super fast lap time guy yeah. so he would go we'd go to tracks and purcell would be like dropping the hammer on the lap times and jeremy would be like what's the lap time I'm like man he's a couple seconds faster you know this is time and he would blow it out of the water by like three or four seconds and we're like dude this is gnarly like and jeremy's not a real confident guy at this point and I remember calling him in the office going, dude, you've, you're not just a little faster. I've seen a lot of stuff. It's not normal to be three or four seconds a lap faster than the fastest guy at the track. You're doing that every day we go riding. Yeah. I go, if you don't think you're a title contender, you should because there's no reason you can't do that. You're faster than these guys all the time. This bike's obviously a pretty good bike. It's our first year. Like, you can win a title. And... He kind of had his own little trainer guy, Dylan um, Turner. And they didn't tell me this at the time, and I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. But later that year, Dylan Turner goes, dude, if you wouldn't have had that conversation with him, he never would have done that. He's like, he didn't even think about that, but what you were saying, I mean, you couldn't really argue with it. And, you know, he went to Glen Helen and won both motos, like, pretty easily, you know? It, it was like, yeah. it was wild. How yep. I, I, It completely blew me away. There was nothing that led to that weekend where I would have guessed that would have happened. Yep. So I'm saying, I was looking around going, what, who is this? Like this Jeremy, Mark, what happened? Who yeah. is this dude? Yeah. He's like latering everybody. He yeah. was gone. Yeah. And that was, like I said, I've never been like super good about motivational speeches or anything, but I just, that was the truth. Like I just, facts. Told, I just told him the truth and wanted mm -hmm. to make sure he recognized that. And I think that had a big effect in like, you know, he won five motos straight would have been six, but he just had a crash, you know, to start that season. And this was kind of a trend that stayed true with Jeremy Martin a lot is he'd done one five out of six motos in California working with the team. And he actually bounced to here to the goat farm. And like things 
kind of started waffling a little bit, like no podiums for a while and all that. And it, I think it was just a product of when you're away from the team, you, they can't improve your bike every day. Maybe you're doing things you shouldn't and you got no one to tell you different. Mm. But we got it back on track at some point. And, uh, you know, I, we wrapped up that title like a, two races or three motos earlier or something like that. And so, yeah, that was a obviously a milestone. Yeah. And it's pretty crazy to win. Oh, did we win the title, but it was pretty uncontested. Like Cooper was in second the whole time, you know. We were more worried about battles within the team. Like Coop, Cooper and Jeremy were really competitive. And, you know, anytime you got two guys, but, you know, there's a little bit of like, man, what's he running, you know? I, yeah. Why don't I have that, you know, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. And there's never really anything that's gone on in a team like that. People might run different stuff because they tested stuff that they liked and it just happened to be different. So there's a little bit of that, but, um, yeah, it was a pretty, definitely a big milestone winning that, that outdoor title. Um, so that was obviously everybody was pumped on that. Yeah. That pretty much brings us to 15. Now, obviously we've won a championship, so we're expecting more of that. We have Webb again. Um, we know he's going to get better. J Mart Plessinger and Anthony Rodriguez. And I remember a time too, kind of a thought process in here was these are all this year, every one of them was an amateur rider that we kind of brought up. And I kind of remember somewhere in here, Keith telling us like, yeah, you should just put your trust in these amateur riders because if you got four of them, like one of them's gonna turn out. And at the time, but this is kind of thinking's previous to 2014, we were th thinking like, man, I hope that's true, you know, like, cause this is, some some of this stuff at a certain point they weren't kicking people out of the class as much and it seemed like like champions were winning these championships all the time not okay. like some amateur kids so but bobby always enjoyed the bringing the amateur kids up kind of thing and uh so it was kind of a cool feeling though that every guy on the team wasn't somebody we stole from our team yeah. or got handed down from our team it was they were all kids that we brought up at some level in pros so that was kind of a cool time, I think. Um, Webb was able to pretty much, he pretty much walked away with the championship from, I remember, I remember we had like kind of a problem that year where he would either, he could either get a start and not do the whoops on a bike setup thing, or you get the start and not be able to do the whoops. So we kind of battled that, but at some point he just, midway through the season, I mean, he could start dead last and he could be in the lead on lap seven. Like yeah. he was fast. I know? remember that season. And he was on it. I've never felt to this day more trust in a rider than that. Like to this day in 15 with Cooper, it was just like, he's going to win, you know, like he that's, and we just knew it. And it wasn't, we didn't feel like it was because of us. Like he was just good, you know? Yeah. And that's a rare thing to have, to be able to say like in a super cross, like, he's going to win like for sure. And that, that's just how I felt all year with Cooper. It was just, what, yeah. what was the mindset change from 14 after you won that first title, which you guys jumped right into one, the outdoor title, which yeah. is typically yeah. harder to win. Yeah. Was there a, was there a mindset change here or not here at this shop, but at, at the team yeah. that you remember? Um, I think probably gear companies and stuff started helping us a little more. Um, this would have been right around the time where Rockstar started pick, kind of picked us back up and started helping us. So we were like seeing the, like a lot of people ask me all the time, like, oh man, you guys won the race this weekend that don't know anything about the sport. You must guys got like a big bonus, huh? And I'm like, uh, no, the rider gets a bonus, the team doesn't get nothing, <laughs> yeah. you know? So even after winning a championship, the team doesn't really get anything. We're just hoping that a sponsor will pick us up for a better sponsorship deal yeah. next year. And it does work like that, but some years it takes a few years to happen. But we're starting to see stuff like that. Our riders like Cooper, he saw Jeremy win the outdoor title and he's thinking like they're gaining confidence because they're like, hey, I know we can do this now. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like, you know, I'm pretty good. So I think it's just things really started going, you know, and, and like I said, Webb, I mean, he won every race that he didn't totally screw up. And he could, back then he could just do stuff that I still haven't seen many people do like on a 250. I remember him in Phoenix Supercross that year, Malcolm was actually riding for Geico and he would like go under Malcolm at the very bottom of the burn and still triple out of the corner. And it looked like he got shot out of a cannon, you know? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't all the bike. Like Cooper was, was like pretty He's amazing special. at cutting yeah. down on a 250. So 
I still haven't felt like that much confidence in knowing your rider's going to get the job done since then. Um, J Mart won the outdoor title again. Uh, Cooper was pretty good, but not quite as good as Jeremy. We had it was close with Musquin that year. Um, I was good. It was actually harder to defend that title than it was to win it the first time. It went down to the wire, you know, in the yeah. 250 class. And Jeremy, uh, but he, he was able to, to win. That year we kind of, I think it was that year in 2015, like I kind of told you earlier, we'd never really like totally fumbled the championship, but we came close that year. And it was just something stupid, but I think it was Glenn Helen. Um, the mechanic goes to fire the bike up for the parade lap and it won't start. And it was at Glen Helen, I think the first round. And I remember I was on the complete opposite side of the track getting ready to like be a spotter or whatnot. And they're like on the radio, like Jeremy's bike won't start. And I'm just like, uh, what? <laughs> like, and I was like, I don't really know what to do. I'm like, and there's a lot of spectators at that race. And I started running through the crowd, like running through people. And I got there and I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, I don't know, we're doing this. And everyone's just panicking and I can see that. And I'm like, hold on, man. Like, uh, what's something we've seen happen? You know, this and that. And we start, plug, you know, replacing electrical components, whatever. We get the thing. And I'm like, okay. Sometimes the bikes were hard to kickstart back then. It was just hard to kickstart. So I'm like, it won't kickstart. You guys probably have it flooded. Like, bump start the thing. And uh, they had already... So let's see here. They, it bump started, it's running. I'm like, put the seat back on. Well, somebody shut it off. Like, and I was like, why? But everyone's kind of panicking, everything like that. And the guys are on their parade lap still. And I'm like, oh man, this is not good. And I'm like, it should start again, you know, bump it. I'm just like, put the seat on it. Like we gotta go. Bump started it and like, we got it bump started and the gate took off and Jeremy took off behind him. I, re I do remember that. Yeah, there's this picture of Jeremy like, you know, 100 yards behind the whole pack type of thing. But that was a moment that I was proud on. Like, I don't even know why I bothered to run through the crowd because like, what am I going to do getting there last minute? But like, that's the kind of like will we have, to, I think, to try to get stuff done. And, and that totally, the championship never would have been won if we were out. We weren't even close. Yeah. You know? What so, did he come back to in that motor? Do you remember? Sixth, I think. Yeah from dead last. So a lot of points. It was fifth or sixth. Yeah. So just, I don't know, just moments like that stick out in my head because it's like, I don't know if the riders even realize that, but like, I don't know. Had they, the mechanics didn't really seem to be figuring it out at that point. And like, yeah. it was just as simple as like, man, maybe it's just flooded and we need to bump start it. And that worked. Was that, that was pretty did much that end up being, was. okay. Yeah. Just, it was flooded maybe from, you know, I don't know what exactly, but they just kind of gave up on kickstarting it. And we just needed to bump start it, you know? Yeah, yeah. That was kind of it. And, but it, man, it really terrified us when someone shut it off. I was like, oh no, like we gotta go through this again because <laughs> I think it, maybe it didn't even bump start the first time. Like it was really, really a panic set in, but it was just a cool moment that I know we wouldn't have won that title if like all those things didn't line yeah. up like that that day. And yeah, we're pretty proud of uh, just not, it's so easy to throw any things away. I mean, one, yeah, if oh. one guy, even one manufacturer screws up a part in the engine, it's not even really your fault, but you're screwed, you know? And it's yeah. just, so there's a lot to like batch testing parts and there's so many little things that go into these titles, especially outdoor titles with the engines being the way high performance engines are, you know? So yeah. um, that was a cool year, obviously won the Supercross title and outdoor title, um, which, yeah, um, this whole time, Lampson's been the team manager for the last few years. He did a really good oh, job right. for us. I but, forgot Lammy was here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At some point, like kind of the travel and and family and everything, he wanted to kind of do that. So I kind of, and this is kind of a theme of like my history here is I would kind of go wherever I needed. There's times I was the engine guy. If it seemed like the most important project we had was like, hey, working with Cosworth and heading up this new engine program, that's what I would do. And if it was like hey, work with Ross and get the suspension development, that's what I would do. And there was different team managers, but never, Bobby's like kind of ways are a little different and sometimes hard. And like, I think a lot of our team managers that we had, like Doug Shapinsky and, and Ryan Morris and everything, it, you, you gotta be like a, probably a tough individual would be the word to, to employ a lot of the t management techniques that 
that Bobby has kind of done. And so in 16 was kind of, okay, I'm going to be the team manager again because that's just what I needed to do, you know, is the best place to be. So I was a team manager that year. And I'd been the team manager before in years. It was just, you know, sometimes I would do this and yeah. sometimes I would do that. And uh, similar team, Webb, Plessinger, J Mart, and we added Alex Martin and Mitchell Harrison was kind of the amateur kid. We didn't bring him up as an amateur, but we feel like we need to hire a new amateur every year to kind of, you know, have that new guy coming. Um, so probably the biggest team we ever had, and I'm guessing it was probably one of the most successful teams we had because we'd won championships, but this particular year, Aaron won his first race, Cooper won, Webb won the West Supercross title and the motocross championship, J-Mart won races, A-Mart won races, we swept podiums. Um, Jeez. I remember one race, it was actually like I think the last race in 16 to sum up like how the series went, is uh, Harrison got like fifth, fifth or sixth at the last moto in Ironman. I was like, that's a good finish and something to be proud of for his season that far. And he goes, man, what the other guys get? And I was like, uh, one, two, three, four. <laughs> and he was like pissed, you know? It was by far his best result. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, he's not gonna like this, you know, when I told him that. But I mean, that season was probably the most, one of the most dominant, dominant seasons yeah. we had. We didn't have like big injury problems. Actually, that was one story kind of about that year is Cooper, we actually had like a, a just a wire break on, a, on an electrical part and on his practice bike and he broke his wrist when the series was on break. So we went, we had to race just Vegas, I think. And Cooper's West wrist is like freshly broken, like maybe two weeks before that. And hadn't rode nothing, just showed up to the mud race with it, splinted up. And it was a gnarly mud race in that year. And Cooper was like going backwards, like in the moto, like he, people were just passing him. And I remember it'd be like Luke Renslin and like Yamaha privateers that I was like, uh, we probably should have talked to these guys. Like they used to talk to us in the older days when Wild T was trying to win championships and be like, hey, don't like do anything crazy, but don't get out of the other guy's way like super easy and get out of our way super easy. And I was like, man, no one had that conversation with any of these other Yamaha teams and they're passing us like very easily. And like, there was a time in that thing where we were gonna lose that title because his wrist, he just couldn't do nothing, yeah. you know? And our own riders as well, Plessinger's like mud guy, we told, we probably told him like, hey, don't like take it easy on Cooper, you know, like we don't see you really getting in his way, but an AP crashed on the first lap and still blew by Cooper and he, <laughs> he passed him. Like he, he was gonna ruin the title for us if he, I mean, he wasn't gonna yeah. hold up, you know? So I remember that being like a pretty stressful situation, but. And what ended up happening in that one? He won by like one point over Savachi. Okay. Yeah, he just kept on plugging away and some people crashed out and stuff. But um, that was probably the most stress I'd seen in a championship. And we obviously felt responsible for it because like a wire broke in practice and mm. that's why he got hurt, you know? And we figured, he figured he, he crashed in that main event as well and figured he rebroke whatever healing was in his wrist. So he figured like, I'm out for the outdoors, you know, and we we're bummed about that. But J Mart was on team and he was good. And Cooper, like the couple days before Hangtown was like, I'm gonna try to ride today and let's uh, see how it goes. And he did like After a, only two weeks again of- Yeah. And he, and this is, so Swanee, this is probably the start of Swanee in 2016. And he's trying to prove himself now Maybe even 15, I might have it wrong, but so we're, that's the kind of start of another little generation of the team where we're really focusing on training and recovery. And Swanee's trying to make a name for himself as a trainer. And I mean, we're probably doing some healing stuff at that point, like really focusing on C back. And that's not my area, but sure. you know, really focusing on that. And Bobby would put a lot of pressure on Swanee to like, you gotta heal these injuries as fast as possible. And we had some pretty good luck in that year frame that I don't know if everybody was doing quite what we were doing to heal injuries. Um, but Cooper somehow, and this is the crazy stuff about Cooper Webb, that I'm telling you he's not a normal person. Like he did one 20 minute moto that Thursday at Paula and it wasn't even a good moto. 
<laughs> and goes and I'm at this point we're seeing what J Mark's done to win all these titles and it's grinding out motos. So like yeah. so I'm always like, dude, like they gotta be doing their motos and like how are we gonna go race with a twenty minute moto? And Cooper Webb at that point he I think he maybe got third or fourth at Hangtown with no preparation, like zero. Zero testing, zero training, nothing. And he was like, Man, if I can get by these first three, four races and just stay somewhat in the picture, I will start winning at the, what was that Tennessee National called? Uh, oh, Muddy Creek. Muddy Creek. And he kind of liked that track. And I remember this year, we, we'd won a lot of our titles, all of them on Air Forks. And people would always, they still criticize us to this day that like, oh, Air Forks are junk. I mean, Carmichael, he loves to tell us how bad Air Forks are and stuff. And we've won every title on Air Forks. Is that right? Actually, Eli won on the Supercross title on like a hybrid fork this year. So it's a little different, but um, including Dylan's 450 outdoor title, every one of them Air Forks. And KYB, we feel like Showa gave the Air Fork kind of a bad name with that single-sided thing. And like to us, the KYB Air Fork's always been really good, you know? And Cooper, but we'd always get pressure from just people going, oh, spring forks are better, whatever. And so Cooper Webb and J Mart that year had run spring forks. Well, J Mart won both his titles on air, but he'd heard all this stuff about spring forks and had to go back. So Cooper Webb at Tennessee goes, give me my Air Fork back. And he won like six or eight motos straight, you know, and, and got thoroughly in the points lead. And I think we wrapped that one up early as well. So, and that was like a big goal for him because he kind of, he'd only felt a little bit short to Jeremy the two years before. Yeah. And since it's within the team, that was like a, probably a Extra big sting. Yeah, for him. So. Well, I think I remember him riding with a wrist brace or something those first few rounds. Yeah. I think I remember that. Yeah, for sure. And like, I don't know, like I speak highly of Cooper Webb because I've just, stuff like that, you just, I haven't seen it since. Like most people that we win championships with, they're prepared. They had a good off season. Things are going well. Yeah. And like that didn't have to be the case with him. And that's the only guy. I've He's seen. a gritty son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. You know, for yeah. sure. And for really sure. mentally strong. Yeah. There's no other explanation for it. Yeah. Um, so that brings us to 2017. That was kind of a little hiccup. And I, I guess you could call it a rebuilding year. We lost a lot of riders. Like, Cooper Webb moved to the 450 class. J Mart and A Mart was kind of like a agent scuffle. Uh, so we lost Webb, A Mart, and J Mart. So like, and kind of unexpectedly with the with some of them, um, Webb had to move up. So we knew that one. But the A Mart J Mart thing, you know, there was like a whole debacle that his agent felt like we sabotaged him at a race because both Martin's bike blew up. But, I mean, it's just, to this day, like, we don't really understand. We got some, like, guesses at what happened, but we really don't know. It just, they lost coolant, and, and yeah, that's it. Hmm. And uh, so that was, like, a, that was kind of the scuffle over that. And, I mean, his agent, he had a 450 deal for sure with Hart and Huntington, and then he didn't. And it was all this, like, weird negotiating stuff, and it just, we wanted to keep Jeremy Martin really bad. We wanted to keep it. Alex Martin really bad. It was just one of these weird kind of agent team mm. scuffles type of thing and didn't work out. So it was kind of a rebuilding year because you don't, those are, those were three race winning guys for us out of, out of four the year before and we lost all of them. So, um, the next year was Plessinger, Harrison again, Colt Nichols and Dylan Fernandez. Um, another kind of significant thing. Halfway through the year, Bobby decided, Brad, like, you could probably focus more on the technical side. We need to bring somebody in to manage the riders more. And he brought Will Hahn in, like, kind of partway through the season in 17. So that was a cool addition that was important to our continued success in the future. We didn't win any championships that year. It's the last year we haven't won a championship to date. And... Um, AP had wins. He was in contention in Supercross, and he had like a huge crash in Salt Lake in the whoops that just like helicoptered him off the bike. And mm -hmm. that we were in it still, like I don't know, thirteen points down or something like that. But we were still in it with a few races to go, and that happened outdoors. I think AP was like 
maybe winning some motos or in the podium in the beginning of that year, but cra he would crash and kind of quit that year. That was like a kind of, we were putting a lot on his shoulders that year, like, hey, you're our guy that we expect to step up now. And he was there, but he would quit when he would have like a big crash, like, and there wouldn't be anything wrong with him, but he thought there was something wrong with him. Mm -hmm. And we kind of had that a little bit with Ferrandis and Supercross. He'd have like, I remember he had a big first turn crash at the first East Coast, and he like thought he broke his femur, you know, but there was nothing wrong. Like, <laughs> you know, it was just bruised feeling. So I remember having big talks with both of those guys in 18. Like, if you want to be a championship contender, like, this is part of it. Like, you got to, if you think your leg's broken, just get back on the bike and it'll tell you if it's broken yeah. or not. Stand up. We You'll fall back down. You can't find that out yeah. in the pits, you know? <laughs> yeah. And and with AP, he would kind of, he wasn't like a for sure title contender, but we knew he had the talent. It was just like getting him to not quit in big crashes. Like, get back on your bike and give it a shot, you know? And it was, he would he was the king that year of, he'd have one good training day on like a Monday in the off season, and Tuesday would be a disaster. And I was like, dude, you can't do that. Like Tuesday can be not as good as Monday, maybe because you put all your effort in on Monday, but it's got to be decent. Like you can't have these like disaster days because he would get smoked by everybody because he was tired from the day before and then have a bad attitude about it. And I'm like, man, I, I don't think we can have these days that are so bad. You got to learn to deal with that stuff a little better. And I think it's an, a lot of these guys like Cooper, he didn't need no talks to make them think he was a title contender. But like in the beginning, I think Jay Mark did. And Aaron Plessinger's one that I think it was a big deal having a couple of these talks where I think that really like convinced him. Cause there was times in 18 where he had to get back on the bike and get going. And he had to suffer through a little, you know, injury or something, or, you know, I don't know, being dehydrated at Southwick, something like that. And it 18 was an awesome year because AP was no guarantee of a title thing, and we won the Supercross Championship and the MX Championship. And obviously, AP's like a fan favorite type of guy, as well as that's probably the most fun I've had to date winning titles. It was just cool to see AP win because mm -hmm. that was his fourth year pro or something. It what didn't come quick, yeah. You know, and he's such a likable guy, such a nice guy. It was really cool to see him win those titles. Um, that's what sticks out in my mind about 18. Um, and we had Justin Cooper and Oldenburg and Francis again. Francis was kind of building some steam, but he took a few years to get used to the U.S. outdoor yep. tracks, I think. Yep. And he had some injuries in there, which leads us to 19. Um, we had Francis, Justin Cooper, Colt Nichols, Oldenburg, and Ty Masterpool came, became pro and outdoors. He was an amateur rider the year before. Um, that was the year for Andis. Like we made a pretty good push for the championship. Um, we had a DNF, which he still got eight because he lapped so many people in the mud race at San Diego, but he's Dylan's pretty gnarly on his clutch at mud races, only mud races. Like normally mm. he's fine, but his, I think he's explained to me his technique is like, he never lets off the throttle in corners. Like it's quarter, no matter what in the corner. And he's going to burn the clutch to, Dude, that's just how he was taught, and he can't really change mm. it at this point. But it's really hard on clutches. And, <laughs> yeah, that. Um, so we thought that kept us from winning that title. We went into the last race with, I don't know, 8, 9, 15 points, something like that. Who was down leading on that championship? Cincerillo. And we were going into a thing, and, like, we don't really have a shot at this. You know, like, we're pretty evenly matched with AC. It's going to be hard to put that many points on them. But... I remember going to the manager's tower at the last race and I saw where AC lined up and I was like, I remember telling the guys on the radio, I'm like, I don't know what they're doing. Like we have a shot at this thing. Like where he lined up, it was a, he lined up really far inside. Like some guys think that's safe and at some tracks it's safe, but this was like a left chicane full right 180, which would put you like on the outside of the second turn, which isn't good. And then, like, sometimes that inside guy, if he's up front, he's going to get pinched really hard. And it's, a lot of that happened. And he was way back. And now he's probably frantic and all this stuff. And, and Dylan is still not good to this day. It starts in Supercross, and he whole-shotted it. Mm -hmm. And that was not normal for him. So we're in the beginning of the race, I'm like, 
I told you guys like this is this is going pretty good, but I'm still like he's probably gonna come through the pack and we're screwed still, but we're in it. And you know he was battling with everybody, probably pretty frantic from his start, and it may have crashed and and Dylan rode away to the win. And I always thought that a victory like that would not feel deserved. Like that's what I always thought. Like I would think at some of those races, like I don't even care if we win this championship because we really don't deserve it. But like the actual feeling was <laughs> actually cooler than any championship because you didn't expect it, yeah. and then you won it all the time. So it's almost yeah. like if you know a gift is coming, it's not that cool, but right. like if, if you're unexpected, someone brings you this gift that, yeah. or something that's like It was a really Christmas cool. surprise, yeah. And it was honestly yeah. one of the coolest moments because like, man, it just felt so lucky that that happened, but it's, but we you still had to put the work in and we knew that, hey, we had a kind of a DNF on our books and so we had our hard times too and we were still able to come through with that. And that was a pretty, that was a, just a cool one that I remember. Uh, just because, yeah, it was just cool to not expect to win it yeah. and still win it. And then outdoors that year, um, France made a heck of a run out of the championship. Him and, him and AC battled our year, and we were pretty good. AC was just a little bit better than us and, mm. and probably started a little bit better than us, and we lost that one, but we made a good run at it. Um, so that was good um this whole time these last couple of years justin cooper's kind of was a guy we picked up late in amateurs and he's kind of building steam and that leads us into 2020 um we hired shane mcelrath uh we were pretty pumped on that uh, i remember him being like really good super cross rider right off the bat and to the point where we were like man I don't, this is the most talented super cross rider we've had in a while and uh we were pretty pumped on that. And Ferrandis pretty much controlled the Supercross Championship more that year. He had to take on Forkner, which Forkner was still pretty pretty good at that time. And and he had to beat him from behind him most of the time. So he he was pretty dominant in that thing. We did go to the LCQ, I remember, in the last final round, which was, that was pretty nerve wracking. Cause yeah. we had a pretty good lead, but it was only like 13 or 14 Yeah, points. you guys still gotta make the main. And when we went to the LCQ, we were like, I, it was, yeah, definitely one of the more stressful units or races that I've been to because of that. And we, he pulled through, got the job done in in the final round and, and secured his second title. And uh, let's see, Shane, we almost got it done. You know, he won a lot of races, had his best year. That was a little bit heartbreaking. We, the team didn't really do anything wrong. Just we just chase was just a little better yeah. when it counted, you know. And but we were, I think that championship was real tight in the points, and it was. I was a big disappointment for Shane because he's one of the nicest guys. Probably is the nicest guy we've ever worked with. He's one of the most talented riders we've ever worked with. Just sometimes, you know, the I think. He had a little problem bringing his best game to race day, maybe, kind of thing, but he was really close. Still a good season. He would always start, his starts were great, but he was a little bit like Kenny, where yep. he would start the season really hot, and mm -hmm. then it was like this slow taper, you know? Yeah. And as the season would go on, it was yeah. whatever the magic was at the beginning of the season would kind yep. of fizzle. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess that, and then Dylan was able to win the outdoor title in 2020 uh pretty pretty good he, we had to brace jeremy martin and he was healthy that year and that was it was a good battle the whole year went down the last moto um but dylan I and mean, we had some he crashed out of a moto and stuff and put us back and he was still able to recover and be but he was a pretty dominant rider that year and yeah in 2020 and that just kind of kind of was a you know, anytime you can win the Supercross and the outdoor title in one year is pretty good yes. year for a rider. So that's a hard thing to do. I remember in 19, Ferrandis going, and he kind of said it to the press, he won the Supercross championship and he was on such a high that he couldn't find motive. That's probably the only reason we lost the championship to Cincerillo in 2020 motocross, or 19 motocross, because the first three rounds, Dylan was like, I just... I want to be motivated, but I'm not. Like, <laughs> yeah. I achieved this goal that yeah. I didn't think I could achieve my whole career. And I'm like, I'm just 
too yeah. happy with it, you know? Yeah. And I remember that being a big problem. And he got over it after like three rounds, but we were kind of too deep at that point to come mm -hmm. back. So he was able to conquer that. And the reason I bring it up is because I think this whole time, maybe we've only had Cooper do that to win Supercross and Outdoors. And then Dylan, I think that's probably right. And uh, in this time, I'm going to have a little bit of a hard time remembering this timeline, but we had been to, this is when the 450 team stuff started being brought up. And some of the Japanese bosses and monster bosses were kind of like, you guys, why is the Yamaha 4, is there something wrong with this Yamaha 450? They would ask us and we're like, I don't think so. It's the same chassis we run, gets good magazine bike reviews. And they're like, do you think you guys could win on this thing? And at first we were like, I mean, that's a big question. Like who's the rider gonna be? Maybe. And this is kind of early in 2020 before COVID. And it kind of got brought up in 19 at Assen. There was some Yamaha kind of big wigs there, monster big wigs there. And they started asking us that. And Bobby was like, I mean, I don't see why we couldn't. Yeah, I think we could, you know? And okay. we started like, obviously this is a lot of, to something like this. Like they're, Yamaha is basically gonna shut their own team down to give us a shot at it. And yeah. me and Bobby kind of went back and forth. Like we'd start working on budgets and riders and we were kind of like, man, it's kind of cool being dominant in the 250 class. What happens if we fail at this? Like that's not gonna feel good and we're kind of comfortable with what we're doing. And then we think about, and we kind of decide like, I don't think we want to do that. Like might tarnish what we're doing, might take our focus out of that. And then it would get more serious again. We go, maybe we should do it, you know, when we would start thinking about it. And we kind of got in negotiations with a pretty top rider that was capable of winning the championship. And this is in, I can't remember if it's 19 or 20, it's in 20, early 20, so, and, then COVID hits and like, we got budgets established. Like we got a plan, everything's good. And then we're like COVID hits and the kind of big wigs that were involved with us are like, uh, I think we're gonna have to not do that because we didn't want to do it unless we could get a top rider. The top rider was gonna cost a little bit more than what maybe they were spending at the time, but they agreed to do it. But then COVID hit and everyone was at first was on, that's when like Indy happened, the race got canceled. Right. Nothing bad was happening in the industry yet, but everyone was like, what's going to happen? Yeah. So like, okay, pump the brakes on that. Like, we'll just call that off. That's basically how it went. And now we're worried about like sponsors are pulling out, kind of like stop paying bills. That thing got really scary really quick and then eased off a little bit when people realized it wasn't the end of the world. But like we had a lot of small sponsors that are like, we can't pay you if there's no races going on. We know we're contracted, but there's no races going on. And then we were like, well, at least the big sponsors aren't doing that. And then we started getting phone calls from the big sponsors going, dude, if you guys don't go back to racing, like the check's not coming. And in a race team like this, it's, it's ran off sponsor money. It's yeah. not like there's some, yeah, Bobby Ring probably could fund some of it, but for how long, I mean, at the level these teams are these days, I mean, you saw with Geico, as soon as someone pulls out, could the owners ran it on their own money? Yeah, but are they gonna just, burn through every bit of money they got in five years. No, like it's not gonna happen. So yeah. um, we, it was looking really scary for a minute, but luckily I would give a lot of credit for Feld for running that Salt Lake kind of series thing they did. Cause if they had done that a month later, like it would have been bad, you know? Cause mm -hmm. like there's big rider salaries to pay and stuff. And like you can't- Every team's in the same boat yeah. too. Cause sponsors like, well, yeah. if you don't do what your agreement part of the agreement was we're not going to do ours. That only yep. makes sense. Yeah. You can't really blame them, but man, it puts the teams in a tough spot. Yeah. So puts the riders in a tough spot. You know? At this point, we're convinced like 450 teams not happen. We're happy to finish up the series in Salt Lake. And we did that abbreviated thing. Well, somewhere in there they go, you know what? We're not going to have this top, top rider maybe that you wanted, but we need to just go ahead and do this. And this is like is this Yamaha outdoors. or who is this? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Like, like kind of upper management, even from Japan and monster and everybody agreed, like 
we got to make a change here. You guys obviously seem to know what you're doing. Do you think you could do this? And I was like, you know, obviously it's a big task, but I, I think we can. I don't see there because even top monster guys and everyone called me and be like, do you think the 450 is good? And I'm like, man, our guys practice on it sometimes. And we've, we helped Cooper get ready in 2015 for Erne. He was a four, he was a 250 guy, but we raced 450 in donations. And we were part of getting ready for that. And it wasn't easy, but we got Cooper to where he, Roman Febra was the GP title winner that year. And we were battling him in races. So like, he was competitive on the Omaha yeah. 450 and we knew that we were involved with that and it wasn't going so smooth when Omaha um, just, they weren't racing at the time, but they gave him like a factory bike and it wasn't going so smooth and we just did our thing that we always do, just keep grinding until we find something that worked. And we were able to, I think we got either a podium in a moto or overall at the Glen Helen GP, GP against Caroli and Febra and all these guys. And then we went and we were really competitive at, the nation so we had some confidence that we could do it from that and um and what was it because you know that bike did do well in shootouts it, yeah. it, people that rode it loved it but you'd see it in the pro level and yeah. for whatever whatever the yamaha factory team was doing was not working yeah cooper barsha plessinger those, it didn't look good on any of them yeah and i thought i remember watching plessinger maybe it was 19 go through the whoops at anaheim and he looked terrible. And mm -hmm. I'm like, if Aaron can't go through the whoops, yeah. it's, it's the bike. Yep. Like they're, they're doing something wrong. I don't know what it is. Yeah. What did you guys do? What, what? Um, I think I, when we thought we were going to start doing this 450 thing, I started talking to anybody who would talk to me about like the 450 class. Because I, I, my biggest fear was we've only been successful because our engine's awesome. Like everyone's always told us our engine's great. Everyone thinks that's why we won. So I buy into that a little bit mentally and it's like, man, what happens? Engines don't matter in the 450 class. <laughs> yeah, Not right. Every, every engine is awesome. Yes. Yeah, so I was like, it's handling we, and power delivery. I'm like, I got to figure out what is, could be wrong. We know handling has got to be good, but also power delivery. I'm like, man, we got to hit that one. Right. And I don't want to build the wrong type of power. And I kind of talked, like said, some other team riders that maybe were our old guys that would talk to us a little bit maybe they were on a team that was pretty good and be like so and maybe they rode a yamaha 450 and i would say man what's the difference in power like what how could you know what's this one do and what did that one do and kind of learning and i'd call i remember calling dean baker and grilling him because he did jgr's engines they used to get tons of hole shots i knew that much but i don't know if i don't know much past that but i would just talk to any old 450 engine guy any riders remember hearing stories from FMF guys about Ryanville Post, Kawasaki, and I just had all these things and I was like, had a plan on engine development to, te to get an engine that's like fast enough to get a start, but still rideable. And I don't want to say exactly what that is because we're still racing the class yeah, and yeah. I think it's still good information to hold close, but I just did a bunch of research on them. Kind of the first kind of hit on like, hey, I think from all my talking to people and my own thoughts, I think this is what we need to do. And I knew what Yamaha was doing. And I, I mean, I don't want to say this in a bad way, but I kind of was like, well, that's what they were doing. I, we probably shouldn't do that, you know, because that didn't have a good result. Yeah. So I tried to almost steer away from the direction they were in a little bit. And um, on suspension side, I was real nervous about what to do on that side as well. And I was like, man, we only know kit stuff on a 250 side, but we know what to do with it. But I'm kind of nervous to take on this factory suspension that I've, I'd seen like the first day Chad got this awesome billet, new kit shock. All these Japanese engineers came. This shock was supposedly 20 or 30 grand. Uh, KYB engineers were there. Yamaha engineers from Japan were there. Chad did like two passes through the whoops and came and goes, this thing sucks. Get it off my bike. And all the Japanese engineers were like, uh, uh, okay, like, you know what? Yeah. So I was like, man, it's not for sure better. Like, we got to be careful with this. Maybe we should run kit stuff. And then our settings matter. Because once you go to this totally different stuff, and Yamaha thought they were struggling with maybe, like, they tried to have KYB come up with, like, a totally different shock than anybody's ever had. And they kind of thought that might have been a big problem. So I was like, 
man, it makes this decision even harder. They think this is like what's wrong. So a lot of meetings took place. Um, Japan really pushed KYB Japan to come up with new technology and which was also unproven. And I'm like, okay, we got to at least give KYB a shot to come out and show us what they got, you know? And at this point, we don't have any 450 riders. We're still a 250 team. Who was doing the test riding for you? Will was doing it at the time. Oh, okay. And so Will, I'm like, Will, we're gonna like just put our 250F stuff on a 450, maybe resprung or something. That'd be like a baseline. Like it better be better than that if we're gonna switch to 450 stuff. And so KYB came out with Ricky Gilmore and Bill Orr, and they had this new technology suspension that that Yamaha was pushing them to use, stuff like that. And they put it on right away. It wasn't very good, but Ricky Gilmore, like within an hour, had Will dialed in. Where he's like, "Yeah, this stuff's pretty good." And I was like, "Okay, work with them another day," you know. And he's like, "Yep, yeah, stuff's pretty good." So then I was like, "Man, we need another opinion because sometimes Will." He doesn't ride all the time. So I'm like, man, we better make sure, like a real guy. So I think we were getting maybe towards the end of the season, maybe after the season, and I had Colt Nichols do the same thing. And I was like, go out with these guys with KYB, see if his stuff's legit, you know, see where we're at. And he rode Will's settings, and he's like, mm, it's not very good. And I was like, oh, man, this is, this is not good. Same thing, though. Gilmore, within an hour, had him tuned up, dialed in, loved it. Okay. So I was like, clearly... And then I remember the KYB guys were like, uh, well, Ricky's not your guy. He's just the development guy. I was like, no, that's not how this works. Like you like sold us on this. All I've seen, I don't know if it's your components. All I know is that suspension guy took this thing from not working for him to work with two guys. That's all I know is he can do it. Yeah. So I'm like, I want him to do the job. Like, and we had to commit a lot of money to the pro to get this development suspension. And then it's like a lease program and trust them a hundred percent. So I was like, he's a bigger part of it than the components yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. You know? So that's where we started working with Ricky Gilmore. So you and, guys went away from the kit stuff and went yep. to this new technology. Okay. Yep. Which was at the time we thought that was like a big deal. Cause we have all these notes and stuff on that suspension. And we felt kind of like naked without it a little bit, you know, cause it's, totally different mm -hmm. mostly the shock and some of the forks um are totally different like where our notes would be pretty much worthless yeah. you know so it was a big and i'm not used to trusting like an outside source like that so it's actually been tricky for the next couple of years because kind of a lease program they do it and that's just not we're used to like in-house yeah. like we have Control. suspension guys yeah. downstairs on the 250 team and i know what's going on all the time and that was a little tricky but um yeah 21 i mean for the 250, that brings us into 21. I was just kind of showing you how the yeah. 450 thing, it wasn't like some smooth transmission into taking the 450 team over, but it did end up happening. And um, so, yeah, Justin Cooper, we had a really good year in the 250 class. Justin Cooper won the Supercross Championship. Colt Nichols won the Supercross Championship. That's the first time we won both coasts. So that was like pretty awesome uh, time there. But J Mart was back on the team. He got hurt, pretty much stayed hurt this whole two years, which is just really unfortunate for him and his career. And I mean, we felt like we could have won lots of championships with him as well, but just we really haven't raced a single healthy race in two years with yeah. him. And uh, that was it was a cool year that year too, because not only did Cooper and Nichols win the championship, Craig was in the title hunt with Nichols. He won more races than he's ever won in his career. Thrasher won two as a rookie. That's something that doesn't actually get done. Even by Cooper Webb didn't happen. So that was like a cool Yeah, that's pretty thing. big. I think that does get overlooked. Yeah. Fry was on the team that year. Um, we had a, That was kind of the start of our giant team in 21. Like, um, I don't know how exactly we got there. And that's another thing where I think Bobby Reagan having some management in the team and being a little removed it allows us to do stuff like that because if you were here every day and saw what it takes to run a six man team with three amateurs, so like nine two fifties, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. You know, so like that's one benefit of like Bobby being a little removed is that doesn't go through his head. He just goes, We need we want to keep winning titles and if we get a guy hurt, we still want to win the title. And this was a perfect example of that is we had and this year was an example of it as as well, like 
our guys get hurt, our best guys get hurt sometimes, and we still win titles. Yeah. And you can't do that without a team like that. So yeah, it sucks. Like from a man, a direct management standpoint, and an engine guy standpoint, and a suspension guy, and, can't, and all that. It sucks. But twenty two is another example. Like we both are Supercross champions from twenty one, got hurt, and we're still able to win in our title, which is probably unheard of, you know. But uh, yeah, so twenty one in the four fifty class, we're going. Dylan gets a podium right off the bat. Pretty quick, so and did and he started in Supercross, right? But Supercross yep. was, yeah, so so. He um, broke his hand in a pretty violent crash at Elsinore in like November ish. Mm. So I didn't even want him to race the first round. Like he barely started riding, and I felt like there was a lot of pressure on the team to. Now it's like, hey. Yamaha put you in the driver's seat over their own team, like a lot of pressure on me anyway, like you better get it done, you know? So I was, I remember talking to DV and Volman going like, dude, he's only got a week or two on the bike. He looks not good for what we're trying to do. Like, and he was like, oh, he'll be all right. He'll be better at the race. And I'm like, man. So the entry to the season, Malcolm was fighting a knee injury the whole time. He'd like have days where he just couldn't ride and have to take a week or, or a day or two off and re-ride and, it, so it wasn't like crazy good on off season. Like it, riders were pretty happy with their bikes, but it just wasn't smooth. We had little injuries, yeah. and but Dylan got a podium in his second race. Um, I remember at Daytona, before Daytona, we actually we didn't have a shop here yet, but we decided we'd train back here before Daytona for a few races. So we're back here in Daytona, and I get a call from like some big wigs at at the important companies like Monster and Yamaha. And they're, they were like, hey, uh, you just got one podium. Like, that's that's not where we're supposed to be, you know? And I'm like, yeah, but I mean, you guys told us like, kind of like maybe three months before Anaheim that we were gonna go ahead and do this. And like, it, you know, wasn't really meant to be a championship winning team the first year, you know, Dylan's a rookie. Um, so I was like, but, and so this is the season that's these, what do they call those, uh, the three races in a row thing? All the, yeah, so, um, residencies. Residencies. So for a first year 450 team, that is not good because you now you got, to, no, you got yeah. three races with zero ability to test yeah. between them. So we're doing like weird stuff where we're just like, we might as well swing for the fences with no testing and try something new at the next race. So we're doing a lot of that. And... I think there was a few that weren't residencies like Daytona and, and maybe Orlando or something. And we were able to test here for like the first time all season. And uh, we tested here, the suspension guys hit some stuff with linkages and, and everything like that. And when that monster guy, well, I just told you kind of who it was, but a monster guy called me and was like, man, we expect you to be doing more than you're doing. I go, this is the first time we've been able to test the whole season. We're like halfway through the season, but it's the first time we don't have a residency. We came in hurt, but I think we hit something like we're going to be all right. Like what well, we should do good. And uh, Plessinger kept Tomac honest at Daytona most of the moto. And he let Cooper buy the last freaking corner for, and he got third, but that's still first podium of his yeah. career in the 450 class. He wasn't able to do that in the previous two seasons. So it was like something to hang our hat on. And then Malcolm, same thing. Salt, one of the last Salt Lake rounds, he got a podium, first career podium. So we didn't win. We didn't set the world on fire. We maybe didn't even improve. Like, Barsha won a race the year before. So, right. But to get uh, first career podiums for all three riders, I thought yeah. that was pretty cool. So Yeah, I mean, and he came in injured. Malcolm had any injury. I mean, there was yep. a lot of factors. Yep. That surprises me that they call you and put that much pressure on that early. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I kind of expected it. I had kind of had the pressure on myself anyway, but at this time, we're still like, man, they're going to expect a lot. Like, they, they took a big leap of faith with us, and we knew that the expectation was not to, like, be decent. It was right. to win. You know, the goal, the goal was pretty clear from Yamaha Japan. Like, number one priority was MotoGP, which is pretty awesome. I think they won that 
title two. And then goal two was to win a Supercross championship, and we were able to provide that this year. So we are achieving the top level Yamaha Japan people's goals. So yeah. it's not us and the GP thing, but the MotoGP thing was a big deal. And so I'm just happy for Yamaha that they we were able to accomplish that stuff. But the 450 season in 21. Um, did that surprise you? Or did you kind of know going in, was he that fast that you were like, hey. I think we kind of knew like Jeremy Martin's story in the previous that Dylan was, he wasn't like three or four seconds faster, but he was usually the fastest guy in California, but like by a second maybe. Okay. But it was kind of crazy because, and Roxon could hear this and he could not deny it, but like we didn't know what to think. We thought Roxon was going to quit racing because we're riding with him and Dylan would lap him at Elsinore. He'd be like seven seconds a lap faster. And clearly he was screwing around because he showed up at Paul and he like won a moto where it was really fast or something. So we thought, yeah, we thought we might be even better than we were at Paul, but we don't won the overall. I think something kind of went our way a little bit on that one, but we won one moto like fair and square earned it. And I knew that that Dylan was the previous 250 champion in 2020. And I'm like, after the first race went that good, I'm like, he didn't lose any of that. He got to keep all that confidence because he won the first race where had that first race been at eighth, I don't think we would have won that title. I also not sure we would have won the title unless we came here and trained because there were some things he could do here that you couldn't really do in California. Like Dylan's always been really into like riding a super cross track backwards or creating some crazy track and here he can create wherever he wants. Right. But when you go to Paula, you can't just cut the track. Right. And so I think it allowed Dylan to be creative and go back to some of his roots of training here and really turn into a dominant rider. So I, I feel like we were pretty confident after round one that like, I think he can do this, you know, so that type of thing. And, and it kind of seemed like the snowball just kept building like, and he got better and better through that season. I mean, it seemed pretty unreal though. It was almost like 14. Like not only is this gonna be our first championship, but we're gonna win it by 50 points, you know? And we were like, this is crazy. It know? was crazy. I, yeah. And you know, w to go from watching that bike Looks yeah. so bad. Yeah. To Dylan, uh, uh, Bud's Creek stands out in my head from that season. Yeah. Where he got second the first moto. I can't remember who won. He caught him though. Was it Kenny? Yeah. Probably. And he was pissed that he got second. Dylan yeah. was. And I yeah. thought, dude, you have a points lead. Like, what yeah. are you so mad about? And yeah. I'm just like, that. He just wants it that bad. Yeah. I, I was like, these guys are done. Like, yeah. They got nothing for him. Yeah, and Dylan's always been outdoors. He's. I think in suspension in general, he's really picky and probably, so we had Dylan 17, 18, 19, all those years on the tube deep side, we didn't really get him happy on suspension outdoors and 19 we did. And when he thinks like my suspension's good, he'll like brag about it and it's not an issue anymore. Like you won't touch a clicker, but okay. if you don't get there, it's, it's pissed constant. off every weekend, testing every weekend. But if you get him there, like they got him there and, and 21 on a 450 as well he just likes to brag about how good his bike is and you know like you're in a good position if yeah. he's doing that because yeah. he'll just be like oh my bike's so good you know and like that's all he'll talk about yeah. and uh yeah you know you got something if you get him to that level in outdoors hmm. you know so so what was, um, what was the feeling for the team and you when you guys wrapped that up um <laughs> because I, i've said like your supercross yeah. guys when they were on the 250 team guys were all like, when they won their championships, it was just relief. There wasn't even a lot of happiness. It yeah. was more like, oh, thank God that's over. Yeah. I got that behind me. I did it. I mean, I don't like the fact that this is how I feel, but it's just the way I feel. That I have that same kind of issue that like, and I don't like it. I've even thought about it this year. Like you, it's just, I know as soon as that thing's over, we're expected to win another one. <laughs> and so I'm just like, I, like I said, I don't like that that's the way I feel about it, but that is the way I feel about it. I'm just like, I'm glad we got that one done. Now we're, we've done our job. I just feel like at this point, it's kind of our job. And like, it's, I just like to get them done. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean we don't do burnouts and drink some beers yeah. afterwards and we're not having fun, but the feeling is more often than not, like, man, 
glad that's over. Like, cause, it, cause we've been having a heart attack about every little detail for, yeah. for maybe months leading up to this. I mean, we can have our engines like leading up to these mostly 250 championships. We're worried about this. We can have our, an engine that hasn't blown up in a practice bike that forever. And the last few supercrosses, we will build every single part on that bike brand new. I yeah. mean, brand new. And it doesn't need to be like that. Like usually we just inspect them and you put most of the stuff back together in a supercross. But we get so paranoid because maybe we see some random problem happen that, I mean, every part brand new every time. Like we're changing everything. We're just freaking out. That's just probably how most race teams are. Yeah. And it's just you're ready for that to be over. Like, and I'm sure it's the same thing for a rider you're worried about man, do I practice hard anymore or do I stop riding? Like, I mean, we get paranoid. It's easy to, like a lot of riders will be like, well, what's your game plan? You got a points lead coming this last round. Are you practicing this week? And a lot of them are like, yeah, same as normal. But I think that's BS for it's, the most yeah, part. Bullshit. I mean, sometimes we're like, I don't know if we should ride this week. <laughs> like, we don't need to be that good at, at the last round, you know? And it's just, there's so much stress involved with that. And I know, I think Mathis makes fun of me all the time and he's like, you're not carrying cancer, but you know what? There's a million dollars on the line for the rider sometimes. There's half a million dollars on the rider for the sometimes. And that's not even coming to me, but I don't want to be the guy responsible for losing that. Like, yeah. that's a pretty big deal in people's career and their their livelihood. Like, yeah. I don't want to be the guy that always oh, screwed around and jacked that up. And sorry, you're out 500 grand today because we screwed up your bike. Like, Yeah, look, you guys care and you're yeah. competitive. That's, that's the feeling you're going to have. Yeah. I just hope you guys, yeah. once the title's over and yeah. that relief, yeah. whew, then take yeah. a little bit of time, even if it's yeah. eight hours, and just, yeah. man, enjoy it, right? Yeah, and I think this year, my initial feeling was similar even with Tomac you know, winning that 450 title, but at the same time, I, I don't know what it was, but, and Tomac's not your likely guy to like send it in the after party, but yeah. we did it pretty good in the 450 yeah. class. We were melting tires off of trucks and bikes <laughs> and just blowing bikes up and having a good time. And so I think that, uh, but at the same time, that that was a Saturday and it, Sunday, we'd already flown back to California and we're at the race shop in California prepping for the outdoor season. So. I mean, that's just how this race team stuff is. And I think yeah. that's why we can kind of maintain what we do because I mean, and honestly, like a, a lot of what I think me and Bobby have in common is like what we do and the time we put into this, most people's wives would not allow the time mm -hmm. that I put into this. Like we, uh, I mean, people that work for us, I mean, they probably want to be here sometimes, but they can't. And we don't blame them for that. It's just, you know, like I said, or, Bobby's wife is, I mean, he's gone, you know, Bobby's older and like she goes with him all the time because she feels like she needs to watch over him a little bit because he's still pretty wild. And so she's, you know, they work full time at the car dealership five days out of the week. Jeez. And then the other two days they fly to a race and they, I mean, Bobby goes to every race and so does Loretta. And I'm sure she probably has something she would rather be doing and rather be spending Bobby's money on because the, the 250 team, to be at the level we're at, like we bring in sponsors, but he's still spending lots of his own money, especially to have a team the size we have. Mm -hmm. Like we ran a team small and condensed to, to what we're probably supposed to. Maybe it would be almost self-sufficient, but it's not with the, with the amount of riders we have. Yeah, but then so. like you said, someone gets hurt and you're out yep. of that title where you guys now have the yep. depth of field to, yep. to still be competitive. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you ever, I mean, you know, that Supercross title, was that, how did that feel compared to the national outdoor title? It felt better because my, and this is just me a little bit, like, even though the outdoor title was cool, but that wasn't Japan's goal. They didn't say one word about the outdoor title. It was oh, really? we, the second priority in worldwide racing. First is MotoGP title. Second is AMA Supercross title. So I knew like, let's not get too carried away. Like, I don't know how much they really cared about that, you know, and I'm, I knew they took a big leap of faith for us and I just didn't want to, I don't want to let people down, you know? So the Supercross title was a lot cooler because it's what we we're hired to do. Right. And we did it and we did it in our second try, which is, you know, I, I was just hoping that they gave us a shot and we did good enough to get another shot. And by that time we could probably get it done. But I didn't really think it would happen in year two. 
but we made a lot of decisions and who to hire as far as suspension guys, who to get a, on riders. And even that story is pretty wild. I don't know. Jeremy it, talked about the Yeah, the, the Tomac thing. It was up and down to the point where, like, they showed us this Cowie's offer, and we kind of quit talking to him because we are like, we're, we're not, we don't have that, but we're, we're going to offend him with any kind of offer. Like, I think we just stopped talking to him. And then, I, you know, they kind of reached out like, hey, uh, I thought you guys were interested. We were like, yeah, but there's no point of giving you the offer we got. You know, it's not even close. Mm. And he's like, well, you might be surprised, like, if you can do this, this, and this, like, we'll, we'll ride for that, you know? And we're like, what? Like, we almost never even talked to him. Like, and, like, the thing was very close to not happening because we were just like, there's no way they're going to take the offer. And Yamaha wouldn't step up to, I mean, they had a budget already to you, and it was like, this is it. There yeah, wasn't any, or and, Monster and coming like, in and put There's more a few of these 450 deals that are, like, out there in salary. Like, and yeah. this was one of them yeah. <laughs> where it was like, I wouldn't blame them for not wanting to do it because it was, like, pretty crazy, you mm -hmm. know? So, yeah, it was like, there's a, most of these top 450 guys are on something similar, and there's a few deals that are like, okay, you guys did good on that one, you know? And this was one of them where we just didn't think it was in the cards, you know, because it was wow. way outside of the budget. Interesting. And kudos for Tomac to, you know, bully, bully on himself. Pro, and like, we weren't proven, you know, like yeah. we, he, you know, he knew he liked working with Gilmore in the past on the suspension and he had to have seen that they're a capable 250 team, I think. Um, and, but, and I, we must've said the right things at some point, you know, we'd had plenty of meetings with John Tomac and a little bit with Eli and, we must have said the right things at some point, and 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 like I said, he knew he could work with a suspension guy that he liked to work with. He he knew he could have a few more options than he want, and it. Uh, but yeah, there was some twist. I don't know if Jeremy talked about it much in there, but I mean, obviously the title hunt started a little rocky. I mean, not real rocky, but I think Eli got I can't remember sixth or fourth or something at the first race, but we got Dylan and him got a terrible start mm -hmm. and. That's one thing that scares me pretty bad in Supercross because it's not a, it's the hardest thing to fix. Outdoors, power seems to matter in outdoors and like you'll probably get good starts if your bike's fast. But Supercross, it's not the case. And I was like pretty terrified because I know sometimes you just don't get it. Like yeah. you can work on it all you want. You can yeah. stay at the test track, dust till dawn. You might get it, you might not. But kudos to Eli on that. Like we did our best to provide him with like clutch improvements uh start mapping improvements but i know that that won't get the job done in itself like the rider has to believe in it and like believe in himself and to go get it done and he really improved his starts and the suspension guys really improved the bike from round one and he you know i think he went like six four two and then one and then one five in a row or something like that and and yeah at round one i was thinking we're in trouble like all these top guys that believe in us like and we got the guy and they spent all their money and like, man, this ain't good. You know, like I was, I, I couldn't sleep Sunday. I was like worried million things going through my head, all stuff. I, I was like, this is a disaster. Like, well, you know, and you had Colt get hurt. Like you yeah. had a lot of stuff in yeah, that yeah, first yeah. round. You were probably like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't like just easy, especially at the first race. And, but luckily, like I said, we made some good improvements and got Tomac to be, I think the best starter he's been in Supercross in the 450 class, and, and he loved his bike yeah. all year after like they got it dialed in, and yeah, and then the stress started because Tomac was a one-year deal, and we got to kind of start that stressful process because you know in a championship hunt like that you don't really want to bother the rider like negotiating, but we're like, man, like. There was, he, there was no, like, gonna, first right of refusal in, in there or anything? No, and it's not really one of those deals anymore. It's whether Eli's going to retire or not. Oh, right, right. And John, at first it was like, no, nah, he's going to do one year no matter what, especially if he wins a championship, he's probably done. You know, that was – and most of this is through John because we're not trying to mess with Eli. And John's like, I think if he wins, he's probably really out because he'd like to go out on top. He proved that maybe he was a little better than – and he sh the bike let him show the last couple of years, and he's going to ride off in the sunset. And we're like, oh, man, it's kind of bummer, you know? <laughs> Damn it. Because you can't just get a Eli Tomac 
every year. Like, you right. just can't do it. So, right. especially with last minute notice. So we're like a month from the end of Supercross and now I'm like stressed out every day because I'm like, what are we gonna do? Like if we wait until the end of Supercross, like there's no other riders that'll be available. And like, I mean, hopefully don't improve, but you can see from our rosters, like we want more than one chance at a title, not just one, you yeah. know, cause we know injuries can happen and everything. And so that was a stressful time, but it was good that Tomac decided to resign, and so that was pretty cool. And, that's, and, and honestly, that's, at that time, Dylan wasn't signed either. And we were like, uh, we're like starting to do good things, but we got nobody signed for next right. year. This is like in March of this year, we got nobody. And you know, obviously, whenever you do good, people are after your riders. So there's people after Dylan, and I'm sure they're after Tomac as well. And we're it's just a paranoid, yeah, like, crazy time to be. Yeah, but the more you guys win, the more people yeah. want to come here too. Yeah. So it yeah. gives you some horsepower that way. Yeah. Do, do you ever step back from this, if you ever take a break and just go, wow, holy shit. Like, look what we've done. Look what we've built. Look look at the success we've had. I mean, what I, I think I wrote in here uh, somewhere six of the seven last 250 championships. And Supercross, yeah. I think we're at, I think we're at total of like 16 or 17 now total from you're from you're you're two out of three on the 450 championships you've gone after yeah That's yeah pretty i look good. at it but my mindset and i i don't really like this about myself but my mindset is like you're this close from that going away like yeah you know like yeah and that's you, that's good to have but yeah. i hope when you go home at night <laughs> and you have a beer you at least sit on your couch and go all right like we We've done some pretty good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think about this it a is little bit. really impressive where yeah. you guys have come from. Because, you know, yeah. look at JGR. They had all the resources, all of the, everything you could possibly yeah. want to be successful. Yeah. And they're gone. Yeah. Right? I think what stresses me out a little bit and, like, puts pressure on me to do better is just, I don't know, I don't come from, like, big money or anything, and I see, like, what... Yamaha and Monster investing in some of these top riders. I'm just like, dude, we, that, to me, to some people in the industry that are like been around big business and stuff, it's probably like, ah, oh, they're like, that ain't nothing. Like these guys make more money that, but I don't really pay attention to what Monster makes and what Yamaha makes. And I see that they're spending millions of dollars on rider salaries and teams and stuff. And I'm like, man, we, we better keep doing this. You know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. these people are going to be pissed. And that's probably not even true, but I mean, maybe it's partially true. I mean, but, uh, yeah, I'd like to, I know I probably should appreciate them a little. And I appreciate them. It's just, I'm urged. It's, you have to be on to the next one. Like, you know, I get like. It. No, I get it. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's, that's what keeps you continuing to be successful. Yeah. But I just look at these, these juggernaut teams, you know, like Honda in the, in the 80s. Uh, yeah. Pro Circuit, you know, in his run, right? In Pro Circuit's run in the 125 class. But there's these, these times, KTM for a while, you know, but. I don't think anyone's ever done this where you're winning every class yeah. at the same time. Yeah. I don't think anyone's ever done that. Yeah. And out of one team that's especially that's a, you know, privately owned and run team supported yeah. by a manufacturer. It's yeah. it's crazy impressive. So, yeah, and it's it's you know, we didn't touch on it much, but like we've always really believed in and like I should have touched on this in 14, but the reverse cylinder head thing in a 250 class, no doubt, is like an advantage. And it's it's an advantage that there's a patent on, and they can't get, the other manufacturers can't get there right oh, now. Oh, is that right? Yeah, so. I was wondering why, if it's so good that way, if that's the reason, why don't yeah. other ones do it? And like, well, I don't know, a lot of people I don't, that aren't engine guys or something probably don't realize it, but there's a multiple reasons why there's no catching us until that patent runs out, I don't think. It doesn't matter what how good a job Mitch does. Short of us like not doing our job at all, we're gonna be better because How long does the patent go? I don't know. Okay. I don't know that. But until it runs out, like they got a problem and the and the <laughs> reason why is partially the shock. The other manufacturers they have to go they around, to go around the shock. Yeah. And then partially the angle. Like the other way, everyone's trying to get there by raising the airbox up a little bit, but you they can only go until they hit the seat, you know, where yeah. we can go way above the seat with the intake. So, like, when you look in our intake port without valves, you're staring at the piston, like, just giant holes, and you're staring at the top of your piston, you know, where everything else, it, 
curves down in there. I'd like to offer a solution to these other manufacturers. If you just go to a linkless system, you can slide the shock over. Yep. 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 That's why KTM <laughs> engines were really good back in the day and why maybe they didn't handle that. Uh, that's why they spit you off like a yep. so. rodeo team. Um, one more thing I want to ask you about here. Um, you guys obviously have this great vision into the future and secession planning. I can tell that that's on Bobby's mind and you've already got you know, we're seeing your rookie kids, Romano and Kitchen, and these yeah. guys come in and be successful right away. Yeah. Um, now you've got Hayden Deegan. I yep. mean, you guys have, who's next for you guys? Yeah, I mean, obviously all our amateur guys we have high hopes for, and this kind of crop of kids that's coming is kind of a special crop because we've, we've noticed that this group of kids, we've been, We've had LeBlanc for like five years, mm. he, and it's because he was part of this group that there was deep talent in it. Uh, Jet Reynolds was like the kingpin of it in, in the 80 days. Like, he was always winning and all, but LeBlanc was in there. Romano was in there. Danger Boy, I think, sometimes would be old enough, and sometimes he wouldn't in that class. Volan was in the class sometimes. Uh, I think even, you know, the age thing depends on what year they hit, but... There was just a lot of guys that were fast and were like, that class is going to have some good guys because they've been racing top guys the whole time. And so, yeah, we've had our eye on this group to focus on it for a long time just because we felt like, hey, a lot of times there's like one or two kids in the class that are good. One kid might be hurt. The other kid's just cleaning house right. at Loretta's where these guys had to race somebody every time because there was like eight guys that were mm. pretty fast. So we've really put focus on LeBlanc was the first one we were able to pick out of that group. And then we tried to get Romano and he wouldn't come the first time. And then later he realized like I should have done that. And he got on board. So we got two of the group. I think, I mean, we were trying to get Jet Reynolds at some point. Like it was just this, yeah. we've had a lot of focus on this group and Deegan's been really impressive as well. And I mean, Romano's obviously, you know, we just raced the, first couple nationals and he's been leading laps at them yeah. and running up front. So that's a really good sign. Uh, LeBlanc, you know, we rode today. He actually beat everybody in a moto today, kind of in the mud. So that's a good thing for him. Yeah. Uh, Deegan passed Justin Cooper in the f opening laps of a moto today training. So like that's, that means a lot from these young kids. And, yeah. and sometimes like, I mean, Deegan passed Justin Cooper. He's on an amateur bike. Like he's mm -hmm. got a lot to look forward to stepping on the pro bike and he's still able to like pass some guys and stuff like that pro level. So we think uh, a lot of these guys coming. Thrasher and Kitchener guys, we didn't work with for as long as this group and amateurs. They were kind of like a little bit of a last minute pickup. But I mean, Kitchen, everybody that sees Kitchen rides like, man, he's got something going on, you know, kind of like a style thing, like a taller kind of rider and got good style. and. Uh, so a lot of people just from even before results that see kitchen ride, they're like, man, you got something thrasher, you know, he won two races as a rookie. The sophomore year was like a little bit of a struggle, but then he really made up for it in that last race. Cause like Hunter really needed to win that race. And he started behind him, passed him, and dealt with like an immense amount of pressure. That meant a lot. Like had that race not gone that way, we would be like a little bit like, man, this was a bad sophomore year. We didn't win and we won mm -hmm. twice in the first year. So that was awesome, but this year, other than that, it's like, it's been a rough year in ways. Like, I think Bobby brought it up earlier. Uh, Jeremy Martin hurt, Colt Nichols hurt, red plate. Justin Cooper hurt, red plate. Dylan Fernandez hurt, red plate. So, but Craig won a title. Titles like that feel good. Craig's been in that class for, everyone likes to make fun of it, but it's just what these guys should be doing if they're getting paid to, to yep. do it, you know? And, uh, he was a guy that he really never made a title run until he got on our team. So we're proud of that. Like we took him where he maybe won one race and he was really up and down. And honestly, if you read his contract, you would laugh like this was kind of a Bobby Reagan thing. It has all this crazy stuff in there. That's, that's not crazy, but it's crazy for the industry's perspective. Like where if you pull off out of one race, you're done. On the team because this was a problem we had like same kind of thing i was talking about with mm -hmm. with aaron plessinger and and this is where bobby's like a little unique in the industry like everyone stays in this box in the industry and it's like he looked at craig and goes obviously everyone knows he's a good rider but he hasn't even come close to winning a title why is that because he quits 
all the time. So his contract has like all these things in there. Mm -hmm. If you quit, if you don't train right, if you don't do this, you're out. Every time you quit, it gets easier to quit. Yeah. Right. And like, honestly, he was seven points out of the lead when he broke his leg in Salt Lake last year. So he was a legit title contender in, in 20. And, and Craig, honestly, I always had a tough class. Like, yeah, it, it, he had to really earn this championship. I mean, he had a lot. He had tough. And the year before when he was in it, I mean, it was Jet in there and Forkner and Hampshire and Nichols and all these dudes. Like, So, I mean, we're pretty proud of those ones when we can take somebody that's been a factory rider for years and years and they couldn't even really come close to getting it done and we got it done. I mean, those are, yeah. that feels good, you know. And Is there anyone in the amateur ranks right now you're looking at or you have signed that you can talk about or no? Well, since Romano and LeBlanc moved up, so really all we have is Deegan in a B class right now, but that means that we usually have two or three amateurs. That means we're in the market. <laughs> and I'm hoping we can go to Loretta's and use Loretta's as like a scouting race because sometimes it's fun to go to Loretta's if you're like, man, we got to find a guy, you know? Yeah. And if you go there and you already have your guy signed and what if he sucks at the race, you know, oh, man, we should have looked at that. So I'm personally looking forward to going to, to Loretta's this year where uh, Deegan will be our A rider next year and we'll really be hunting a, a B rider, you know, which might be a guy coming out of the 125 class, might be a guy coming out of the super mini class, might be a B stock rider, who knows, but we'll for sure be signing somebody and we have our eyes on people, but yeah, it's just kind of, you kind of got to find who's not under contract and yeah. who's available. So we'll be working on that, you know, for sure yeah. in the weeks to come. Well, listen, man, I, I've taken up entirely too much of your time, but it's been yep. fascinating to walk through the history of this team. Um, yep. And like I said, uh, where you guys have come from and, and, and all of the challenges you've had multiple times where Bobby was like, I don't know, man, Yeah, you know, about to throw in the towel. And he's just like, no, I'm not doing it. Yep. And, and to see where you guys have gotten, it's just, yep. it'd make a cool movie. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. And like, I mean, for sure there was times I remember watching the PC guys, like leaving the manager's tower, probably around, I don't know, 2010 going, I don't even see how we could win a race like ever. Like it's does not seem yeah. possible, yeah. you know, cause these guys just dominate. And I, I remember being there thinking, I do not see the path to winning races. Like, I don't see it. I don't know how it's possible. Because at the time, it seemed like Mitch hired a lot of previous champions, whether they're GP champions. And I was like, we can't hire those guys. Mm -hmm. They're not going to come here. So how do you do it? And Chicken or the egg a little bit, right? Like, yeah. They're not going to come or want to come until yep. you are winning. You yep. can't win until you have them. Yep. So for sure, it, it definitely hasn't been an easy road. And those are, and that's part of what keeps me like looking forward is because I do not want to go back to those days. Yeah. Like that would be a nightmare, you know, yeah. like a major nightmare to oh, go. From this, yeah. I think that would be the point where you guys throw in the towel. If you yeah. can't win anymore, you're, you know, it'd be yeah. like, forget yeah. it. Even, but I mean, even Hangtown, just to, I mean, that we felt like we got our ass kicked pretty good in the 250 class. and. We were like, man, we need to get our shit together, you know, so. But. Well, thanks for taking the time, man. Yep. This has been really fun, and yep. and uh, I, I just really appreciate you taking the time. Yep. Okay. Now, uh, get back to work. Those championships aren't going to win themselves. <laughs> yep, no <laughs> doubt. All right, thanks again. Hey, thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed uh, this whole uh, Star Racing Yamaha show. Um, stay tuned. We'll be back to wrap it up. I want to be bad with you, girl, like we're robbing. Hey, thanks for joining us, folks, for this special edition of the Whiskey Throttle Show. Uh, I know this Star Racing Yamaha show is a little different than, than our normal uh, one guest format, but we thought it was cool to bring you uh, kind of a, an all-encompassing look at the folks that really make this team run. Uh, they've become such a powerful force in the sport in every class, in every title chase they compete in. So uh, we thought it was, was appropriate to do this. and. We sure appreciate their their hospitality here, having us uh, setting the studio up. Big thank you to Yamaha for all their support, and uh, we appreciate it if you look at all of our our sponsors. You know that they are the ones that continue to bring this show to you. So if you like what you see, support our sponsors. We appreciate it. We'll see you around. We've got a lot more content coming, so stay tuned. The Whiskey Throttle Show is brought to you by Yamaha. Join the Blue Crew today and take advantage of all that Yamaha has to offer, including amateur racing trackside support awesome Yamaha contingency, Jason Rain's demos and instructional classes, and frankly, the most high-performing motorcycles 
available on the market today. Whether you're looking for a four-stroke, a two-stroke, a side-by-side, -side, a quad, a boat, a generator, Yamaha prides themselves on absolute top-level quality and reliability. Rev your heart with Yamaha and join the Blue Crew today. Sore necks, aching legs, tight backs. Our bodies aren't designed to be constantly tense, but what can we do about it? Help your body relax with TheraBody. TheraBody creates effective, natural solutions to take charge of your daily wellness. By combining education, innovation, and over a decade of pioneering technology, TheraBody makes wellness more accessible for everybody. A traumatic motorcycle accident led TheraBody founder Dr. Jason Westland to create the Theragun for his debilitating pain. Now the Theragun, the only physician-created percussive therapy device, uses a scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, and power to relax and release your deep muscle tension. Recovery Air is TheraBody's world-leading pressure compression therapy system that flushes out leg soreness so you can bring on peak performance. Most electrical muscle stimulation is ineffective. Instead, TheraBody's sleek PowerDot takes away the guesswork with an intuitive app that customizes intensity and placement so you recover faster. Regular foam rollers hurt. TheraBody's Wave Series delivers powerful vibration and pressure to help you recover with less pain. Don't settle for mystery CBD. TheraBody's TheraOne range of topical and ingestible full-spectrum USDA-certified organic CBD products are redefining high-potency CBD for wellness and recovery. 250 professional sports teams exclusively use Theragun and other TheraBody products to take recovery into their own hands. Method Race Wheels bringing you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels in off-road for your truck, van, sprinter, UTV, or SUV. They've been dominating the Baja 500 and 1000 and every major off-road event around the world for years with high quality and performance. They also look amazing. They come in a bunch of different styles and colors for your rig, so check them out. You can get 20% off a set of wheels using our code Whiskey Throttle. No capitals, no spaces. 20% off using our code. Check them out. Also, coming soon, the R1M Project. Method Race Wheels makes a dive into the motocross world. Stay tuned. Troy Lee Designs is the leader in off-road motocross apparel and style. So whether you're looking for a cool new paint job for your helmet, maybe your name and number on your helmet lettered on, you're looking for new gear, you're looking for mountain bike gear, off-road gear, they've got the brand new Scout line and GP and SE models. Troy Lee Designs has it all. They've been leading this industry for decades, and they're going to continue to do it. Check out TroyLeeDesigns.com. SKDA is a moto graphics and seat covers company with several offices based around the globe. For too long, bikes and graphics have all looked the same. They just start to blend together. SKDA is working to change that. With super clean and unique design work, a bike with SKDA graphics stands out in a crowd and adds a touch of art to the world of moto. Hey, we need that. SKDA prides itself on providing premium customer service both before and after the sale is made. Visit SKDA online to view the current product range and get in touch with their team to get your bike refreshed. I want to just make a, a mention here that these guys, not only is their design way outside the box, very, very cool. They'll work with you on custom things. The, the products are incredible, okay? They'll speak for themselves. But what's really awesome, and you'll notice this the minute you order one of these, man, they give you an email saying, hey, the product's been shipped. Uh, hey, the product is here. It landed in this spot. Hey, it's coming today. Hey, your product's been delivered. They, they're just so good about staying in touch with you and letting you know where it's at. Customer service is 100%, and uh, that's just something that's rare these days. Check out SKDA. Here at the Whiskey Throttle Show, we're all about supporting brands that support our sport. And there's one tire company that has never walked away from the sport of motocross and supercross, and it's Dunlop. When times got tough and the economy took a crash, Dunlop stepped up and stayed with our sport to support it and the athletes and individuals that love it. Their MX-53 line and MX-33 lines absolutely dominate this sport. Every national championship at the pro level has been won in the last decade, and nearly every single amateur national championship at Loretta Lynn's has been won on a Dunlop. So if you're looking for high performance, you're looking for amazing quality, and you're looking to support a brand that never turns its back on our sport, there's only one choice for you, and it's Dunlop. Pro Circuit is the leader in aftermarket performance and quality. Whether you're looking for a little more horsepower out of your engine, some quality hard parts to improve the way your bike feels and looks, better handling through suspension or linkage or linkage arms, Pro Circuit is where you need to stop. It's your one-stop shop. You can go in there and get everything you need to make your motorcycle go from average to exceptional. Pro Circuit's got enough number one plates on their wall to side an entire home. 
And there's a reason for that. They're very, very good at what they do. Uh, the highest quality products with one goal in mind, and that's winning. Check out ProCircuit.com. Nihilo Concepts is leading the way in aftermarket hard parts. With their secondary on-switch device, something that was much needed in this sport, they've been innovating and bringing new products to market. Their latest is the new Nihilo Run-Cool Brake Pistons. They're designed to be stronger than stock and provide exceptional cooling performance with less brake drag. Most OEM calipers pistons are made from aluminum that just can't hold up to the heat and extreme demands of serious racing. When they get hot, the aluminum will distort, causing loss of hydraulic pressure and brake failure. Nihilo's run-cool pistons limit the area that boiling hot hydraulic fluid is able to come in contact with the piston, leaving two-thirds of the piston volume in open air with breather holes to enhance the cooling ability. It's made of a proprietary stainless blend, which is better at dissipating heat. You have issues with brake fade or brake failure, Check out Nihilo Concepts among their many amazing hard parts and carbon fiber parts and titanium. NihiloConcepts.com. Senna is the leader in motorcycle helmet communications. There's really two prongs to why this is important. One of them is safety. If you're a dad who's watching your kid out on a track, being able to communicate with him about a rider down or a track situation is imperative. You don't want him coming over a jump and seeing a rider down and getting himself involved in that. So from a safety aspect, it's huge. You can also coach them. So if you see them taking a line, doing something that they could be improved, it's very easy to just click a button and speak to them right in their helmet in real time. This has been a proven coaching technique used by many motorcycle coaches. There's also just the simple fun factor. Being able to chat with your buddy while you're out on a ride, share music between one another, answer phone calls, it just takes your riding experience to another level. So whether you're using the 50S or 50R connected through a mesh network in your helmet or you're using a Tough Talk headset connected with one of those, Senna is the leader in quality and performance in motorcycle helmet communications. Check them out at Senna.com. Seat Concepts is the leader in motorcycle saddles. If you're looking for a new cover or a new seat entirely, Seat Concepts is the place to go. They make custom seat foams catered to your height, weight, riding ability, riding type, they also have waterproof covers and, and foams that will not break down if you ride in a lot of inclement weather. And they pride themselves on being much more comfortable than OEM or any other aftermarket company. If you're looking for a new seat or a new cover, Seat Concepts, there's nothing better. Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So, Right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the Polaris RZR 800s. Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So... Right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the... If you've got a little Grom that's looking to get started in the motorcycle world, the best way to get them going is on a Stasic bike. They've got multiple sizes, so from your very young Groms to those who are a little more grown up, you can start them safely. They've got controls that allow you to control the speed so he can't get going too quick. They can touch the ground. There's not a lot of noise to distract them. It's the perfect way to get your child involved in motorcycling at a very young age. And if you've got a kid who's already out ripping, there's series popping up all over. For those of you in Southern California, go to www.ameminicross.com and join their local series. If you're outside of this state, contact your local track and ask them about starting a Stasic class at your local track. Get over to Stasic.com and check out all they've got going on. Motul USA, uh, we, we lean hard on these lubricants to keep us uh, on the track and on the trail. And Motul has proven their quality over and over, uh, most recently with their Dakar win with Ricky Brabeck. Uh, they're sponsoring Supercross teams. They're diving into our sport again full, full throttle, and uh, we're stoked to have them on board. Amazing products, top to bottom. Motul USA, go check them out. OGO is the leader in motorcycle storage solutions. As motocross riders, we need a gear bag, we need a helmet bag, a boot bag, a backpack, a travel bag, a hydration pack, 
maybe a toolkit to wear around your waist if you're on an off-road ride. OGO makes all of that, and their products are absolutely top of the line. I've got stuff I've had for several decades, just to give you an idea of how long this stuff lasts. If you're not sure, ask around, talk to folks who've had some of this stuff, and they will confirm that OGO's quality is absolutely second to none. So go check them out, OGO underscore powersports.com, and look at all they've got to offer right now. You ever heard the phrase that the harder you work, the luckier you are? Well, at Luck Apparel, they believe in an acronym that kind of sums it up a little more simply than that, laboring under complete knowledge. So it isn't just some random chance that determines what your outcome or results are going to be. It's being educated and working your butt off to get it done. And I think that that goes hand in hand with the motocross industry. You don't get lucky into a win. You work your ass off and you make it happen. So check out Luck Apparel. They've got t-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, all kinds of cool stuff. And we're stoked to have them on board here at the Whiskey Throttle Show in 2022. If you're in the market for a toy hauler trailer, car trailer, cargo trailer, look no further than Custom Outfitters, one of our new partners for this year. Uh, these guys do an awesome job, even so far as to dial in the inside of Sprinter vans, which have become the new standard mode of transportation for moto. Uh, these guys can handle it all. Uh, they use ATC world-class trailers, uh, top shelf service and performance in their products. Uh, Custom Outfitters out of South Dakota doing an awesome job. We're stoked to have these guys on board this year. So whether you're looking to just do some camping with the family, uh, looking for a trailer that can fit all your toys to go out to the desert or wherever, uh, look no further than Custom Outfitters. And finally, last but not least, Specialized Bicycles. If you are in the market to start pedaling, this is where you want to start. Uh, they've got great entry-level bikes all the way up to the Cadillac, the new Levo um, e-bike, uh, any, anything in between, man. It doesn't matter what kind of riding you're doing. Go check out and start with Specialized. Don't waste your time on something that's going to break. The derailleur's not going to shift after a couple months. Get something quality. Uh, these guys make it. Specialized leads that industry. Hey, thanks for clicking on another episode of MPH Moto E Performance and Health with Coach Rob Beams. Uh, Coach, I wanted to get into something that I think every one of our listeners can relate to or should be relating to, and that's warm up. Yeah. Uh, something I was probably not great at. I always thought, no, I don't want to. I don't want to do too much. I want to save all my energy for the race. Sure. Uh, which, as I've learned, my body uh, going on further. I, I really, it, it struck me in, in CrossFit uh, as I got into just for fun as a way sure. to stay in shape. But if if I didn't take my heart rate to where up into my you know, what I would call zone three, three yeah. before we started the workout, those first few minutes were brutal for me. Absolutely. If I did that, if I, if I had a hard effort and then recovered and then went into my workout, I was way better. Yep. And I, I just think, man, I really blew it. You know, back in my racing days, I should have, I should have done something until I was really sweating and really tight, you know, really yeah. get my heart rate up. So explain the why for, for all of us, um, the importance of it, different types of it. Um, sure. What you recommend. Well, you, you just hit the nail on the head. You noticed that once you do something, the second set seemed a little bit easier. For those that like to lift weights, we, we all know and understand second set always feels easier than the first one. Without getting highly technical, but for the sake of the listeners, I want this to be a huge epiphany. When you start to exercise, there is literally a neuromuscular message that goes from the muscles to the brain that says, hey, we're getting ready to do something. There's the blood vessels vasodilated, opens up, those warm blood comes in that relaxes the tissue, it elongates the tissue, it brings oxygen in, it brings nutrients, allows us to exercise. Take it a step further. If, if I've got a gallon of milk in the refrigerator, a gallon of milk is roughly eight pounds. Over the years, as you've grown up, you reach in that refrigerator and you grab it, your brain has already at a neuromuscular level knows it's going to lift eight pounds. So it slams it across and into the top of the refrigerator when it's half empty. That's a perfect example of a neuromuscular response mm. because you've programmed yourself. If you and I are in the gym and we're doing bicep curls with 20 and then we go to 25, the brain's expecting 30 on the next lift. If you go down to 20, it's like, whoa, it's real easy. You don't even realize your brain's anticipating the mm. next lift. How many times, especially for the listeners, I'm sure this will resonate, how many times have we used the first three laps of a five-lap race to get up to speed? Well, and to your point, like especially at the Nationals, I was the worst. My sure. first few laps were the worst, and that's when you want to be the best. That's right. You know, you, you let that window to pass a bunch of guys at once go by. That's right. Which is what I, exactly what I do. And then I'm having to pick them off one at a time. The leaders are gone. Yep. I have no chance of catching them. Yep. 
Um, and it goes back to what you were alluding to earlier. A lot of people are concerned that if they do a warm up, they're now going to be tired. Well, that's because you're not in shape. <laughs> okay. In, in all fairness. Um, and, and, and I always am intrigued because it's, if you're going to go, you know, we know our pro. But I, I just think it's poor. It just, uh, it's just, uh, immature thinking too, that like, I only have this much energy. And so I don't want to waste any of it on warm up. I'm going to save all of it for this race. That's just not yeah. reality. Well, like That's we said, well, like we've said in our other segments together, where's your frustration? Yeah. So if you're using three of a five lap race to get up to speed, then if you could trick the body into thinking it's already been out there for 30 minutes, it's warmed up. Yeah. And so now when the gate drops, you do have that opening sprint speed. That's why the warm up is so incredibly important. But I want to differentiate something that I hear all the time. Well, I'm physically sweating, so aren't I warmed up? That's a great point. You're sweating because your body does not want to die of a heat stroke. It's its number one goal. That's why when we fall into a frozen lake, you know, it's going to always protect the heart. It'll lose the extremities, frostbite, whatever it is. And when you're exposed to the heat, it's number one goal is to not die of a heat stroke. This is why eating on race day, we can do a whole segment on just that, is very difficult. Because if you're going to put the body into an executive decision, not die of a heat stroke or digest food, food's going to get pushed aside. So we want to get into the subject of being metabolically warmed up. Being physically hot and sweating is not metabolically warmed up. So it goes back to your example that you said at the beginning of this segment. When you do a little bit of something and you get that heart rate, you kind of prime the engine a little bit. Yeah. It doesn't seem as hard on the body. If all of our listeners were to literally just step away from the show and go run around their house, they would feel all that lactic acid dump in there. Well, it's because the blood vessels are all tight. This lactic acid, it's kind of like all of a sudden you hope it, open the throttle wide open, but you plug the rear end. It backs up. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Remember I said earlier, warm-up vasodilates. Sometimes people are like, oh, it's a big technical term. You're just opening the pipe. It's all your arteries and veins expanding to allow more flow. Just opening the pipe. So as you open this bad boy up with more and more throttle, it creates more metabolic waste. Excuse me, this combustion waste. Our human body is the same way as we bring the heart rate up, not getting highly technical, but you're converting stored sugar, glycogen, into fuel as a byproduct of that is metabolic waste and we got to get rid of it. Mm. So your warm up is doing that for you. Now that's where we get back into the fitness side of things. If you're trying to race 30 minutes plus two, those guys are fit enough that they can go 45 or 50 minutes. Right. I mean, you got to really stop and think about that. I mean, we can go and talk about the tour de France and look at how those guys train. And it's interesting to me, we'll look at the tour de France and study them, but we don't bring the same science into moto because it seems a little bit technical. It's not technical at all. Mm. What I'm always astounded with is none of us came out of the womb understanding compression and rebound. You've got kids on 85s and 65s that can tell you, hey, we need to slow it up, speed it down. And, and all of a sudden you start talking about metabolic byproduct and they go, oh, that's too technical, I'm out. And I'm like, really? Yeah. That's yeah. astounding to me. Well, there's, there's just no question that you need to be warmed up. Yes. We, that we, that's established. That's not even up for argument. I tell people if you, if you are able to go ride, mm-hmm. like uh, if I'm just going out for a practice day, I always go out, I start the first two laps, I stand the stand whole track. The drill, yep. um, it just, that'll limit your speed because mm-hmm. you can't really rip through corners when you're standing. It warms up all your posterior chain, gets blood going to that. It gets your heart rate warmed up, gets you, allows you to see the track. Yep. If they've changed obstacles, you'll learn that at a slower speed than yep. if you just go out there and pin it. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to it. And after two laps, I slowly just start bringing up the speed until there I'm comfortable. Go. I get a good sweat going. If, if it's a good arm pump, then cool. Come in, cool down, drink, you know, power down on my arms if I have it. And then from there, I'm always better the next time out and, yep. and the next time and the next time. Well, if in, you don't have that ability, let's say you're at a race and you're in between motos, there's a big gap, there's no place to go sure. ride. What are some good things that, that people can do? It's just some good practical stuff. Well, you brought up one of my biggest assets, and not because they're a sponsor of the show, but the Power Dot. Um, I'm, I'm blown away by that um, in 100% transparency. I called you and I'm like, does it really work? Uh, I, I'm always a fan of understanding how do these things work? Why do they work? Talking with Chase at Power Dot, the science behind it. I mean, you know, we, we even tried to uh, get access because Chase was on, was talking about that medical aspect to yeah. it. You actually have to have a physician's license. We weren't even allowed to get granted access to it. Mm. And it was a huge eye-opener for me because I'm thinking we're barely even scratching the surface of how good this technology really is. Yeah. But I like to use it. Um, you get into areas like whether it be the, uh, the arms themselves, all over the legs, how much do we stand up and Low sit down. Low back is really Low good. back yeah. is huge. So I love the power dot from there. 
Um, again, I think it's cool that they're a sponsor of the show. Jump on your mountain bike and ride around the pits. You know, like you said, just that little bit of pushing and pulling on the bike, the balance back and forth, eye-hand coordination, you're just priming the engine. Mm -hmm. um, and then the big thing is going to be heart rate. You were talking about earlier, you know, getting into the zones three. We're very, very big with our clients. We have very uh, meticulous ways that we create the heart rate zones. We do it through testing, no formulas or anything else. We test it pretty frequently. We know that the accuracy of that is there because to your point, when someone says they're warmed up, if we're not going to go off of perceived exertion, what would be that number? You said zone three. Well, is that 133 or 143? I don't know. It needs to be specific yeah, to yourself. Yeah, different for each person. Yeah. And then you jump on your mountain bike and, you, you know, what we do with our athletes, the magic number is 20 minutes. Uh, this comes directly from the Olympic Training Center. You get around that 20-minute mark where you do 10 minutes of an easy, easy tempo, heart rate zone one or two. Just open everything up. Let Start sending some messages. We're getting ready to do some work. Then throw a 30-second, not a sprint, but an acceleration. Prime it for 30 seconds, back it off for 30. Do that for 10 minutes. Mm. That's specifically what we call the lactic acid shuffle. You're letting the body know the presence of lactic acid is going to accumulate. What's lactic acid? Converting stored sugar to energy. So uh, that's just a very simple formula that I like people to think about. 20 minutes, 10 minutes even tempo, 10 minutes just a little burst on and off. Now, if you're in, in for, the, for the listeners that run road races, it's easy. They say the race is going to start at 7 o'clock. You can do your accelerations and go to the starting line, gun goes off, and you're good to go. Moto is not so easy. Now, if you're a pro, we know pretty much when it's going to start. That's why you'll, and I find this interesting. You notice like Kenny and Jet and Hunter, you ever watch those guys at the starting line? Yeah, I mean. They're behind doing jumping yeah, jacks they're moving and moving around. around. Yeah. And it's interesting because the Europeans understand the importance of it. They don't, they don't care if it looks goofy. They don't really care. They're there to win races. And they'll do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. What are they actually doing for the viewers? Don't even realize that they're trying to get the heart rate up. Mm -hmm. They're not sitting on the line at 85 and going to be at 185 in one lap. They're trying to, and I'm, I'm just using loose numbers. They're trying to get in the 120s, 130s because they know they can race at 185, 190, whatever their race number is. Yeah. You guys as list as viewers, you're seeing it on live TV, but not even understanding what you're seeing. Yeah. That's why I think it's so important to talk about warm up, power dot, get on your mountain bike. You know, wear a heart rate monitor, get yeah. the heart rate up. And then you're in a sweet spot. So hop onto that specialized bike, 20 minutes. So yep. 10 easy and, and 10 of like, just drop some cells. gears, yeah. crank for 10 or 15 seconds, 30 seconds spin. on 30 yeah. seconds off. Just make it easy. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And then if you can get right to the starting line, we get to something like Loretta's, it's difficult with the long pre-staging. So you come up with another set, some jumping jacks, yeah. some burpees, push-ups. Yeah. get the front and the back of the body activated. Yeah. And you could do something, uh, something Danny Smith always did. I, I picked up on is he, he balance on one foot and then bend down and touch his toe with his opposite hand. So yes. it was, it was, that was mixed into some jumping jacks and burpees or whatever, but it was like that proprioceptiveness and balance. Yes. It's, it's waking all that stuff up. Well, think about the three dimensional plane of a motorcycle. You have what's going on above the seat and below it, left peg, right peg, what's going on in front of the pegs and behind the pegs. Well, your body's yeah. the same way. Mm -hmm. What's going on in the front and the back. That's why leaning forward activates everything on the posterior chain. Yep. So yep. breaking that three dimensional gets everything going. And then the physical exercise brings the heart rate up. And you have more info on your website about yes. warm up and all those type of things. So yeah, get absolutely. over to completeracingsolutions.com. All of Coach Rob's uh, resources yep. are on there. You can yep. uh, access a lot of that with no memberships, just free to you. Uh, he also has uh, memberships you can jump in uh, for the year to have access to even more info. Great resource. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, thanks for that. Appreciate it. And uh, stay tuned for more MPH videos coming soon. Thanks for watching the Whiskey Throttle Show, now available on the Spot Network, an independent standalone streaming platform live now on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, Google Play, Android TV, most smart TVs, and all phones and tablets. Look for future live shows and specials only available on Spot Network. Download the app today on your favorite device. And don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell to get alerts for all the latest content. Follow us on Twitter at W underscore throttle underscore show and on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram at Whiskey Throttle Show.